So hey guys welcome back to the channel. This is a story about what if Naruto finds out the Uzumaki clan was betrayed by Konoha. If you guys enjoy this, what if? Comment down below. And let me know before I start please do support for more awesome content. And leave a like and don't forget to subscribe to my channel. And also share this video with your friends. And check out the description. And check out my playlist. So let's start the video. Chapter 1. Revelation. Anyways, it was brought up that this chapter was horrible compared to other chapters. I am not rewriting the whole thing, too damn lazy. I will, however, be re-editing, like I said, to make it more bearable. This has too little detail, a few plot holes that I intend to fix by making the whole chapter longer. Naruto Uzumaki rushed through the trees, desperately hoping that he would get to his friends soon. Tsutsuki Uchiha, his best friend, crush, rival, and many more things. She was currently on pace to travel towards Orochimaru, believing that he would help her gain power to kill Itachi. The young teenager was sure that Orochimaru would not truly help her. The member cared only for himself, so why would he help a young woman like her get strong enough to defeat Itachi when Orochimaru could not? No, the blonde knew that Orochimaru would make her powerful, but not too strong. He would take over her body before she even got close to her brother. Naruto had to stop thinking as he finally reached the Valley of the End. A truly amazing place, especially with the statues giving each other the bird. Naruto quickly sighted his target and let loose a sigh of relief. Sasatsuki Ichiha. Naruto shouted. He thought it was finally time to make her know. He had found Yuzushi Agakur, and he had found out who was to blame for the Ichiha massacre. It was time she knew the truth. He had no doubt that she would be skeptical, so he would use all the evidence he had. Apparently, his shout had surprised the transformed ninja. She turned around, not having activated the curse mark, much to his relief. W how do you know my name? The girl asked, her lips twitching into a small scowl. Naruto put up his hands in a release seal, startling Satsuki who instantly jumped back. She heard the teen yell a loud Kai. Before he blurred somewhere. She tried to frantically look around her but was too late as the young boy slapped a seal on her back before activating it. The older teenager was instantly paralyzed and fell to her knees. Through sheer force of will, she turned her head up and growled at him. What the fuck did you do to me? Normally, her brain would instantly supply her that he used a paralyzing seal, but she was too enraged to listen. He scowled at her before telling her to listen to him before saying anything. She stayed quiet, not really caring what he had to say, but she needed to get out of these things, and this was the only way. I want you to come with me, not to Kanoha, he quickly stated once she glared at him. We're going somewhere no one will find us, he said. I'll release the seals, but I can activate them anytime I want, so don't try to escape. They will turn on if I fall unconscious, so don't even try. He didn't like being so strict on her, but she needed to listen. His perceptive eyes looked into her onyx eyes, instantly realizing that she was trying to develop a plan. The young teen sighed, finally calm and cool. She nodded to his terms and he put his hands in a ram seal before deactivating the paralysis seal. She kicked herself up and scowled at him. Where are we going? She started to follow him as he went west. Izushi Agakur, Yuzumaki clan homeland, he informed her. W what? Yuzumaki clan? She thought to herself. She closed her eyes as she tried to remember anything she could about any Yuzumaki related things. Suddenly, she remembered a book she had read long ago, well, Itachi read, she listened. The Yuzumaki clan were masters of Kenjutsu and Fuinjutsu. They lived in Yuzushi Agakur. Allies of Konoha. Destroyed during the Second Great Shinobi World War by and she remembered, although she couldn't really recall the names. Their clan symbol was a spiral, usually red. Red hair from pinkish red to crimson blood. Mido Yuzumaki married the first Hokage and Kashina Yuzumaki was a legend, rumored to be as strong, if not stronger, than the Yandame. She shut her eyes, trying to think of any other information she could think back to, but the voice of Itachi in her head finally got to her, and she stopped. While the 13-year-old was thinking of the things her brother had read to her, Naruto found the dock master. He quickly paid what he needed to, and they both got on the boat. After a few hours, Naruto and his rival finally got to an area of water where there were whirlpools everywhere, ready to suck them in and crush them like little bugs. How the fuck will we get past those? She asked aloud in amazement. She looked towards the blonde, but he just rolled his eyes at her before going through a few hand seals. Thank you, mom he said in his thoughts as he remembered some letters his mother had left behind in case she died from childbirth. Yuzu Arts. Whirlpool release. He shouted. The whirlpools that had previously been large and dangerous shrunk down until calm crystal blue water was remaining. The two quickly hopped off the boat and started running towards the shore. When they finally stepped onto shore, Naruto looked around before deciding to go into a destroyed building. There, Naruto sat down on the floor, his friend following his example. All right. What the hell do you want? Satsuki snarled at the teenager. He scowled at her and told her to listen and not interrupt. I'm your godbrother, by a technicality. 
Naruto glared as she was about to protest and fell silent under his glare. Your mom and mine knew each other well, and Makoto-san decided that my mom would be a good godmother, he finished. Satsuki finally nodded, accepting that at face value. After all, he had no reason to lie to her, and she couldn't see any signs of lying on his face or body. Now. I want you to shut up and listen to everything. Don't interrupt, okay? He asked. She nodded in consent, wondering what he was going to tell her that would be any more shocking or revealing. I was Itachi's student. A sigh was released from Naruto as Satsuki took a sharp breath in and began to glare at him, her beautiful onyx eyes instantly turning red at the mention of her brother. She registered the student part and began to charge at him, only to get paralyzed. Itachi killed your clan for a reason, he stopped as her eyes became even more enraged. What reason could be important enough for her own loving, kind, and caring brother to kill almost everyone in his family, his clan? Almost as though he was reading her mind, he said, war. She forgot her rage a little and looked at him curiously. Why would war happen because of her clan? And how was a small war worth his family? The fourth great shinobi war, he continued. W what? She asked in disbelief. What would cause that? She finally felt as though Itachi had a reason. Now that her mind was calmer, she began to quickly connect a few pieces. Itachi killed them to stop a world war, something would cause Konoha to weaken. A civil war. What would cause that? How would my clan cause that? She thought to herself. Naruto, seeing that she wasn't going to say anything, continued. You see, 13 years ago, remember? The Konoha higher-ups began to suspect it was the Achiha who had attacked using the Kaiubi because of the history when Madara used him to attack the Shadame Hokage. Also, there were no Achiha present in the fight, nor were any injured so they were suspected. Naruto took a deep breath and continued. This mistrust and isolation from the rest of the village created feelings of ill will amongst the Achiha and ultimately rekindled the hatred harbored towards the Senju-influenced government. As such, the Achiha led by Fugaku Achiha, your father began planning a coup d'etat to overthrow the Konoha leadership. In preparation for the coup, the Achiha started inserting its member within Konoha's command structure to act as spies. Itachi Achiha was placed in the Anbu, the direct arm of the Hokage, however, Itachi did not agree with the Achiha's plans, believing the coup would only escalate into another shinobi world war. As such, he turned double agent, providing Konoha with information on the Achiha's plan. The third Hokage and his advisors quickly realized that they were already too fallen to convince otherwise, but Shisui Achiha still tried, using the ultimate Kotamatsukami, a move from his Manjekyo Sharingan, to force the Achiha elders otherwise. Anzo thought this was a waste as they were still going to kill the Achiha and took Shisui's right eye for himself before Shisui had a chance to use it. Having failed and fearful that Danzm would take his other eye, too, Shisui entrusted his left eye to Itachi before committing suicide. After finding his body, the Achiha believed Shisui had, in fact, been murdered by Itachi and the suicide was staged and, as such, no longer trusted he still wanted to find a non-violent solution, Shisui's death convinced Itachi that events could no longer be stopped. Naruto didn't mention that Itachi had given him the eye, and no one knew that. Itachi started to dislike the clan and became critical about it. The elders and that bastard Hiruzen spat out Hiruzen like it killed him to say the name, surprising the girl as they always showed a good relationship, like a grandfather and grandson. Decided to take advantage of Itachi's feelings and told him to eliminate the Achiha. Itachi agreed, having been a pacifist and not wanting more bloodshed. They explained the two possible outcomes. The Achiha could be allowed to carry out their coup, an act that would ultimately lead to the entire clan's extermination, including Itachi and his younger sister, Satsuki Achiha. Alternatively, Itachi could assassinate the Achiha before the coup took place and in exchange would be allowed to spare your life. Itachi opted to save you over the entire clan. He also asked me to help and protect you throughout the time. He had trained me before so that I could protect you, he told me to be the dead last so I could be on the same team as you. Knowing Satsuki that Itachi chose the village over his entire clan, over his mother who had raised him since he was born, but he placed you leagues above the village itself. If the Achiha were to do their coup, what would happen? The fight in Konoha would weaken the village, since many shinobi, both Achiha and non-Achiha would die, weakening the village. When that happened, others would cause the next great shinobi war. The young teenager took a deep breath before he heard sniffles. He looked forward, only to see Satsuki Achiha, the cold princess, crying. He couldn't imagine this scene ever happening, but he wasn't going to tease her. After all, he too had cried when all this had been explained to him by Itachi. Naruto didn't want to mention the man who had helped Itachi, as he didn't know the full info, and he didn't want to be wrong about anything, especially since Itachi told him nothing but that he was in a chair. Naruto stepped forward and wrapped his arms around his crush, comforting her with soft reassurances. The Ichiha era stiffened at the contact at first, but eventually relaxed in his arms for the next hour. 
Eventually, she calmed down and her thoughts started racing, her heart desiring revenge, but it was no longer directed towards her precious brother, but at the people of Kanoha. Those lying, hypocritical, motherfucking bastards. She thought to herself, finally letting herself go. Wait, why does Naruto hate them? She asked this question alone and shivered at his dark gaze. His glasses were a little scary, but that darkened stare, filled with hatred that glowed slightly a crimson blood-red color. Well for a couple reasons, one, the Sandame, the hypocritical motherfucker I trusted for some reason, ordered the Konoha Shinobi to not help the Yuzumaki when Iwa, Kiri, and Kumo attacked them, and they obeyed without hesitation, not caring that their sister village was being destroyed, and why. Because we were so fucking good with Fuinjutsu and Kinjutsu. He shouted. Do, the entire village hated me and always treated me like the plague. To them, I was worthless, a demon in human skin. They tried to kill me as much as they could. Beat me when they wanted. Thankfully, Inu, Kakashi, was there to help me out a lot. No one besides your brother and Kakashi as Anbu helped me. I don't care about it now, but it hurt a lot when I was a child before I was trained, especially since I didn't have any friends back then, he paused as he looked at her. We are friends, right? He questioned. It seemed that he was laying his heart to her, showing his vulnerability. Of course. You're my only friend Naruto, except maybe Kakashi. I don't care about the other, they could die for all I care, she reassured him, giving him a happy smile smirk. 3. Those bastards never even gave a fuck about either of us. No one ever adopted me when I was an orphan and let me die and I know why, but you were never adopted either, I mean they just left a 7 year old girl alone in a clan ground where her entire clan was killed and they didn't even think about that. Me I can understand, but you should have at least been adopted. Hell, they could have adopted you just because you were in a chihe so they could have got money, but they just left you there. I know you don't need it now, but you were just a 7 year old. Didn't they think about how it would have haunted you to live where your family died? Then they have the nerves to worship the ground you walk on and kiss up to you damn it. I will only let a few people go if they want to, and that is the Ichirakus, Naruto finished his rant with anger. He had to take a few breaths to calm down. Tsutsuki had to smile a little. She couldn't help it with all the protectiveness he was showing. It was. Nice. Well, at least he's intelligent. Does he know about Hinata? Hey, Naruto, do you know about Hinata's crush on you? She asked with a smirk, wanting to destroy the tension. Naruto chuckled as he realized what she was doing. Yeah, I knew, but I don't feel the same way. I don't hate her, but I don't exactly love her. Her personality and mine are just too different. Besides, she admires me and that was what formed it. Her crush was an optimistic guy who didn't give up after an attempted failure. I am not that guy. I am not the happy, sunny guy she likes. Maybe in another timeline where I was different and there were some changes, maybe I would accept and recuperate them, but not now, he told her. Besides, I like you. Tsutsuki gave a nod. She didn't really care if he liked the girl or not. His love life was none of her business. They tried to kill me as much as they could. Beat me when they wanted. A sudden jolt hit her as she remembered what he told her earlier. Naruto, why did they hate you so much? There is no reason to hurt a child, especially you. She demanded. Naruto sighed as he got ready to reveal one of his largest secrets, not as large as his heritage or his connection with Itachi, but still very important. He couldn't, wouldn't lie to her anymore. He refused to do it for something that he shouldn't even care about. The Yandame sealed the Kaiubi into me, he told her. Satsuki blinked in shock before her rage came running back at her. Though she yelled in her mind as she instantly knew what the effect would be. They hurt her only and best friend, framed her brother, killed her family, and destroyed her clan. Why? She asked. He looked at her confused, causing her to elaborate. Why are you? Why would he seal it into you? She questioned. What were the chances that, out of the hundreds of babies that day, Naruto was chosen for the role? Her best friend, her only friend, being chosen. He had no other choice. Only Yuzumakis and Senjus had enough chakra and the body to hold them back. If it was sealed inside, say Eno, then she would have died after a few years, and it would be released again. Since I was the only Yuzumaki alive, he decided to seal it in me, he concluded. Tsutsuki nodded at him to continue, knowing that there was more. Another reason is that the Yandame was noble but too trusting. He couldn't seal it into anyone else if he wasn't willing to make the same sacrifice. After all, the Hokage's highest priority is the village, not his family. It's why I hate the position so much, Naruto explained. Tsutsuki was a bit confused. Sure, he wasn't dumb or anything, but he used to shout that he would become Hokage. Now, she could see that it was a part of a mask that he had put on, but why did he say it so much? To convince them. It was really unnecessary to repeat it so much. Wait, willing to make the same sacrifice. Did that mean Naruto was a re the son of Yandame? Of course. The Yandame would probably never sacrifice a baby, at least not without very important reasons. 
if he considered trying to use another, that would be selfish of him as he was trying to save his own child. Since Naruto was the only Uzumaki, he would have to seal the Kairubi in Naruto. He couldn't do it in another baby, so he had to sacrifice his own, even if he wasn't willing. Her unorganized thoughts caused her to be lost for a while, glaring at the wall in front of her. Naruto asked her a question, but she couldn't hear it, trying to organize through all the information that he had given her. Thankfully for Satsuki, even if she didn't know it, Naruto had taken her earlier words to heart and thought that she wouldn't reject him, even for the Kaiubi. After 20 minutes, Satsuki came back to reality and saw Naruto standing up and looking at the village. She walked towards him and placed a hand on his shoulder, knowing what it felt like to know your entire family was dead. Just like her, he stiffened at the contact, but relaxed a moment later when he realized Satsuki was the only one on the island. So what are you going to do? Take revenge. She asked him. He shook his head. We need to be smart. We need allies like, say, Suna, but first, we need to get stronger. We can't get allies if we are weak, Chunin level ninja. We will train for the next three years because Jiraiya told me that's when Akatsuki will start moving. This means Itachi will be coming after me and the other members will go against the other Jinchuriki, he told her. She nodded, opting to ask him about what Akatsuki were later. After three years, we can rescue Jinchuriki, making sure Akatsuki can't get them, and gain allies to help us destroy Konoha. Infiltrate it, get the info we need like shinobi strength, security, and other things. Then, we leave again, getting a few people like Kakashi, Jiraiya, and Sanadi, he continued. Satsuki's eyes twitched. What did she still not know? After that, we can kill the villagers before making our own village. Rebuilding is Ushiagakur and remaking the Yuzumaki clan. Naruto finished. Satsuki nodded, not exactly knowing how he would do that when he was the only Yuzumaki alive. Besides Sanadi she realized. After all, the current Hokage was the granddaughter of Mito Yuzumaki. She was too old though, she couldn't have children at all, right? No, Satsuki isn't thinking about Naruto and Sanadi being together. Unless there were more Yuzumakas left, which there might be, then he would have to do it by himself. The next day, Satsuki asked Naruto what Akatsuki was, what Jinchuriki were, and a lot of other stuff. He calmly answered everything he could, but he couldn't do everything, since he himself didn't know who the Jinchuriki were, or the members of the Akatsuki besides some people like Tadara, Itachi, and Kisum. Chapter 2. Training. The two clan heirs had trained the past three years. They learned many ninjutsu from the Ichiha scrolls that Satsuki had brought as well as the ones in the Yuzumaki homeland. Along the way, the two had learned improved their tojutsu, and they also focused on chakra control since Naruto needed the control, while Satsuki needed the reserves. Year 1. Naruto and Satsuki went about the island and discovered scrolls that contained water, wind, and lightning. Satsuki had used her Sharingan to recognize and decode all the seals. She had also used them to memorize every kanji, as well as how to use symbols to hide the true intentions of the seals. Her progress was amazing, able to get up to level 2 on the Yuzumaki scale, which was nearly on par with Yureya. Naruto, on the other hand, blazed through the seals and did it as easy as breathing. Able to decode every seal. Satsuki's progress was amazing, but Naruto completely surpassed her. He could get up to level 5 out of 20. This level had never been reached by another non-Yuzumaki. To be able to create and master the Horation, you had to be level 3.5. Naruto had recreated his father's technique and was also able to figure out a way to improve it a bit. They worked very similarly to the reverse summoning. The kunai or mark had the seal to alert the person to where it was as well as the methods to get there. The kunai itself contained the user's chakra. The seal alerted the user where it was, and another part of the seal reverse summoned them to the kunai. What his father hadn't thought of was that he didn't need the kunai or seal to teleport near where he was. If you had spread your chakra throughout, it wouldn't be very far, but if you mixed your killer intent, which had higher range, with a bit of your chakra, you could teleport to where you needed in the range. It also had a beneficial side effect of your opponent's freeze, if the Kai was high enough. It also used very little chakra since it was already there. I don't know if that is exactly how it works, but hey, it is fiction for a reason, when they had gotten good enough in, they had drawn a resistant seal on themselves using shadow clones. Naruto had suggested this when Satsuki asked him to draw one on her stomach. He had never been a darker shade of red. Of course, they later improved it so that it slowly increased its level, so that it always felt 2x harder to move than it did before. Satsuki so far had gotten to level 12 one hundredths, while, when they had gotten good enough in, they had drawn a resistance seal on themselves using shadow clones. Naruto had suggested this when Satsuki asked him to draw one on her stomach. He had never been a darker shade of red. Of course, they later improved it so that it slowly increased its level, so that it always felt 2x harder to move than it did before. Tsutsuki so far had gotten to level 12 one hundredths, while Naruto had reached 11 one hundredths. Next was. 
Satsuki had brought her mother's sword, Karasu, a 44-inch katana made of chakra conducting metal. The young Ichiha had also brought her mother's scrolls as well. Nakoto called her style Rejeki, which used quick jabs, slashes, and cuts while infusing the sword with her lightning affinity. This always literally shocked everyone when it hit. The technique let Makoto channel her lightning affinity chakra, which then went inside a person's body. The previous Achiha matriarch also let a bit of her regular chakra flow in then, when it was all over the body, turned it into dangerous electricity which killed the person. Tsutsuki was able to improve it to let her use fire as well, which her mother didn't have. Now, when the sword hit, it also burned them. She could also focus her fire chakra into the sword, then fire a condensed ball of fire at her opponents. Naruto had also brought his mother's sword, Benahem. However, he didn't have a style, so he looked around on some of the few buildings he had explored. Flashback, Naruto had just finished looking through the second building and came across the third building. It was a brownstone building with large swirls that were carved in. The building itself was two stories tall and very decayed. Most of the stone had fallen apart on the top right and left corners in the front. Damn it, Satsuki already has a style and is ahead of me. I need to find a style so I can train in. The blonde thought. The shinobi entered the door and looked around. When he looked towards the left he saw a door with some writing on it. He went to the door and read the script. Hello, my fellow Yuzumaki brethren, I am the 23rd clan head of the Yuzumaki clan. Inside of this door are two scrolls for the Yuzumaki Kenjutsu style. There is an offensive and a defensive. Pick whichever you want and study it hard. If you are one of my descendants, you will also be able to find another style next to it. You must drop a bit of your blood into the center, and if you are able to open it, you are free to use the bloody whirlpool dance. Mito Yuzumaki, Naruto went inside the door and saw three pillars. The first two had a scroll on it, while the third one was blank except the spiral. The soon-to-be 14-year-old went to the third pillar. He bit his thumb and quickly pressed it in the spiral before he healed it. The spiral slowly opened and a scroll took its place. Naruto grabbed the white scroll and opened it up. At the top was the title Bloody Whirlpool Dance. How perfectly, the blonde ninja smirked. Flashback end. After he had received that scroll, he used 200 shadow clones to memorize all 200 katas and made it muscle memory. He also used his shadow clones in the style as well. The jutsu was where they had to improve or make their own styles. Satsuki used the interceptor fist. It used the Sharingan to predict the movement of the opponent. Because of this, they could easily hit where the opponent was going to go. There were a few openings in the style, but that was easily covered by the Sharingan. Tsutsuki herself decided to add her fire affinity to the Achiha Tejutsu style. Surrounding her limbs with her fire chakra, she used the fire to blast hot white flames at the opponent. Of course, she didn't just shoot fireballs, she used them to cook her opponents. Naruto used Yuzumaku Ken, the Swirling Wind Fist, previously known as Swirling Fist. It was a mixture between defensive and offensive styles. When you wanted to, you could defend or attack. Naruto, of course, added the element of wind to it. He covered his hands in wind chakra and turned them into wind claws. Using the claws as blades, he could cut the skin of the person. Both used a resistant seal to upgrade their strength and speed. They had to take it off once a week so that their speed didn't blind them. It also helped them speed up their reflexes. By the end of the year both had gotten up to level 33 one hundredths. Satsuki was a little faster than the blonde. This blonde was a bit stronger than Satsuki. Tsutsuki had realized that they both needed to increase their senses if they wanted to sense approaching attacks. The black-haired teen had decided to slowly channel chakra into their senses. Every day, they increased the amount until they could hear anything within 200 meters, see 300 meters, and smell anything in a 20-meter radius. To send someone farther, Naruto always sends a pulse of chakra around them. If anything disturbed the pulse, it would be sensed by Naruto. Of course, he made it so only ninjas could disturb it. The only drawback was that, if there was a sensor in the path, they would sense it and find them too. Naruto had realized that he was pathetic at chakra control. He needed to be able to control his reserves, so he thought of creating new control exercises that combined other ones. He added the leaf spinning exercise to both tree walking and water walking. Both used this technique until they could spin 10 leaves on their fingers while running across up the water tree. Satsuki already had good control, so she used this to increase her chakra reserves. Of course, it would never reach the amount that Naruto had. Satsuki then combined the tree walking and water walking. It was called waterfall walking. There was no waterfall so they had to make one. Ureya had taught Naruto a few doten techniques. He used this to raise the ground upwards. They did this at the back of Yuzushi Agakur where there was a lot of land and water. He had raised up the ground up to three stories tall. Then, Naruto used a basic suetan, Mizu. It just supplied a bit of water, but with Naruto's chakra reserves, he supercharged it and spit out a huge amount of water. This was too much so a water-clad Satsuki threatened him to do it slowly with a few clones and less power. 
Naruto had hastily nodded his head at the threats and followed it. After that, they both climbed up that waterfall. It took Satsuki four days to get it and Naruto one week. After that, Naruto remembered Gaju Fuin. It had completely messed up his chakra control. Naruto had relayed this to Satsuki, and she had agreed to put one on herself. After putting it on, they had taken one month to fully get all the control back. After unsealing the seal, they had found their chakra control had quintupled. Ninjutsu was when Naruto and Satsuki got creative. Both used what they knew and got ideas to make new ones. Satsuki had taken a fireball and uncompressed it. Now it was a huge sea of white flames. She was derived from Chidori. Chidori current, sword art. Chidori katana, Chidori senbin, Chidori sharp spear, Kirin, Rikiri. Both her and Naruto had also used the basics and made them collaborate with others. One was when Naruto used shadow clones and transformed them into kunai. He then stored them for use. Satsuki had done the same as him, but with fewer shadow clones. Since they did nothing but transformation, they lasted for around a week. They also used Kawarimi with kunai to catch people off guard. They had perfected most of them so it required no hand seals for the low ranked and a few seals for high ranked. Naruto combined Bunch and Daibakuha with his clone kunai. This made a kunai that could explode without a seal, and it was unexpected. He also made variants with Rasengan like Adoma Rasengan, Cho Adoma Rasengan. After discovering his elemental affinity of wind and water, he had also created two variations. One was called Futon. Rasengan. The other was called Suotan. Rasengan Typhoon. He added water on top of the Rasengan and kept adding it. Spiraling, swirling chakra, endless amounts of water equals a big typhoon of water. The two teams had also collaborated on their own with each other. Their elements complemented each other. Naruto's wind and Satsuki's fire. The same went for their water and lightning. Chapter 3. Rescuing the Kazakiage, Pain. Dikaku. Suotan. Sugaden. A large bullet of water and a giant ball of white fire were coming at each other. They clashed in the middle, creating a large amount of smoke. Naruto took advantage of the smoke and disappeared. He reappeared behind Satsuki. He tried to punch her, but she leapt forward while turning. She took out her sword and dashed towards Naruto. The blonde shinobi also took out his sword and charged. They both met in the middle. The sound of metal clashing with metal echoed out. Naruto quickly ducked and slashed at her stomach. She jumped back and threw a few kunai. Naruto dodged the kunai ride as it sailed past him. Page Bunshin no Kawarimi. He whispered, creating a smokeless shadow clone and switching with it right before dispelling it without smoke. Satsuki appeared where one of the kunai was and swiped his sword at him. Hinjutsu. Hinatama. The fireball came from the sword and headed straight towards the 16-year-old. He quickly went through a few hand seals and spit it out a compacted ball of water. Again, smoke arose. This time, however, Satsuki charged towards the smaller smoke and covered her hand in lightning. Chirping birds echoed out but were quickly silenced. Now, it was a compacted blade of lightning. She saw a figure coming at her, a spiraling sphere in his hand. Naruto had heard the chirping of the birds and created a shadow clone. The clone created it in its hands and rushed at the smoke. He focused his chakra into his hands and a yellow kunai came out. Uzumaki art. Kongofksa. Kunai. He waited until he heard the clash of the compacted Chidori and Rasengan. After hearing it, he shunshine behind her and I won the Satsuki-chan. He whispered. Satsuki shivered at the breath on her skin. Feeling the kunai, she conceded by nodding. That makes us even. 50-50 with 200 draws. She said, Satsuki, I think we should start on our plan now. It's been three years and the Akatsuki will start looking for Jinchuriki any minute now. Naruto said seriously. He had explained to her who what Akatsuki was and who he knew was in it. He had figured out all this info from having a clone in the office when they were in Konoha. Let's get Gara first. He is the only Jinchuriki I know that we can find. Naruto said. Gara would be the easiest to convince. Naruto wasn't going to recruit every single Jinchuriki, but that didn't mean that they couldn't help him. He knew Iwa wouldn't help. He didn't know where all of them were, so he had to look through the books to see where the Biju were sealed. He knew which country every single Jinchuriki was now. Well then, we should go now, no point in letting Akatsuki get ahead. Satsuki pointed out. He nodded and they both walked towards the shoreline. Since they had much higher reserves, they could run to the other side of the body of water. After running for 30 minutes, they got to the other side of the port. After arriving there, they both headed towards Suna. After running for three days, the two finally saw the entrance to the hidden sand village. Going up to the entrance, they saw a bunch of dead shinobi. Searching for a chakra signature, they felt one that was still alive at the back. When they got there, the shinobi was barely alive and his eyes widened upon seeing them. Naruto and Satsuki went up to the man and asked him what happened. Suna Nin told them that two people infiltrated. They had taken the Kazakiage and headed out. After finding out which way they went, they also headed out. They ran for 40 minutes before being intercepted by a shark sword. 
In front of them appeared an Akatsuki member. His name was Kisum Hashigami. He had a distinctive shark-like appearance, complete with blue-gray skin. He has small, round, wide eyes, three sets of curved facial markings under his eyes, gills on his shoulders, and shark triangular teeth. He had on the Akatsuki's black cloak with red clouds. He also had on a brown sash that went from his right shoulder to left hip. He had his samahata in his hands. Kisum? shouted Naruto. The 16-year-old ran at the shark man with a Rasengan in his hand. Suiten. Bakusui Shma. The Akatsuki members attacked. Naruto saw the water coming at him and jumped up. He put his Rasengan in front of him and started swirling the water like a whirlpool. It sucked in Kisum and he was now in the middle. Naruto increased the rotation of the and the water started to form into a hurricane. He threw the now Rasengan. Hurricane. At that time, Satsuki put her hands on the hurricane and said Raten. Jibashi. The electric hurricane went straight towards the shark-like man. He jumped to dodge, but his opponents got behind him and drew their swords. The man blocked it with his own samahata. They engaged in a clash of swords and slashed and shredded each other. After a few minutes of clashing blades, they finally separated. Naruto and Satsuki had a few cuts on their clothes and body. Kisum had his cloak cut around with blood flowing out of a few cuts. Naruto sent a small amount of killer intent in the air and mixed it with his chakra. He then disappeared in a crimson flash. He reappeared right above Kisum with a Adomura Sengen. He thrusted the attack right on his opponent's back. The missing nin was sent spiraling forward. Satsuki appeared in front of the legendary swordsman and jabbed her lightning-covered fist through his stomach. Kidori. Kisum started to bleed through the wound. Suddenly, he started to shift until a complete white figure with green hair replaced him. Naruto and Satsuki then ran off in the same direction they were going before. When they got near, like one minute away. The entrance, they both sensed a few shinobi going the same way and place they were. They recognized one of the chakra signatures as Kakashi. Satsuki's eyes turned into slits and she jumped to the side to intercept them, but Naruto stopped her. Satsuki, I know you hate them, but this is not the time for this. We need to get to Gara. We'll destroy them another time. Naruto told her. She nodded begrudgingly. They kept running forward until they reached a cave that was enclosed by a boulder. There was a seal in the middle of it. Naruto quickly figured out what it was and sent a team of clones to shut down the other seals. Then, they both hinged so they looked different. They both now had red hair. A few moments later, four other people appeared next to them. One was Kakashi Haddock, another was Sakura Haruno, then Hinata Hayuga, and a woman they hadn't met. Who are you? Questioned the copy nin. We are bounty hunter nins, a price has been placed on Dadara the Mad Bomber. We want to get his bounty, and this was the last place he was seen. Satsuki explained quickly, hiding her hatred for them. Since Dadara was a missing nin, he had a bounty in Iowa. They might need the money for later times, so it was a good excuse. Bakashi nodded and said, well that's acceptable, you can battle him and take his bounty, but we need the Kazakiage. Looked at the boulder and continued. First, we need to take these seals off. Don't worry, I sent clones to take the others off at the same time. I sent 602 for each, and one can dispel when they are ready. Naruto replied. His clones dispelled right then, and he quickly tore off the seal along with the other three. Then the banshee, air, pink-haired nin destroyed the boulder. So Tsunade also taught the girl Sakura her strength technique, huh? Thought Chio, Naruto, and Satsuki at the same time. They all entered the cave to see a lifeless-looking Gara and two other people. One was Dadara. He wore their signature cloak, navy blue pants with matching shinobi sandals, and an Akatsuki ring on his right index finger, which bore the kanji for blue or green, and was teal in color. He also wore black nail polish on his fingers and toes. There was another man next to Dadara. You already know what Sasori looks like. Imagine Leaf and Chio vs. Sasori is the same as canon, but with shadow clone Chios and more puppet humans for her. They faced each other and separated the Akatsuki members from each other. Naruto and Satsuki chased after Dadara while leaving the others to beat the other one. Dadara created a clay bird and rode on it into the sky. He sent a bunch of clay and used his explosion Genkai to make them explode. This was useless on Satsuki, who covered her body in lightning and made them duds. Naruto sent a bit of his Kai chakra at him, then Horatian behind him. He drilled the other blonde with a Rasengan. He fell to the ground and Satsuki easily shredded him to pieces with her lightning-infused sword. When he was finally shredded, the giant clay bird, along with himself, exploded. Satsuki recorded this with her Sharingan. After their battle, the two best friends went back to the other battle. When they arrived, they saw a red-haired man that was slowly dying. They got close to him and he told them some information. I have a spy within Arachimaru's ranks. He was supposed to meet me at Tenchi Bridge in 10 days. It might help you guys. After getting the information, all the shinobi looked at the dead body of the Kazakiage. He was dead and they had no way to revive him. Well, all but Chiyo that is. I can revive Gara, but it will cost me my life force. 
Chiyo said. She really wanted to revive Gara. She was going to die soon, and it would be for the better if Gara didn't die. She needed to pay for the mistakes of the past after all. The Kanoha shinobi nodded somberly. They didn't like any of their comrades dying. They cared a lot about them. Naruto and Satsuki didn't exactly care. She wasn't someone they knew or cared about. She was a stranger to them after all. And Sakura and Hinata took Gara, and all of them started going back to the village. When they arrived near it, they laid Gara in a grassy field, and Chiyo hovered over him. She went through the hand signs for her revival technique. Ishin Tensei. She shouted. Her hands were covered in chakra and placed over the previous Yinchuriki chest. The old woman's life force began to fade away while the Kazakiyages was restored. The redhead's eyes began to slowly open. He looked all around him and then saw all the people in front of him. His eyes widened in surprise and confusion. He was confused on who his fellow redheads were. He hadn't ever met them in his life. He was surprised to see the Kanoha shinobi there and Chiyo dead. Where am I? He asked, his voice mixed with confusion and surprise. Dadara vs Naruto and Satsuki place. All the pieces of Dadara slowly started to turn into white skin. A distortion appeared and two figures appeared. Well, it appears that Dadara will need to get a new partner. One figure said. It appears so. The other figure said, I will fill that role, it seems. Chapter 4. Alliance and a snake. Where am I? Gara asked, his voice mixed with confusion and surprise. Why wouldn't he be? He just had a Bijuu extracted out of him and died. He then saw Chiyo lying dead and his eyes widened in realization. Did Chiyo use her reincarnation jutsu? He asked. He saw them nod and asked himself why, why did she revive me? I am not that very important to anyone in the village he was cut off by a shout of, Hazuki Ajsama. He looked towards the direction of the voice and widened his eyes upon seeing all the shinobi of Sunagakur. Did they come to see me? He thought. All the ninjas started celebrating upon seeing Gara, who was still in shock from seeing them. After all the shinobi went to Chiyo's funeral, the Kanoha shinobi left to go back to their village. Naruto and Satsuki asked to meet Gara in private. He allowed this and made them follow him into the Kazakiage tower. After getting to the previous Shukaku Jinchuriki's office, he sat down in his chair and asked them, what did you want to talk to me about? The redhead felt them channel their chakra and got his sand ready. What he saw stunned him. In front of him were Naruto and Sasuke. Naruto wore dark red cargo pants. He had on a dark blue shirt. Sasuke had on dark black shinobi pants with gray long-sleeved shirt. Then Naruto. S. Sasuke he was interrupted by another poof from Sasuke. In the poof, a feminine Sasuke appeared. Who are you? He asked, confused. A woman just appeared in front of him, replacing where Sasuke Ichiha was. My name is Itsuki Ichiha. Sasuke Ichiha was a persona developed because of a Jinjutsu that protected me from Kra. She stokely explained. Gara was shocked as hell. Sasuke Ichiha was a female, what the hell. He compassed himself, after all he was the Kazakiage, and asked alright, Naruto, Satsuki, what are you two doing here? I heard that you had left for Orochimaru and that you had taken Naruto with you. That's a bullshit story made up by Kanoha. They assumed that Satsuki captured me and left. I wanted to leave that village, and since I cared too much about Satsuki, I went to find her, then took her with me. Said Naruto in anger. Gara, don't tell anyone that we aren't at Itagakur. He then requested. The Kazakiage nodded to his first and best friend's request. Okay Naruto, but only because you are my best friend. Now tell me where you two were if not at Orochimaru's village. He asked curiously. Where were they during the three years? Why does palpably dislike Kanoha? These questions were rushing through his head. We were training at my clan's homeland, Yuzushi Agakur. Naruto responded to the question. Gara was shocked. His village had attacked the village and had obliterated it with Kumo and Kiri. Another reason he was shocked at this was because his best friend was an actual Yuzumaki. The Godim Kazakiage nodded his head, gesturing to them to continue. I want to destroy it for a couple of reasons. One is that they stabbed Yuzu in the back and let the other nations invade the Yuzumakis. Two. They treated me like trash and would never help me no matter what. They always beat me and tried to assassinate me. 3. Is for just who they are. I want to show the world what they truly are. They portray themselves as the kindest village, but look at what happened to me, how they treated me. How they treated Satsuki-chan. They said that they loved her, but look at them now that she left. Look what they did for her. They never helped her at all, just kissed her. Others might be alike, but they have a reason. Iwa hates them because the Yandame Hokage killed many of their people. Tsuna used to because Kanoha took the money from here and never helped them, despite being allies. They are also full of assholes. Look at the White Fang, their most powerful shinobi, stronger than the Sanin, harassed into suicide for doing what the village is always going on about. Teamwork and comrades are important, yet he is harassed into putting his comrades first. They even forced Ida Naruto ranted furiously until Satsuki interrupted him. 
Ara had to admit he made some, okay, a lot of good points. He still needed to know why they were here. He had some suspicions, but just to be sure. Alright, you bring up a lot of good points, but why are you here? He asked. Naruto looked at Gara and said bluntly we want your help to destroy it. The Kazuki sighed and said. I really want to help you Naruto, after all, you're my best friend, but my village is very important to me. If we waged war against Konoha, we might lose and this time, they might destroy this village. Don't worry Gara. me and Satsuki will infiltrate Konoha later and destroy and damage a good part of the village. You should prepare your forces and tell them to start training hard. When we deliver a message via Toad. When we do, you should send your forces. We will go back and I will summon Gamabunta to help me. We should be able to destroy them to the point that they aren't a threat. After that, we could destroy that place to the ground. The blonde said seriously to the Kazakiage. Ara contemplated this, there were a few benefits to this. One was that if the people heard that they destroyed Konoha, the strongest nation, many clients would come to them, which would highly increase the economy of Suna. The daimyo was still sending some missions for Suna to Konoha like before. Another was that if they did destroy it, they could take over the land, giving them the geological benefits of it. Suna and Konoha had different geological benefits. It would give them more area to help both civilians and shinobi. More training fields. More marketing places. The alliance didn't help them as much as it did Konoha, but they had to agree to avoid being destroyed. They also got to help his best friend. Okay Naruto, I will try to convince the council that we should go to war with them. I'm with you, but the council will need some convincing. After all, you can't easily convince them that two 16-year-olds are a better ally than a whole village, right? Chuckled the redhead. Naruto nodded and replied, Okay Gara, me and Satsuki will come back in about two weeks to get the answer. He said happily. Oh yeah Gara, here, Naruto fished into his kunai holder and took out a Horatian kunai in case you needed it. Gara's eyes widened upon seeing the legendary kunai. He took it, but before he could ask any questions, the two disappeared in a bolt of lightning and a tornado of water. The blonde and Ravenette appeared a bit away from Suna. Now they needed to go to another place as well. Hirachimaru's place. It was a good thing that Naruto had left a Horatian kunai hidden in the land of hot springs during one of the rests they had when coming to Suna. Naruto grabbed Satsuki by her midriff and pulled her closer, which caused a small tint of pink on her cheeks, and teleported them to the nation of Hot Springs. After landing safely near the border of Fire, Hot Springs, and Odo, they quickly hurried towards the hidden sound village. Satsuki knew precisely where it was, having gotten a map for it three years ago. They hid behind the rocks around the village that was erected by Orochimaru during the three years from a small base to a town-sized village. The two partners phased out and knocked the protectors of the gate out. Taking in the appearance of the two Odo ninja, Naruto and Satsuki, performed the Ipai Henge, an advanced form of the normal Henge. It was just as it was named, a solid transformation of what you wanted to be. It was a ninjutsu-jinjutsu hybrid, mostly ninjutsu though, that was accidentally recreated by Naruto during the academy days. They looked at the schedule for the time the guards patrolled. Since their time was nearly done, they departed from the gates and traveled to the stone house in the middle of the village. They quickly reached it and went inside, only to find two more Odo ninjas. They looked at the two henged shinobi and questioned why they were there. After replying that they needed to file a report for their guard duties, they were let through. They went down the dark stairs, releasing their transformation along the way. They finally entered the dark orange base of Arachimaru's and slowly searched each door. Suddenly, they paused as they sensed someone coming. The Sagakur Satsuki whispered, touching Naruto's shoulder, and faded away into thin air. A few moments later, a man recognized as Kabuto Yakushi walked through the halls. They stealthily walked past a man, but they were unprepared for him to suddenly cover his hands in chakra, creating a chakra scalpel, and slashing Naruto at his face. Through his instincts alone, Naruto was just barely able to dodge it. Satsuki blurred behind the bastard who hurt her best friend and shoved a kunai through the back of his heart. Of course, he survived this due to his Inyushimetsu. He didn't see the Adoma Rasengan coming right at his stomach. Kabuto flew through the air in a spiral pattern until they couldn't see him. Continuing through the halls, they finally came across the door that hid Arachimaru from them. Satsuki charged her right hand with lightning chakra and condensed it. She then thrust her hand forward, the lightning lengthening, going straight through the door until they heard flesh being pierced. Naruto kicked the door down, Benihim covered by wind chakra. They saw Arachimaru with his hands up. Arachimaru was a tall man with long black hair. His skin was so pale that it looked like his skin was paste white. His eyes were angular and very snake-like with pale golden pupils. His ears had purple tomo-shaped earrings. He was wearing a red button-up shirt with brown palm trees on it. His hands were raised up in an X position, Satsuki's Yadori spear. Satsuki walked closer to the snake-like man, her lightning spear going forward as well. The pedophile snake forced his hand to the side so that it didn't pierce his face. 
she used her free hand to take out Karasu and swerve it down vertically. A distortion appeared in the air before it was covered by azure flames. They went straight towards the sick and unhealthy shinobi and burned his skin. A snake sage opened his mouth, and another Arachimara appeared from between. Tsutsuki and Naruto shivered that is still creepy and disgusting as hell. They both thought the snake settled onto the ground and opened his mouth again. This time however, a handle to a blade appeared. The handle was grabbed and pulled which caused the rest of the blade to appear from. Arachimaru swung the blade at them, its length increasing. Naruto and Satsuki dodged to the side and jumped towards him. Naruto created an Adoma Rasengan in his hand, while Satsuki created a Chidori. They pulled their hands back and threw them forward. Arachimaru ducked under them and kicked them upwards. While in the air, the two friends glanced at each other, and after a quick confirmation from each other, they turned to each other and held out their hand to each other. The air rank collided without any force. Unexpectedly, the two were absorbed into each other. A white light appeared in between their nearly conjoined hands. When the light disappeared, a black sphere with dark purple lightning coursing inside the most inner shell. Black electricity was shooting out of the sphere. They both pulled back and yelled collaboration. Yami's in Azuma no Shikik and hurled the purple sphere towards one of the legendary Sanin. It hit its target and Arachimaru was on the ground bloody. He slightly and was able to just barely open his mouth. Something shot out of it and Arachimaru's body died. They both looked towards the place where the thing went and saw. Chapter 5. Team Yuzu. Arachimaru ducked under them and kicked them upwards. While in the air, the two friends glanced at each other, and after a quick confirmation from each other, they turned to each other and held out their hand to each other. The air rank collided without any force. Unexpectedly, the two were absorbed into each other. A white light appeared in between their nearly conjoined hands. When the light disappeared, a black sphere with dark purple lightning coursing inside the most inner shell. Black electricity was shooting out of the sphere. They both pulled back and yelled collaboration. Yami's in Azuma no Shikik and hurled the purple sphere towards one of the legendary Sanin. It hit its target and Arachimaru was on the ground bloody. He slightly and was able to barely open his mouth. Something shot out of it and Arachimaru's body died. They both looked towards the place where the thing went and saw a giant white snake made up of many smaller snakes, with longer, spikier hair, a scaled face with snake-like teeth and a long tongue, black eye markings, and a pointed chin. Arachimaru hurled his head towards Naruto with his mouth wide open. Releasing his killer intent, the Horatian behind the snake blasted him with a futon. Raijin. The massive wind dragon shredded Arachimaru all over, leaving many deep cuts all over his body. Arachimaru then went to Satsuki, but was blasted by lightning. However, the snake turned into a mud clone. From behind Naruto, the head of Arachimaru came at him. Naruto, caught off guard, got swallowed. Then, Arachimaru started his living corpse reincarnation jutsu, lentil plane. Naruto appeared in a place in which the ground was full of moving, slimy, organs. Arachimaru also appeared in front of him. Both were covered in the organs so he could only see the snake Sanin's hair and face, which had returned to human form. Hello Naruto-kun, this is my mindscape. Here, everything is in my control, I am God. I will take over your body, use your memories, and take over satsuki chans body at a later time. Insanely laughed. Mindscape ha, huh, idiot. Naruto smirked and closed his eyes. Suddenly, the area around them started to shimmer until all there was a dark void. Then, it started to change once again, this time, they appeared in an area where everything was golden and white with stars all around. Where Naruto meet Kishina. Naruto attacked Arachimaru. Arachimaru was about to dodge, but unable to move. He looked down and widened his eyes upon seeing golden chains around his legs. Naruto created a futon Rasengan that tore through his body. Arachimaru died in the mindscape as black chakra seeped out of his body and into Naruto. The Yuzumaki had just absorbed all the knowledge and chakra of Arachimaru. In his last breath, Arachimaru asked how did you do this? This is my mind, I am God here. You are not God Arachipito. He insulted you as a mere mortal with a God complex. I am a Jinchuriki, I can easily access my mindscape. You need meditation to go in here, I can do it at will. When you had foolishly told me it was a mindscape, you didn't realize that I could also control it. After that, it was a mere matter to transfer us here to my mindscape, where my will is much stronger than yours. I control this realm. He explained. Real world. When Naruto was swallowed by Arachimaru, Satsuki was very angry. She charged a Chidori through her hands and put forth more chakra. The Chidori grew in size until it was the size of an Adamara Sengen. She ran towards the giant snake and slammed it right at his head. This destroyed the head. Then, a Katen. Nkakak no jutsu to the rest of the body, and it was burned into ashes. But then went to the unconscious Naruto and put his head on her lap. She looked at his face adoringly while softly petting his whiskers. He unconsciously purred and she giggled. Naruto finally woke up to see that he was in Suki-chan's lap. He got up after a few moments of enjoying it. What happened in Naruto-kun? 
Satsuki asked curiously, her head unconsciously tilted to the right. Pewterachimaru tried to take over my mind, but the idiot was stupid and died there. I absorbed his chakra, knowledge of the ninja world, as well as all that he knew. I'm gonna teach them to you. The teen replied. Satsuki nodded her head to both the answer as well as him teaching her Rachimaru's. For the next few days, Satsuki had her Sharingan copy almost every of Rachimaru's that Naruto used. Some of them were already known to her, and some were ones that Naruto said were disgusting or not good for them. She learned Binding Snake Glare Spell, Chakra Scalpel, Earth Release. Hiding Like a Mole Technique, Earth Release. Shadow Clone, Force Symbol Seal, Kinjutsu Trap, Jinjutsu Binding Hidden Doorway Technique, Hidden Shadow Snake Hands, Hideout Destruction Trap, Hiding in Surface Technique, Many Hidden Shadow Snake Hands, Shadow Clone Technique, Shuriken Shadow Clone Technique, Snake Mouth Bind, Sound Wave Technique, Summoning. Impure World Reincarnation, Summoning. Rashmon, Summoning. Triple Rashmon, Sword of Kusanagi. Long Sword of the Sky, Temporary Paralysis Technique from him. Once Itsuki had copied all of them, they both created hundreds of cage bunshin and had 19 cage bunshin focused on each one. After they all practiced for an hour, all the groups would dispel one at a time, 10 seconds each. Since the chakra left always went back to the user, plus their very high reserves, they were able to create more. This went on for 5 hours every day. Due to this, they had allotted a total amount of 21 days and 21 hours for each technique. They mastered every single, the two had also created a summoning seal with the kusanagi. The seal connected to a seal they both had on their right arm. This way, they could both use the legendary sword when needed. Naruto and Satsuki had also trained with Kusanagi every day. They mastered the sword's different uses and figured out a way to merge it into their Kenjutsu style, which allowed the 2S class rank shinobi to use either one or two swords to fight. Since they still had five more days left to go to the bridge, Naruto explored some of Orochimaru's memories and discovered some people who could help them in their quest. There were three people, Sajetsu Hazuki, Karen Yuzumaki, and a person named Juugo, whose body could apparently absorb nature chakra. When Naruto found out about Karen being his family, he was ecstatic to meet her. After discussing this with his best friend, the two agreed to go get the three as they would be helpful. Both headed towards Sajetsu since he was the closest. The teens headed towards the lab that contained Sajetsu. After 10 minutes of traveling, they finally got to lab number 18. They dived underwater and went over to the other side of the area. After resurfacing, they both pulled themselves up and channeled chakra to their feet to walk on water. Looking around, they found themselves in an area with many holding tubes. Naruto and Satsuki went towards the only one that held a being. After getting right in front of it, the Achiha heiress withdrew her sword and cut the tube open, spilling all the water out. She then sheathed Karasu. From all the remaining water on the floor, a white goop started to come up. It morphed into a being afterwards. Sajetsu is a lean-built young man of average height, straight white hair with a light blue tint to it, almond-shaped purple eyes, and like most of the members of the seven ninja swordsmen of the mist, he has pointed teeth, one of which stuck out, even when his mouth was closed. He wears a purple, sleeveless shirt with blue pants, sandals and a belt around his waist, with water bottles attached to it. He also had another belt attached to his waist. As he was standing up he said, thank you. Naruto Uzumaki Satsuki Achiha the clan heirs introduced, thank you for freeing me, I assume that you both killed Orochimaru since you are both here. The white-haired teen said, yeah, Satsuki nodded. Sajetsu, you're the first, come with us. Naruto said seriously, so, I'm the first, meaning. We'll get more company? He asked, do more. The raven-haired woman said, you go from the northern hideout of Orochimaru's and Karen Uzumaki from the southern hideout. Naruto continued, Uzumaki? Are you and Karen related? Sajetsu questioned. Yeah, I'm not sure how, but we are from the same clan. The blonde-haired shinobi said. Damn it. He muttered. With their heightened senses, the two heard him and Satsuki asked, what? It's just that. I'm not fond of them. I don't think I'll get along with those two. Myself aside, I wonder what you two plan to do with those two after retrieving them. The aspiring swordsman of the mist replied, doesn't matter, we aren't asking you three to get along, just work together, you don't have to be best friends. Now let's go, Naruto replied then commanded. Satsuki and he walked off, but Sajetsu started laughing. He said, speaking like you're better than me, are you? The purple-wearing shinobi phased out and in, right behind Naruto, holding his thumb and ring finger in a gun position. Let's make our relationship clear he was interrupted by a puff of smoke. When it cleared, Naruto was behind him, Kishina's sword at his throat. Fine, you helped me due to your own convenience. I haven't said a single word about coming with you and your girlfriend. He or she isn't my boyfriend-girlfriend. They replied with blushes on their cheeks. In his opinion, Satsuki looked pretty beautiful and cute. All three compliments intended, whatever, you two aren't above me just cause you two killed Orochimaru. Everyone was after him, you guys just got there faster. The boy said. 
After a stare down between them, Sujetsu just jumped forward a bit and said, Just kidding, since you two freed me, I guess that I'm free to go. Finally able to do what I want. The boy said and walked off. The Ichiha and Yuzumaki heirs just sighed and said I see, how unfortunate. And left. Time skip. Outside the lab. Two minutes later, as they were walking through the forest, a voice came up front. Come to think of it, wasn't it you and your sensei who defeated my great senpai, Zabuza Mamachi? They stopped walking and looked at the giant puddle that Sajetsu was swimming in. I wonder what happened to his sword, the Kubikaramju. A short pause how about this, if you two lead me to the sword, I wouldn't mind helping you too. He offered. Naruto opened his holster and took out a scroll with a kanji for sword. Naruto poured a bit of his chakra in and, with proof of smoke, the decapitating carving knife appeared. He threw it towards Sajetsu who easily caught his dream blade. W where did you get this he asked the blonde. When we buried Zabuza and Haku, a Yuki member and Zabuza's apprentice, I knew that the sword would get stolen, so I took it and sealed it in a scroll. Naruto replied. Satsuki and Sajetsu nodded, and all three headed out towards the southern base to find Karen Yuzumaki, the next member to their team. Chapter 6. Completion. As they were walking through the forest, a voice came up front. Come to think of it, wasn't it you and your sensei who defeated my great senpai, Zabuza Mamachi? They stopped walking and looked at the giant puddle that Sajetsu was swimming in. I wonder what happened to his sword, the Kubikaramj. A short pause how about this, if you two lead me to the sword, I wouldn't mind helping you too. He offered. Naruto opened his holster and took out a scroll with a kanji for sword. Naruto poured a bit of his chakra in and, with proof of smoke, the decapitating carving knife appeared. He threw it towards Sajetsu who easily caught his dream blade. W where did you get this he asked the blonde. When we buried Zabuza and Haku, a Yuki member and Zabuza's apprentice, I knew that the sword would get stolen, so I took it and sealed it in a scroll. Naruto replied. Satsuki and Sajetsu nodded, and all three headed out towards the southern base to find Karen Yuzumaki, the next member to their team. At an island to the south, a scream echoed out as a woman wearing a lavender uniform that exposed her navel, short black shorts, and long black thigh-high stockings with black sandals. Her face and hair shadowed. Just because that bastard Orochimaru is dead doesn't mean that you can free your killers. The woman spoke. Suddenly, the woman froze. She had just sensed a huge amount of warm chakra. She had never felt anything as warm and kind as it. As she probed it, she felt herself freeze in fear. Deeper inside this warm chakra was an evil and sinister feeling. It was as if it was made of anger and hatred. For some reason, the chakra was approaching her location. This chakra and the feeling with it was a little familiar to her. She remembered sensing it around three one half years ago. She walked through the jail cells allowing them all to see the woman in front of them. She has crimson eyes, fair skin, and the characteristic red hair of the Yuzumaki clan. Her hair is short and spiky on the right side, while longer and straight on the left side. She wears brown narrow glasses, and her outfit consists of a lavender uniform that exposes her navel, short black shorts, and long black thigh-high stockings with black sandals. This was Karen Yuzumaki of the Yuzumaki clan. She was kidnapped by Rachimaru, who, as she later discovered, had killed her entire family without her knowing. He had appeared as a man who wanted to help her, and she, as an impressionable child, followed him. For the longest time, she had been loyal to him until she had discovered him when he was talking to his ass-fuck buddy, Caputo. The bastard knew she was there so she was forced to heal who he wanted with her blood. She had a unique bloodline, well, bloodlines. Anyways, her blood allowed anyone to heal instantly. She had trained in after she had eventually remembered her clan from her mother. She had kept this a secret from her captor though. She had also trained in some other things. After all, she was in Yuzumaki, and she had obtained limitless energy and stamina as well as hyperactivity, just more controlled. But Naruto, Satsuki, Sajetsu, the trio were walking through the water in the middle of somewhere. They had been walking to the southern hideout for two hours now. Finally, an island appeared in front of them. They ran towards it, positive, at least Naruto, that it was the southern hideout. The appearance was very weird. It was a bunch of rocks that were probably hollow, jutted upwards. They arrived at the shoreline and looked around only to see a cave entrance. The new team walked through the entrance and saw another door. Satsuki and Sajetsu noticed that there were no guards around the door. Why are there no guards here? Sui voiced the question. There is no need, after all, she guards it. Spoke to Naruto. His borrowed knowledge from Arachipito had given him everything Arachi knew. You mean Karen? What makes her so special that only she needs to guard this entire prison? He asked while destroying the door with his new sword. She is a sensor with a vast range. She can sense things that are miles away. The blonde shinobi answered. Sui nodded to the answer, indicating he understood. They went inside to hide out and throughout the stone prison. Naruto sends out a pulse of chakra. It bounced every way until he finally found Karen. He put his arms around Satsuki's waist instinctively and Sui's shoulder. 
He didn't see Satsuki's blush or hear Sui's thoughts. I thought Naruto said they weren't boyfriend-girlfriend. In a flash of white, blue, and black, the trio appeared in front of a stunned and surprised Yuzumaki. An unspoken Yuzumaki concerning rule, never appear out of nowhere and surprise them. Anf saw the teen spoke as multiple golden chains rushed from her, held out palms and attacked the intruders. Naruto summoned his own adamantine chains, though they were swords. He slashed the golden chains with his own golden sword, Rudensuri Dot. Wait. We're friends. Naruto shouted at her. She didn't trust them, but she let her chains rest to hear them out. All right, talk. The Riti demanded. My name is Naruto Yuzumaki. He was interrupted by Karen's wide eyes and her exclamation of Yuzumaki. What do you mean Naruto Yuzumaki? I mean that I am in Yuzumaki. My mother was Kashina Yuzumaki. Naruto pointed out. Kashina. That name sounds familiar. Realization appeared on her face. Oh, yeah, Kashina Yuzumaki, my mom's cousin. Kachan always talked about her. Guess we are cousins then, she asked in amusement. The reply she got was, eh, guess so. With a smirk. So, why are you here? She asked, Satsuki Achiha points at his crush Sajetsu Hazuki points at his new comrade, and I are making a new team. We will have one more member with us. What do you say cuz? Wanna join? He asked, what about Arachimaru? She asked nervously. She might hate the motherfucker, but he was still much stronger than her. Don't worry, we killed him. Just don't spread it out though, can't let anyone know. He smiled warmly at her. Satsuki twitched upon seeing it. They were family so it was natural, but it still bothered her at the thought of her best friend being with other girls. Wait, do I love Naruto? She blushed at the thought, which confused the hell out of Sui and Karen. After sorting her thoughts out and throwing in the reason she would like him, she confirmed that she did love her crush. Meanwhile, Karen nodded at Naruto's request. After that, they left the base. When they got out, Satsuki and Naruto glanced at each other and nodded. Futen. Tatsumaki. Naruto gathered his wind chakra at his lungs and breathed it out. It started to swirl until it was a giant tornado. It gathered the water around it to form an outer shell made of water. Rain. Kikch Kaminari. Satsuki brought her pale hands downwards, causing unnatural lightning to fly towards the water typhoon. Collaboration. Kaminari no Tatsumaki. They shouted. The lightning mixed with the water and vaporized it leaving only vapor around the tornado. The tornado now had little water droplets around it. Every time the water vapor was cooled, the lightning vaporized it. The blue plasma was jumping from water droplets to droplets, vaporizing them while they turned back to water. The tornado was surrounded by lightning all over after a while. Naruto and Satsuki then brought the tornado down from the sky on top of the base, completely shredding and shocking burning it. Sajetsu and Karen were shocked upon seeing the power that their friends had. They shook it off and excitedly asked what the hell that was. The clan Erera smiled and explained it to the other members. So who are we going to get next, I remember you saying you need one more person. Since you have Sajetsu and me, I'm guessing it is someone from Arachimaru. She asked. Naruto looked at her and nodded to her question, but Satsuki was the one who spoke. We're gonna recruit Jugo from the northern hideout. She nodded. She didn't have a problem with the guy, just thought that he was a psychopath. At an island to the northern hideout, at an area made of brown rocks that were pretty tall, a sound of insane laughter echoed throughout the walls of the hideout. Looking at the inside of a certain cell, we find a man with orange hair laughing insanely while saying if the next person to come works for Rachimaru, I will kill him or her. Go is a tall, muscular young man who has spiky orange hair, red-orange eyes. He wore a pale blue shirt and pale green shorts. He has a giant black metal ball chain to his leg. He freezes as he feels a large amount of negative energy. He calms down from his murderous side. Outside the northern hideout, the quartet arrived at the outskirts of the hideout. The group of four headed inside the hideout. Sensing the strongest chakra inside the cells. Finally arriving at the cell holding it, Satsuki opened it. Yugo looked up to see a ravenette woman. He asked do you work for Arachimaru? Satsuki nodded her head no. Why are you here then? He asked once again. We're here to free you and if you want, to join our team. Naruto voiced. Free? No 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 he shook his head, you can't free me, if you do, I'll get angry, then go insane and hurt you. He stated confidently though hurt. Don't worry Jugo, I can absorb Sinjutsu Chakra due to an incident that happened 16 years ago. Since you get angry and the Sinjutsu amplifies it, I can absorb it while you learn control. You can train with it to control with me near you. What do you say Jugo, would you like to come? Naruto offered. After thinking about it, Jugo nodded his head. Clothes landed on him and he looked at Satsuki. That dressed, can't have you going out like that, can we she told him. They left the cell while Jugo changed. Now he had on a black muscle shirt with grey cargo pants. He then left his cell. Naruto. Satsuki, since we are all gathered now, what is our goal? Sajetsu asked. Our goal is to ultimately destroy Konoha. Don't attack recklessly though. Me and Satsuki will go to Konoha with you three. 
We have a plan ready. Naruto told them. Anyways, right now we need to be patient. I will take you to our base, Yuzu. You three will train off the schedule that we will create for each of you. I will teleport you there. We will be back in a few days alright. All the trio were hesitant, they nodded and he put his hands on Sajetsu and Karen who touched Jugo and Satsuki's shoulders. Concentrating on the Horatian mark that was on Yuzu, he teleported them to the island. Naruto then grabbed Satsuki's waist and Hirai shined them to the outskirts of Odo. Since they had one day left to meet the Konoha team at Tenchi Bridge. They had a plan to lure the Konoha ninja to attack them and follow them to their base. When there, they would make a clone of themselves to give a message to Kakashi. They knew the Kakashi would be there since they were there. Kaka-sensei was one of the few people they liked at Konoha. Three hours later, they had been running for three hours now. They were at Takigakur, a village they had saved in the past. As they were running through the forest, they heard the sounds of fighting. Naruto sent out a pulse of chakra towards it, and here I shined there with his hands around Satsuki. When they appeared in a blue and black flash, they saw two people fighting with a girl around their age. The girl was petite androgynous tan-skinned Kanoichi, who wore an orange clip in her short layered mint green hair that matched her eye color, which was also orange. Her ninja outfit consisted of a short sleeveless white midriff shirt with fishnet armor underneath, long wide armlets, and fishnet shorts with a short wide apron skirt over it. Her forehead protector was worn on her right arm, though it had a slash on it. FK also carried a cylindrical object in red wrapping on her back. The attackers were people that Naruto recognized as Hayden and Kakuzu. Kakuzu was a very tall tan-skinned man with long dark brown hair. His eyes had an unusual coloring. Green eye rides, no pupils and red sclery. He still appears as a man well within his prime, retaining a very muscular build, despite his advanced age. He retained the black mask over his lower face, but had several changes. He donned a white hood which covered his hair. His clothing included the traditional Akatsuki cloak, the Takigakur forehead protector with a scratch in the middle, which symbolized that he was no longer loyal to it, and grey pants with matching shinobi sandals. He also wore brown nail polish, and a dark green Akatsuki ring with the kanji for north was placed on his left middle finger. He had various stitches on his body. Aiden has medium-length grey hair that was slicked back and distinctive purple eyes. He had no shirt, but bears the organization's cloak, which he kept slightly opened, revealing his Yugakur forehead protector around his neck and Jashin amulet. He changes his bottoms to grey pants with matching shinobi sandals. He also wore dark green nail polish and his orange Akatsuki ring on his left index finger, which bears the kanji for three. Chapter 7. Retrieval Games They had been running for three hours now. They were at Takigakur, a village they had saved in the past. As they were running through the forest, they heard the sounds of fighting. Naruto sent out a pulse of chakra towards it and Horatian there with his hands around Satsuki. When they appeared in a blue and black flash, they saw two people fighting with a girl around their age. The girl was petite androgynous tan-skinned Kanoichi, who wore an orange clip in her short layered mint green hair that matched her eye color, which was also orange. Her ninja outfit consisted of a short sleeveless white midriff shirt with fishnet armor underneath, long wide armlets, and fishnet shorts with a short wide apron skirt over it. Her forehead protector was worn on her right arm, though it had a slash on it. FK also carried a cylindrical object in red wrapping on her back. The attackers were people that Naruto recognized as Hayden and Kakuzu. Kakuzu was a very tall tan-skinned man with long dark brown hair. His eyes had an unusual coloring. Green eye rides, no pupils and red sclery. He still appears as a man well within his prime, retaining a very muscular build, despite his advanced age. He retained the black mask over his lower face, but had several changes. He donned a white hood which covered his hair. His clothing included the traditional Akatsuki cloak, the Takigakur forehead protector with a scratch in the middle, which symbolized that he was no longer loyal to it, and grey pants with matching shinobi sandals. He also wore brown nail polish, and a dark green Akatsuki ring with the kanji for north was placed on his left middle finger. He had various stitches on his body. Aiden has medium-length grey hair that was slicked back and distinctive purple eyes. He had no shirt, but bears the organization's cloak, which he kept slightly opened, revealing his Yugakur forehead protector around his neck and Jashin amulet. He changes his bottoms to grey pants with matching shinobi sandals. He also wore dark green nail polish and his orange Akatsuki ring on his left index finger, which bears the kanji for three. Knowing information about some of Akatsuki thanks to Orochimaru's knowledge, the two partners knew about the immortal duo. Kakuzu had five hearts that let him live even if killed five times. Hayden was an immortal due to some god that was named Jashin. They didn't know why Orochimaru never became a Jashinist, since the bastard had no problems with killing other people. He would bring utter chaos and destruction with deaths all over. That was all that was required. But Fu, who had been captured, or better said, given, to two people. One of these two she knew. Kakuzu, a man who had lived for over a hundred years. 
A powerful man that had fought the god of shinobi, Hashirama Senju. The man used a sacred kinjutsu called Earth Grudge Fear. The Earth Grudge Fear is a secret of Takigakur which transforms the user's body into something similar to that of a rag doll, held together by hundreds of thick black threads. Akuzu had stolen the knowledge of this technique before his defection from Takigakur and was able to manipulate black threads for many purposes. Some of them were listed on his page in the bingo book. This technique allowed the missing Nin to have five hearts, meaning that he had to be killed five times. Anyways, Fu was given to the two men by the Council of Taki, ignoring the vote of the village leader. The two Akatsuki members had gone on to Takigakur due to Kakuzu's plan and went to the council. The ninja had been hesitant to attack one of their most powerful shinobi yet, as well as his companion, an S-class missing nin. Fu still remembered what that damn council of bastards did and what happened afterwards. Fu's flashback, Fu was in a sacred place to her. It was hidden behind a waterfall that no one had ventured into. On the other side was a very small waterfall that poured into a lake at the center of a grove. Unlike the falls that hid Taki's entrance, the clearing had several sparse groupings of flowers. Their fragrance, combined with the crisp, clean air produced by the water and the earthen scent of the forest, gave the area an appeal even the majestic falls outside of Taki's entrance lacked. As Fu was relaxing by the peaceful river, a conversation was happening within her. Mindscape, Fu was in a large forest. The forest was covered in large deciduous trees. As Fu kept walking throughout the area, she finally arrived at a clearing. The clearing had a small stream with fishes swimming. Sunlight shone through the thick trees, making the clearing appear as a spotlight. Next to a stream, there was a log that was used as a seat for a man. The man had long, spiky blue hair. Madara style, orange eyes. He wore a long-sleeved light blue shirt and pants, with a mesh armor shirt and fitted black suit underneath, along with calf-length sandals. Around his waist he wore a brown sash that held a brown armor-like breastplate with a pouch in the front, a brown backplate on the back that is connected to the front with mesh armor and armored lapels falling to the sides. This was the human form of Chimay, the Nambi, and the rhinoceros beetle. The man looked at the 18-year-old teen and said hello young pupa, I guess that you want to leave this village now. The man asked her. He had seen the life of the girl and felt sympathy for her. After all, most known were treated like the biju they contained, like weapons and monsters. Chimay had always hated civilians and low-tiered ninja like Jenin, those who didn't know the difference between water and glass. He somewhat respected the Jonin and Anbu, seeing as they knew the difference between a scroll and a kunai. Yes I am Chimay. The minted-haired girl said with a cheerful smile. The narrowed eyes that were returned made her drop the expression. She changed her face to neutral and nodded her head. Yes, I am ready to leave this hellhole of a village. The Jinchuriki spoke. I can help you escape Fu. Just use my wings. I will channel chakra so that you can fly out. Just ask for a solo mission first. Chimay told her. Fu nodded her head and left the mindscape with a final bye. Real world, when Fu opened her bright orange eyes, she got up and left through the waterfall. After she left, a bug came at her with a message on it. She let the beetle on her fingers and took the message. It was a summoning for her to be at the council meeting. Her eyes narrowed at the paper, knowing that something bad was gonna happen. The council, besides Shibuki, hated her. They made sure to stay away from her as much as possible. Knowing that she had to go anyway, she shunshined to the cage tower at the center of the village. After getting through the anbu, she entered the council room. There was a large oval table. On the top, there was the village head, Shibuki. Surrounding him on the left were 20 civilians. On the other side, there were 18 jonins. Each part counted for power. Shibuki has one point, the one, and the civilians one. Looking at the back, she saw someone who caused her fear. Kakuzu, a missing ninja from her own village. The other man she didn't know, but she suspected was a bit weaker or stronger than. Gu turned to the council and put up a cheerful facade. What can I do for the honorable council today? She questioned. One of the civilians sneered at her and said demon bitch, you are going with Kakuzu-sama. Looking at Kakuzu with fear. Once he said this, Fu's eyes widened in unhidden fear, much to the glee of the civilians as well as some of the jonin. Fu quickly sunshined outside the village and grew her wings. Inwardly asking her friend to channel chakra to them, she flew off as fast as she could. She flew through some hand signs and spoke Mizubunshin no Jutsu. Five clones appeared next to her and all flew in different ways. As she was flying, she spread out her senses to see if the two people were chasing her. She sensed two chakra signatures right behind her and two larger chakra signatures to her northern left, five minutes away. Just as she was about to head to them, hoping for help, she felt a thread wrap around her legs. Fu struggled against it, but Kakuzu was stronger and she was pulled towards him. Trying to buy some time, she went through the required hand signs and shouted out, hidden. Rinping Gakyur no the powder exploded, creating bright light that blinded the two Akatsuki members and leaving Fu to escape. The Jinchuriki jumped towards the tree and flew off towards the chakra signatures. 
She was once again caught after three minutes when the man named Hayden threw his triple-bladed side that wrapped around her. She tried to escape, but her efforts were futile. The two partners carried the little girl to their nearest base. As they were moving, Fu kept struggling against the side. Finally breaking out, she fought them using her tenant's chakra. It didn't cover her in a red cloak since she had control over it. She went through the side then flew in front of them. Deciding that running was incompetent, she decided to fight them until the chakra signatures came. Jamei had informed her that one was a Jinchuriki, and she hoped that he or she could help her. MMJMRM the genin spoke as she blew towards the missing min. From her mouth came a huge web that flew straight at them. It covered them, but Hayden used his scythe to cut through it. The webs being enhanced with Biju chakra, the scythe didn't work and was rebelled. The webs that touched the two members started to drain their chakra. While they were being drained, Kakuzu unleashed three of his masks and let loose three. A strange mask that had a four-legged body with thin wings let out Fktong. To Tapa, the mask with a demonic beaked bipedal used Suotin. Taki no, the mask of a deformed bipedal used Raiden. Jiang, the collaboration tore through the net and went straight towards Fu. Futen. Cho Adama Karasengan a huge spinning ball of fire came out of nowhere and struck the other jutsu. Naruto and Satsuki. Naruto and Satsuki narrowed their eyes at the giant combo. Knowing that she wouldn't be able to stop it since she gave out spikes of fear, the two best friends put their hands together. Naruto created a futon. Rasengan and made it grow bigger and bigger until it was the same size as the other. Satsuki blew a small continuous stream of fire that surrounded the Rasengan. It collided with the wind and created a giant spinning Rasengan that was covered in fire. They both held it with their hands and collided with the dangerous water vortex of lightning. Futon. Cho Dama Karasengan. The vortex of water and ball of fire collided and created a bunch of steam with the lightning being decapitated. Naruto kicked the uncovered Cho Dama Rasengan towards Kakuzu and Hayden. The five-hearted man and Jashinus dodged the attack and looked at the two arrivals. Hayden looked at his partner and told him I'll fight the fucking blonde, you take that black-haired bitch. Tsutsuki told Naruto take the gray hair, I'll take the other one. Kakuzu vs Tsutsuki. Tsutsuki and Kakuzu charged forward toward each other, both shooting their right fists forward. The two fists slammed into each other, but neither shinobi gave an inch. Tsutsuki then quickly threw a left hook, Kakuzu just moved his head, effectively dodging it. The two then jumped back several feet, Kakuzu could feel how strong Satsuki's chakra was, at least he sensed how strong the amount he put out was. Kakuzu, knowing that this wouldn't end well if he went easy, quickly tore off his Akatsuki coat, revealing his purple shirt and grey pants underneath. I'll finish this quickly, so I can hurry up and get the Jinchuriki and be able to get bounties. Before Satsuki could even respond, Kakuzu jumped several feet into the air, ripped the mask off his face, revealing his long black hair and stitched up mouth, he then performed a couple hand signs, lightning style. False darkness. Kakuzu's mouth opened, the stitches tearing out and a bolt of lightning shot out of it, it came rushing down at Satsuki at an incredible speed. Satsuki didn't have enough time to dodge, so she had to counter, she quickly formed Rikiri with her right hand, lifted it, and quickly shot it forward. She cut right through the lightning bolt, but she could feel the pain of being hit with it the whole way. Satsuki's lightning blade quickly faded, and she grabbed her arm in pain. It felt as if she had cut through several trees with his bare hand, only without any chakra to help him. While Satsuki held her arm in pain, Kakuzu quickly formed a couple more hand signs, wind style. Pressure damage. Kakuzu's stitched up mouth once again ripped open, and he fired a ball of air from his mouth, but he wasn't done just yet. He quickly formed several more hand signs, fire style searing migraine. Before his stitches could reattach themselves, he shot out a ball of fire from his mouth, his stitches then sewed up his mouth once again. The fireball flew down towards Satsuki at an incredible speed until it slammed into the ball of air and fused together with it. The wind ball became twice as big as did the fireball inside it and it was heading straight at the pain-stricken Satsuki. Satsuki looked up at it, there wasn't too much of a success rate for dodging that, plus she didn't want this guy to set the whole forest on fire. So she quickly formed a Rasengan, raised his left arm and shot it forward, slamming the Rasengan into the double. Satsuki and Naruto had learned a few things from each other. Rasengan and Chidori were one of them. The Rasengan and the two clashed for several seconds until the fire and wind dissolved into nothing. Satsuki took this as her chance, she quickly formed a second Rasengan in his right hand and jumped up at Kakuzu. Unfortunately for Kakuzu, he was caught off guard and Satsuki hit him with a double Rasengan extremely quickly. Double Rasengan. Tsutsuki grinded the two Rasengans into Kakuzu's chest until she tore two separate holes through his chest, the Rasengan then exploded. This sent Kakuzu flying 20 feet away, he busted through several trees, and when he hit the ground, he examined his body, Tsutsuki had taken out two of his five hearts already. The holes in Kakuzu's chest quickly reformed, the threads of his body weaving together. Tsutsuki watched as this happened, she couldn't help but think, what the fuck. His body is made of threads. 
Bakuzu got to his feet, looked at Satsuki and spoke, you are heavily skilled, you destroyed two of my five hearts quite quickly. And now, as recompense, I'll be taking your heart for my own. Satsuki took a step back, her thoughts were all on the enemy of his, this isn't good, this isn't good at all. I need to end this quickly, or I'll be biting the dust soon. Satsuki quickly dashed towards Kakuzu, her fire-covered fists at the ready. Satsuki got up close to Kakuzu too fast, he wasn't able to dodge. Satsuki hit him with a right hook, then a left jab, then she slammed her knee into Kakuzu's stomach. Kakuzu then hunched over, quickly brought down her right arm and shot it up, slamming her first heart into Kakuzu's jaw, giving him a powerful uppercut. Kakuzu was knocked several feet into the air, but he quickly recompassed himself and landed on the ground. Satsuki then charged towards him once again, as Satsuki got closer, Kakuzu formed a few hand signs, earth style. Iron skin. Satsuki threw a right hook at Kakuzu, and it connected with his face, but Kakuzu acted as if he barely felt it. Satsuki looked up at him and noticed his skin had turned red, shit. Kakuzu then threw a heavy right haymaker at Satsuki, it connected dead on with her face. This punch sent Satsuki flying for several feet, she quickly recompassed himself and landed behind a group of trees. Wiping the blood that was trickling from out her bottom lip and down onto his chin, onto his sleeve. She then quickly and silently performed the shadow clone, creating two more of herself. Two of the three Satsukis began silently making their way around, hoping to get behind Kakuzu. Well the third Satsuki came out from behind the trees and charged towards Kakuzu. Kakuzu didn't know what his opponent had done and he didn't care, he was too pissed off to locate any kind of deception or care for it. Kakuzu was extremely angry, so he was going to finish this now, he began forming a dozen or so hand signs. At the same time, one of the three Satsukis was hiding behind a nearby tree, gathering her chakra. Once she had gathered enough, the team formed a dozen or so hand signs, put both of her hands into a claw shape, crouched down and put them near the ground. Chakra began to appear around her hands, the chakra became more and more violent looking, it began to spin around Satsuki's hands, until finally it turned into lightning. Tino Shai. Satsuki quickly formed two lightning blades, stood up and charged forward toward Kakuzu. Kakuzu noticed the second Satsuki appear from behind a tree and was about to finish his hand signs and perform his most powerful, but before he could, the third Satsuki appeared behind him and stuck him in a full Nelson. Kakuzu tried to fight her off and it was beginning to work, but Satsuki was only seven feet away from him. Charging forward towards him with two lightning blades. Shit. Earth style is the last kind you want to use to defend against lightning style. Before Kakuzu could dispel her, Satsuki got close to him, and thanks to the lightning blades, she was able to slam both of her hands through Kakuzu's chest once again, they went straight through him and destroyed Satsuki's own shadow clone in the process. Satsuki had destroyed two more of Kakuzu's hearts, Kakuzu's iron skin faded, he slammed down onto his knees and passed out. Satsuki pulled her hands out of Kakuzu and stood up straight. Then, Kakuzu caught Satsuki off guard by jumping up at her. He was supposed to be unconscious, but Satsuki reacted quickly by slamming her fist into Kakuzu's face, knocking him back down onto the ground. Satsuki knew that she had to finish this now, if she didn't he might become overwhelmed. She quickly formed an abnormally sized Rasengan in his right hand and slammed it down into Kakuzu's chest, it fluctuated for several seconds before it exploded. Once the light from the explosion faded, Satsuki was standing over Kakuzu's limp non-moving body. She had destroyed Kakuzu's final heart, Satsuki began to pant, she had used a large amount of chakra in a short amount of time, that was never a good thing. She walked towards Fu, knowing that she was a Jinchuriki. When she got there she said hello. And sat down. Fu went through a few hand signs and covered Satsuki in her nets. Satsuki was too tired to dodge, so she got trapped. The webs healed her, much to her astonishment, and she smiled and thanked Fu. Naruto vs Haiden. Haiden began to walk towards the Jinchuriki. Haiden's walk quickly turned into a run. Haiden began to shriek as he came close to Naruto Ah. Haiden jumped into the air and came down on Naruto with his side, Naruto quickly rolled to his right, avoiding Haiden's side. Haiden quickly swung his side to his left, towards Naruto. Naruto jumped back, dodging the triple-bladed side once again. Haiden quickly turned towards Naruto and charged towards him again, and when he got close to him, he unleashed a barrage of swings with his side. Take this. Haya. Ha. Rgh. Naruto just dodged the slashes one by one, he would move to the left, move to the right, duck down, jump up, anything to avoid being caught by one of those blades. Haiden was getting frustrated at this, just stand still and die. Haiden then brought the scythe over his head and slammed it down extremely fast, Naruto had rolled to the side, hoping to avoid being cut with it, and fortunately it only cut through his pant leg, it hadn't hit his skin. Naruto, wanting to end the battle before he actually got nipped by the scythe, quickly threw a right haymaker at Haiden, Haiden was unable to dodge it and was hit with it full force. 
This sent him flying several feet away, but he quickly regained his composure and landed on his feet. Naruto wasn't done, and neither was Hayden. Hayden charged forward towards Naruto once again, while Naruto put his hands together and performed the shadow clone. Naruto created six more of himself, so there were seven Narutos in all. As Hayden drew closer, the Narutos began charging at him as well. When Hayden got in the range he needed to use his scythe, he quickly spun around, slamming his scythe into three shadow clones, causing them to disappear in a puff of smoke. All three of the four remaining Narutos jumped upon Hayden, slamming him down onto the ground and pinning him there. As Hayden struggled to break free from Naruto's grip, he began to curse, what the hell are you little brat? Get the fuck off of me. Fucking get off me. The last Naruto held out his right hand, his palm open, and without the help of another Naruto, he formed a Rasengan. He quickly jumped several feet into the air and came plummeting down at Hayden. As the last Naruto got closer with his technique, Hayden just spoke two words, well fuck. Naruto was only three inches above Hayden, so he shot his right arm forward, slamming his Rasengan through his shadow clones and into Hayden. Naruto had slammed it into his gut, the Rasengan fluctuated for several seconds until it exploded. When the light from the explosion had faded, Naruto was standing over Hayden's body, there was a huge gaping hole in his torso. But there was no blood, no organs, or anything to be seen. This wasn't good, Naruto knew that he needed to kill Hayden quickly, so he got serious. Naruto created a futon. Rasen shuriken and threw it at the downed immortal. Hayden wouldn't be able to recover if his cells were destroyed, now can he? The wind shuriken hit Hayden and exploded, sending millions upon millions of tiny wind blades that destroyed the cells of the Jashinist. I could make it longer, but I have other things to write. After killing the Akatsuki member, Naruto went to see Fu and saw that both the girls were talking to each other. Fu and Satsuki saw the blonde come to them and looked over at him. When he finally got there, the Kaiubi Jinchuriki asked her did Satsuki fill you in. Fu nodded her head yes and said she did, you want to create your own village named Yuzumaki and you want people like Jinchuriki to come there yeah. Well she was explaining you came here, so any other goals? She asked her fellow Jinchuriki. He nodded and told her that their other goal was to destroy Konoha. Fu had no problems and said I will join you guys, after all Jinchuriki have to stick together right? She asked with a wink. Tell them your reason. They are trustworthy. A deep voice echoed in her mind. She sighed and continued. I also want to make many friends who will accept me. Who knows? Maybe I can be happy. The ex taki ninja said. Alright Fu, Naruto will take you to Yuzushi Agakur and leave you there for a few days. There should be three other people there that will be friends with you, even if they know that you are a Bijuu container. Just be sure to train. Naruto and I have made a basic schedule, but you should implement it to your style. You should do more, but we don't have your skill set or your ability sheet, so you should make it on your own. We will be back in a few days, we have to go do some things. If you have any questions, Karen should be able to fill you in. Satsuki told her new ally. Fu only nodded, not believing that she would be free and actually would be liked. Naruto grabbed onto Fu's shoulder and teleported to Yuzu. After dropping her off, he teleported back to Satsuki, who he had secretly marked. The two crushes then started to travel to Tenchi Bridge. Tenchi Bridge, Team Kakashi had just arrived at Tenchi Bridge. Once they got there, Sai used his super beast imitating drawing technique to create small mice that scout out the Tenchi Bridge. After discovering that there are no traps or individuals on the bridge, thus ruling out the possibility of an Akatsuki ambush, Kakashi uses a henge to look like Haruko. Before doing so, he tells Sai, the replacement for Sasuke are Satsuki Uchiha, Yamato, replacement for Naruto Uzumaki, and Sakura to be on standby in case something went wrong. Sai has short straight black hair and dark eyes which contrast with his translucent looking pale skin. He carries a small backpack with his brush, scrolls, and ninja ink in it. He wears a short black and grey jacket with red straps as customary of all root members. He also carries a tipless tent on his back. The rest of his outfit consisted of a high-collared midriff shirt, black pants, shinobi sandals and gloves with his index and thumb fingers exposed, most likely to facilitate the use of his drawing-based techniques. His jacket has a long right and short left sleeves. Yamato has short brown hair and black almond-shaped eyes. He has a changed variation of the standard attire of a Konoha nin with a flak jacket. The differences between his attire and that of the standard one is that he does not have the Izushi Agaka crest on the shoulders of the sleeves, and the neck of his navy blue shirt is form-fitting and goes up to his chin. He also still retains two hip pouches strapped to his lower back instead of just one. In addition to that, he has a Hapuri-style forehead protector that frames his face, similar to that of Taburama Senju. When Naruto and Satsuki arrived at the bridge in Kusa, Naruto transformed into Kabuto and put on a blue cloak and went towards the bridge. Sasori also came onto the bridge and stood in front of a covered Kabuto. It's been a long time, Sasori-sama. Naruto said to keep in disguise. He already knew that it was Kakashi. 
The disguised genin slowly lifted up the hood, and much to Kakashi's surprise, he saw Kabuto. He's. Kabuto. The disguised man thought as he flashed back to when he had seen him jumping out the window. It's been two years, hasn't it? He questioned, not knowing when they had last met. In the bushes, Sakura's eyes widened in shock as she saw Kabuto, someone who had helped them. It also made her excited since if it was Kabuto, he should know where her precious Asuke-kun and Naruto Baka are. Were you followed? Asked Kakashi in his deep voice. Kabuto faked looking around and looked at Satsuki, signaling to her that she should prepare. He looked back at Sasori and said we're okay. How are you doing? He asked, I still have the strange sensation from when I remembered who I was after Yujutsu broke. He shook his head in an act and continued. I feel heavy-headed. I've got a couple questions for you. Stated Kakashi, I don't have much time, so please keep it short. I risked my life trying to get away from Orochimaru without him finding out. He replied back. Sasori looked up and said I want information about his hideouts and Sasuke and Naruto. Naruto looked at him and, with info from Orochimaru, said, we have multiple hideouts. We move each week to not get discovered. We have hideouts all over the elemental nations. The Kanohinin asked where is it now? The current one is on a small island in a lake up north. Kabuto replied, by the way. He paused and looked back and saw. Nothing. This was the signal to come forward slowly. He continued about what you asked me to do. There was nothing else to see as he saw a bit of surprise. Uh oh, I still had a few things to ask him, but I can't let this go on much longer, or I'll be discovered. There isn't much of a choice, I have to capture him now. He pulled out a kunai knife. The hidden Kanohanin saw this and said that's. Naruto knew that Satsuki was about to get there and jumped out of his hood then landed right next to Sasori. In his spot was a disguised Satsuki as Arachimaru. If you hadn't pulled out a kunai knife, I wouldn't have noticed. Naruto spoke. Chapter 8. Failed Retrieval. The Buto looked at him and, with info from Arachimaru, said, we have multiple hideouts. We move each week to not get discovered. We have hideouts all over the elemental nations. The Kanohinin asked where is it now. The current one is on a small island in a lake up north. Kabuto replied, by the way. He paused and looked back and saw. Nothing. This was the signal to come forward slowly. He continued about what you asked me to do. There was nothing else to see as he saw a bit of surprise. Uh oh, I still had a few things to ask him, but I can't let this go on much longer, or I'll be discovered. There isn't much of a choice, I have to capture him now. He pulled out a kunai knife, the hidden Kanohanin saw this and said that's. Naruto knew that Satsuki was about to get there and jumped out of his hood then landed right next to Sasori. In his spot was a disguised Satsuki as Arachimaru. If you hadn't pulled out a kunai knife, I wouldn't have noticed. Kabuto spoke. Arachimaru created a few shadow clones with a bunch of smoke. After doing that, Naruto used his created technique Henkin Suichu, Transformation Switch, a technique that transformed and switched you with someone. In this case, Satsuki covered the bridge in smoke. After that, they switched places and transformed into who they wanted to be at the same time. This could also make your enemy transform, even if they didn't want to. Thanks to that amazing coincidence, he didn't know what I was about to do. He hasn't seen through my disguise yet, but now that Orochimaru is here. What should I do? Kabuto and I can't take him alone. The copycat ninja thought. You followed Kabuto? Kakashi asked. Of course, you don't think that I would let my right hand lead without knowing. Orochimaru asked. Should I retreat or call out the others? It's one or the other. The Sharingan wielding Jonin thought. The Budo suddenly covered his hands in chakra, held it up, and sliced at Kakashi. Kakashi jumped back quickly, his transformation released. How did he know it was a disguise? Narrowing his eyes he didn't, that was something else. What the hell is going on? He questioned. Orochimaru pulled his hands back and threw it forward Sine to Jashu multiple snakes came from his sleeves and wrapped around Kakashi, who substituted with a log. He landed on the ground and grinded his teeth. What's going on here? Kabuto, you were supposed to be an Akatsuki spy. You were supposed to be trapped in Sasori's technique. He said. Orochimaru dispelled that technique a long time ago. Kabuto replied with a smirk. So you switched sides, but pretended to be under Sasori's control. The masked man exclaimed, then, he narrowed his eyes. Is Orochimaru controlling you now? No, not at all. He replied. Orochimaru interrupted them by telling Kakashi now then, why don't you call out the three little mice hiding behind you? He saw through all of it. Kakashi raised two of his fingers and moved it a bit forward, signaling Sai, Sakura, and Yamato to come out from hiding. The three saw his signal and nodded, blurring to the bridge and landing in a crouch. Both Naruto and Satsuki look at the two new members so these are our replacements. Pathetic. Both thoughts. On the outside, they were looking at Kakashi Haddock and Sakura Waruno amusedly. Have you gotten stronger Sakura? As strong as Sasuke-kun and Naruto-kun? He asked in Orochimaru's creepy-as-hell voice. Sakura's face settles into a snarl and lunges at Orochimaru. 
she couldn't believe that this bastard was talking like he owned her precious Asuke Khan and Naruto. Kakashi saw her intention and held her back, knowing that the short-tempered girl would destroy the bridge. Kakashi tried to assess the situation. The whole team would not be strong enough to beat Orochimaru. Kabuto was on par with himself. He inwardly released a sigh, knowing that Orochimaru wouldn't let them escape. He, however, didn't expect Kabuto to suddenly say, we won't kill you. For now Kanoha isn't our enemy, Akatsuki is. You also want to destroy Akatsuki. We let you go for now. After saying this, both Orochimaru and Kabuto turned around and started to walk away, leaving a frozen team behind them. Well, except for Sai, who quickly and discreetly created an ink clone. The real one followed Orochimaru and Kabuto without the others seeing, while the clone stayed with the team. At least, that's what he thought. Kakashi saw Sai creating a clone and narrowed his eyes. Sanadi sama had told him that Sai was a root, so he was probably trying to get Satsuki and Naruto to Danzo so they could become weapons. Kakashi knew that Sasuke was, in reality, Satsuki. He and Naruto had found out during the wave mission. Sakura had been unconscious so she didn't know. When Satsuki had woken, she told them not to tell anyone. Kakashi wasn't able to deny the girl who didn't want to be, as she said, a baby breeding factory. Naruto also agreed. Kakashi created a cage bunshin under the bridge, following Sai. But Sai, Orochimaru, and Kabuto. Sai had followed Orochimaru and Kabuto into a forest. After getting a bit away from the rest of the Kanoha team, both shinobi paused in their steps. Get out from hiding. Orochimaru spoke. Sai left the place he was hiding in and jumped down. He, however, didn't expect a sword going through his chest. The rude Anbu froze there and looked at Orochimaru. Two seconds later, he faded until there was only black ink left. The real Sai came from the ground and told him I work for Danzo-sama. I am not your enemy. With a bullshit smile there is something I need to discuss with you. Naruto tried to remember this Danzo until five seconds later he remembered. Danzo, that senile old relic, he's still breathing, is he? So what do you want to discuss? He asked the black-haired ninja. Still having his bullshit smile, he said I have a message from Danzo-sama for you, Orochimaru-sama. Well, let's hear it. Orochimaru demands. Ever since your plan to destroy Kanoha failed, Danzo-sama has been longing to be in contact with you. Sai tells him with an emotionless face. On the sidelines, Kakashi was still watching Sai. He widened his eyes as he realized Tsunade Sama was right. He created a shadow clone with barely any chakra and dispelled it, sending knowledge back to Kakashi. At Tenchi Bridge, Kakashi got the information from the clone and quickly stabbed the clone in front of him. Sai turned pale then into black ink. He told them of what he learned from his clone and had them go towards where his clone was. Back with Sai. That is all Danzo Sama told me to say. He spoke emotionlessly. Keeping up his acting, Orochimaru replies I admit, that is interesting. He pauses for a bit. So how much of what you told me should I believe? He asked the replacement. Sai reached for his back and pulled out a scroll. The Budo jumped from behind him and tackled his replacement to the ground. What's the big idea? She demanded. Now, that boy is about to join our ranks from today on. Orochimaru lied. And we trust him. Kabuto played along. Sai interrupted them by requesting them to please look at that letter. It's from Danzo Sama to you. Gesturing towards the envelope that he had dropped when Kabuto tackled him. Orochimaru frowned and grabbed the envelope. Opening it he read Orochimaru, from now onwards, this boy will be working under you. So this Danzo wants me and Satsuki-chan. If Orochimaru's memories are correct, Danzo wants a weapon or to kill us. Let's take him. I need to deliver a message to Kakashi so we can infiltrate Kanoha with no problem later. Orochimaru figured it out instantly. Kabuto, let him go. We're bringing him with us. Orochimaru stated. Kabuto looked at him confused but complied nonetheless. Are you ready to go, Sai, or whatever you're called? He asked with a smirk on his face. The team nodded and moved away, clone Kakashi following them, using the seal he planted on him at the hot springs. The clone created a minor cage bunch and dispelled it, sending info back to the real one, who informed the others. The rest of Team 7 quickly catch up to Kakashi's clone, which disrupts and continue following Orochimaru. We are Kabuto began before being interrupted by Orochimaru. I know. We're being followed. Are we simply being followed? Or is this a trap? He questioned out loud. What should we do? Kabuto questioned Orochimaru, one of his hands shifting towards his holster, alarming Sai who got on guard. One way or the other, we're gonna need a corpse. Orochimaru said. He be bunch and no jutsu. He spoke quietly as he created a fake corpse of Sai. They continued traveling forth towards the base, knowing that Kakashi would deduce that it was a fake, but they needed to make sure Sai wasn't suspicious. At Orochimaru's previous hideout, Orochimaru, Sai, and Kabuto finally arrive at the hideout. When they reached the bottom, Kabuto quickly attacked Sai and knocked him out. He then took him to a room and tied him up, leaving a bingo book there. 
After doing that, he left the room and released the transformation, revealing the beautiful Ravenette. She then went to find her crush, finding him in another room inside the orange hideout. What's the plan for Naruto-kun? She questioned the blonde, the plan is. Naruto replies to her as he tells her the plan. Team 7 arrived at the hideout and went inside. Kakashi used the seal he had on site to find the room he was in. After finding it, Yamato uses his wood release. Hand tool manipulation to create a key from his fingers and opens the door. Thought we'd find you here. Yamato states as he looks at Sai using his bullshit smile. Nothing less from the Hokage's personal Anbu's and apprentice. I see the corpse did not fool you one bit. He said with a smile still on. Kakashi narrowed his visible eye and asked what do you mean by that? He was struggling not to kill the brat, but he had to follow Tsunade-sama's orders. Kakashi, if Sai is a threat to either Naruto-kun or Sasuke, kill him. He isn't as important as them. She had told the jonin. When he did not answer, Sakura, in an act of brashness, grabbed him and lifted him up. Why the hell did you turn on us, traitor? She growled at the bastard who was keeping her away from Sasuke-kun. Still having that smile on his face, you know, the bullshit smile, he replied, you really shouldn't be so noisy, or things will become even more difficult. Sakura let him go, but still questioned Danzo's orders, right? He is planning something involving Orochimaru, isn't he? And you were chosen to be their liaison. What are they up to? She asked the last bit with a snarl. Yamato interrupted her with a speculation of his own. He wants to team up with Orochimaru to try and new crush the leaf plan, doesn't he? No, he wants to bring Naruto's son and Sasuke sent back to the village for its benefit. He lied with practiced ease. Unfortunately for him, Kakashi saw through his lie and told him so, knowing that Danzo would do something much colder and harsher than that. Now that you've discovered me here, my mission is a failure. I can't finish you all by myself. Since you've figured this out, there's no point in trying to hide the truth. Giving them a startling stare, he continued, it's just as you've said, we're trying to destroy the current Kanoha. What? Sakura growled, I was taken in by Orochimaru with the understanding that I would help him conspire against Kanoha. That was the true mission assigned to me. I'm also working as a spy, sending information about Orochimaru back to Danzo-sama. Bakashi pulled a kunai at his throat and told him to keep talking and don't leave anything out. So you're supposed to be in an alliance with Orochimaru while spying on him behind his back. Sakura summarized, no da I d ten t, that's what he said. Seeing the pale boy nod she continued what she was saying. That's so dangerous. The moment Kanoha is destroyed, Orochimaru will inevitably betray us. It's a preventive way to keep us in the upper hand. He told them. I see, Danzo wants Kanoha to be his, and he's making it happen alone. Kakashi voiced his thoughts. Sai continues the information I write on my scrolls turn into small animals like mice and birds. That's how I can leak information without compromising my position. That's why I was chosen for that mission. He told them. If Kanoha is thrown into chaos, lots of innocent people will die. Sakura screeches out, thinking about all the deaths that were caused by the Otosuna invasion from three and a half years ago. If you don't like it, why are you a trained assassin, a person who kills innocents? Sai, Tiyamato and I know you're from Root Anbu. We also know that Danzo had you undergo special training to help you kill your emotions. Kakashi told him. Sakura looked at him confused, special training. Kakashi nodded and continued in order to seal away all emotions, you underwent the vile training the hidden village of the Bloody Mist once used. The hidden village of the bloody mist. Wasn't that Zabuza's? Asked the band Sakura once again, thinking back to what Kakashi and Zabuza had told them back then. A long time ago, the hidden mist village was called the bloody mist village, and you had to overcome a final ultimate trial in order to become a ninja. A battle to the death among the students. After tying Sai up with wood and about to create a moku bunshin, they were about to leave when he interrupted them. You should give up. Talking mostly to Kakashi and Sakura. I met Sasuke-kun. He told them, thinking back to when Orochimaru had led him to a room and locked him there with Sasuke next to him. His statement completely shocked the original Team 7 members. Sai continued on Orochimaru as always with Sasuke-kun, and probably with Naruto-kun as well. They realized the implications of that. To get to the two, they would have to fight Orochimaru. They weren't strong enough to do that. Well that doesn't matter. I love Sasuke-kun and Naruto is my teammate and friend. We'll rescue them for sure. We are all teammates, Team 7, our bond. Sakura exclaimed while her inner cha. Once we rescue them, Sasuke will end up marrying us, and we'll be Mrs. Ichi. I just died a little writing that. I also threw up. Sai looked at the girl's determination and sighed thinking about what the pink bi girl said a bond. What about Orochimaru? He asked her. I don't care about him, our bond will destroy him. She told him idealistically, not realistically. Kakashi sighed at the foolishness of the notion. A bond might give you determination that would help you train to be strong, but the bond itself will never have enough physical will to hurt anyway, let alone Orochimaru. 
Ah well, let her live her childhood. Ignorance is bliss, whoever said those words probably meant Sakura. Naruto was, while acting like a baka, he was pretty serious. Satsuki was the same, seeing your entire family massacred by your brother 259,200 times would do that to you, Satsuki accepted the truth, but had to deal with the emotions for two years before leaving it. Sakura was the only naive one on this team. Just as Yamato was about to create a moku bunshin when a bunch of kunai sailed to them from the door. They looked up and saw Kabuto as the culprit. The three dodged the kunai by jumping to the side. Kabuto jumped in front of Sai as though he was protecting him. Kakashi looks at the man and narrows his eyes. He quickly created two cage bunshin on top of the Odonin. The Budo sensed the clones and dodged to the side, thrusting kunai through each of their throats. He needed to stay for 20 more seconds to let Naruto complete the plan and then be captured. They're rather persistent. Sakura tells him. Like you aren't the same when chasing my male counterpart bitch. Satsuki thought. Sai, I see you've been taken prisoner. Kabuto told Sai in amusement. 10 seconds. Binding trees. Multiple wooden things came from the floor of the room and tried to bind Kabuto. He dodged that, only to have to dodge Sakura's punch. He quickly unbid Sai, knowing he was going to betray them. When Kakashi was about to attack, he was surprised when Sai quickly disabled Kabuto and put him on the wall. After tying him up using wood ropes, they demanded from him the location of Orochimaru, Sasuke, and Naruto. Kabuto obliged and told them the riddle that was supposed to be told to them by now, he's probably finished with his training and has gone back to his room in the inner area. They were surprised by how fast he obliged as well as the info. They turned to Sai when he started to speak it's true that Sasuke left to train with Orochimaru, I don't think he is lying. However, inner area doesn't tell us much. The Buto looked up and lied to their faces, even I didn't know where the room was. This place has space and rooms carved out everywhere. There are multiple inner chambers. Then we'll just search all of them, Shanaro. Sakura screeched. They all just nodded, knowing that that was all Kabuto was telling. They all left the room to search for their teammate. When they closed the room, Kabuto disrupted the conversation, indicating it was a cage bunshin, sending information back to Satsuki. All four members of Team 7 were running down the hallways of the chamber. Making sure that no one was around, they continued until coming to a split path. Kakashi was not a sensor by any means. This didn't mean that he could not sense chakra. Arachimaru's chakra was on the right side, so he commanded his subordinates to follow him as he went in the direction. Sasuke-kun, I will find you. I love you. Thought the pink bit er, team delusionally. Naruto-kun, Satsuki-chan, I will get you back. You are all the family I have left. A certain copy nin promised. They came across a door while they were running and quickly opened it, only to see a green bed. Knowing this wasn't it, they continued to run forward. They kept coming across multiple doors, but they weren't in any. Sasuke-kun, where are you? Sakura thought as she opened another door. They ran through multiple forks, but Kakashi guided them until they heard a big explosion. Uam, Arachimaru is in a room with Naruto and Satsuki. The Arachimaru is a clone of course. As the Kanoha team got closer, they activated the next part of their plan. Attract the Kanoha team's attention. Naruto nodded at Satsuki, and they both created a clone. Both jumped into the air and exploded, disintegrating the roof. They got on the top part and waited. Uam, once they had heard the sound, they had all headed off towards it. Yamato however held the other two back. Why did you hold us back Tenzo? Kakashi questioned him, using a name from the past. Sakura was confused about Tenzo, but let it pass. Don't call me that, now, the reason for Sai being here, I finally figured it out. He told them seriously. The other two were surprised at this, and he continued. Yamato pulled out a bingo book and said I found this in Sai's backpack earlier. I didn't get a chance to study it until earlier. He came here to assassinate Sasuke and Naruto. He told them. Sakura widened her eyes, but Kakashi seemed calm. I see, I had thought that was the case. Kakashi muttered aloud. Tsunade's apprentice had enough of this and started to run off in the same direction as Sai. She reached a hole with light outside and went through. She rushed right for Sai until she heard a whisper. Sakura. That voice. She thought as she looked towards the place where the sound came from with wide eyes. In the place was her blonde friend. More important was what, or who, was next to him. Sasuke stood right next to him. Her grip on Sai's collar faltered and her hand slowly went down. She turned her whole body to face them. Imado and Kakashi wondered what was surprising her and ran towards her. They got there and saw Naruto and Sasuke as well. Sasuke-kun. She whispers upon seeing him with tears in her eyes. Naruto too. She says as her eyes drift from her crush to the handsome blonde next to him. Upon seeing Kakashi, Naruto and Sasuke give him a small smile and say hello Kakashi-sensei. Using their insult on Kakashi's name. Their eyes drift to the other three there, and Sasuke says so you're here too? He questions. Kakashi steps forward, but suddenly stops as there is a hand on his neck. 
a sword is at his neck. Naruto leans forward and says, I have a message for you Kakashi. I don't trust Sakura to not spill, and I don't know who the other two are. I'll give you the message as we spar. We can't have Orochimaru now. Kakashi knew that his student would never hurt him, since they were like brothers, so he nodded and they started to spar. As Satsuki watched the two fight she could still remember Naruto's plan in her head. Satsuki's flashback, the plan is very simple. When the others arrive, they will find Sai. They will interrogate him and he will try to lie. They will see through it and will have to say the truth. After telling them, they will tie him using Mokuten. They will be leaving the room, but you have to intervene. They will attack you, but you need to buy me 20 seconds since they are already here. After you attack them, free Sai. He will turn traitor and help them capture you. They will interrogate you about our location so be truthful, but cryptic. After that, you should come back without their notice. We will blow a room once they are near. After they arrive where we are, I will deliver a message to Kakashi. I will fight him, though not at full power. The others will fight so you should also fight. Make sure to make them use all they can. We need to know how powerful they are. I will give Kakashi the message and spa. A clone of mine will appear as Orochimaru and we will leave. Naruto told her. Tsutsuki was amazed by how thought out the plan WS. He knew everything that would happen and it went with his plans exactly. Tsutsuki nodded and they got started on their role. Okay Naruto-kun, but I want Sakura to myself. Tsutsuki had called him Naruto-kun ever since she discovered her feelings. She told him with an evil smile that Naruto didn't see. She wanted to hurt that bitch who hit Naruto back in Konoha. Tsutsuki's flashback end. Akashi jumped back and got into a fighting stance. Naruto did the same as his sensei and ran at the other with a hand put in front. They clashed in midair. The others were surprised that they started to fight so they went to help him, but an invisible air blade appeared in front of them and cut through the floor. As the dust settled down, they saw Sasuke to be the one who did it. Don't interfere. He said in a commanding voice. Sai and Yamato didn't want to listen, so they both charged at him. The Ichiha dodged them and kicked them to the side. He then appeared in front of Sakura and punched her in the gut. After the punch, she was hit in the face. Sakura flew through the air until she hit the walls that got spider cracks. Is that the best you can do? Someone so weak has no business even dreaming of standing besides me. Sasuke told Sakura. Sakura groaned at the pain and looked up at what her crush said. This can't be Sasuke-kun right? Orochimaru must be controlling him somehow. I will free him. Sakura thought to herself. Tsutsuki vs Yamato, Sai, and Sakura. From now on Satsuki will be called that unless she is being said in a sentence. Sakura is tortured, not really. Sakura charged at Satsuki with Yamato and Sai coming at her from the left and right. Knowing not to show too much that she learned, she decided to use Kenjutsu, Tejutsu, and Ninjutsu only. Satsuki smirked and grabbed Yamato's longer arm and spun him at Sai. Sakura was just about to hit, but Satsuki ducked under the punch that set her flying. Using Shadow of the Dancing Leaf to get behind her. Grabbing onto her shirt, the Ichiha era spun to kick Sakura's stomach. Sakura blocked it, but was unprepared for the backhand to her flat chest. Using the memento to get higher than the Konoha Shinobi, Satsuki spun and did a heel drop on Sakura's stomach, releasing some chakra to damage her more. As Sakura was dropped to the floor, Yamato once again flew towards Satsuki. Going through the hand seals, he threw his hand out. Out of them came wood that went for Satsuki. She dodged through the trees and unsheathed her sword just in time to block the tanto slashed at her by Sai. Luring behind Sai, Satsuki kicks his back. She waits for them to recover while taunting them. Is this the best two Anbus and the Hokage's apprentice can do? Pathetic. She smirked at the cry of rage from Sakura and backflipped away from her position, only to see the ground cracking. So, the bitch isn't as useless as before. Thinking back to all their missions. Inoichi jumped back as Sakura started to punch at her again and again, knowing not to be hit by that. A Tomo lion jumped at her from behind and tried to bite her, but bit into Sakura who Satsuki had substituted with. Sakura was let go and held her bleeding shoulder. I have to get serious. Hokage-sama said to get them back unharmed, but we don't have a choice. Yamato thought to himself as he observed the other two try to fight Satsuki. Yamato sunshine behind Satsuki and punches her, sending her through the air. Satsuki looked down, only to see the wood user coming at her. Cursing herself for upping the resistance seal yesterday, she created a cage bunch and that threw her downwards. Gathering lightning in her hand, the Achiha heiress thrusts it down, sending multiple made of lightning. After Sakura had healed the bite, she had created a bunch and, thinking that it would fool Satsuki. Satsuki saw through it and decided to humiliate the bitch. Punching the bunch and, it popped out and a fist came to the back of her head. It hit head on and went through the head, sending crimson liquid everywhere. Sakura looked at the blood in fear. Screaming to the sky, she fainted upon seeing her hand covered in her crushed blood. Imado and Sai looked at Sakura in concern and looked at Satsuki, who was standing behind Sakura, who shrugged. 
all she did was cast the Majin. Narukumi no Jutsu, staring at her eyes was a mistake that they had made. The two suddenly fainted two seconds later. Satsuki smirked and shook her head at their weakness to Jinjutsu, they didn't even know it was one. Slowly, her eyes traveled to the down Sakura, and an evil grin appeared on her face. The heiress dispelled the Jinjutsu, letting Sakura wake. The pink-haired shinobi looked at Satsuki and kicked her away. Satsuki suddenly smirks at Kinoichi and the Sharingan swirls, hypnotizing her. Sakura looked around and saw Sasuke-kun and Naruto coming right at her. Suddenly, Sasuke is covered in a poof of smoke, revealing a beautiful woman. Sasuke-kun, why are you using that perverted Naruto maid? She screeched. Satsuki and Naruto look at her and wait and ignore her. She turns back to Naruto and wraps her hands around his neck. Both start to lean towards each other, and their lips meet. Sakura watched in horror as she saw Naruto kissing her crush, Nuuo. She screams to the world, fainting. When their lips met, they both felt as though they were in heaven. They continued to hold each other tighter, as their tongues started to battle against one another for dominance. Chapter 9. Training Team Yuzu. Sakura looked around and saw Sasuke-kun and Naruto coming right at her. Suddenly, Sasuke is covered in a poof of smoke, revealing a beautiful woman. Sasuke-kun, why are you using that perverted Naruto maid? She screeched. Satsuki and Naruto look at her and wait and ignore her. She turns back to Naruto and wraps her hands around his neck. Both start to lean towards each other, and their lips meet. Sakura watched in horror as she saw Naruto kissing her crush, Nuuo. She screams to the world, fainting. When their lips met, they both felt as though they were in heaven. They continued to hold each other tighter, as their tongues started to battle against one another for dominance in the Naruto vs Kakashi. Kakashi jumped back and got into a fighting stance. Naruto did the same as his sensei and ran at the other with a hand put in front. They clashed in midair with their arms trying to dominate one another. Me and Satsuki need to stay here so we can kill Orochimaru. Naruto whispered to his teacher. He knew he could speak about Satsuki with his sensei since he already knew. So you are going to use this opportunity to kill Orochimaru? Kakashi asked him. He jumped back from his student and opened his Sharingan eye. Yes, this is the best opportunity and we can also get information about Akatsuki. Naruto told him. Alright, is that all you need to tell me? The silver-haired man asked. Yeah, but don't tell anyone, it might be leaked to Orochimaru okay? He asked his teacher who nodded. That sounded reasonable and right. Since they were done talking, they started a spar to not alert Orochimaru. Naruto ran forward to punch Kakashi in the face, but the man ducked right under it and kicked Naruto upward. The silver-haired ninja went through a few hand signs and yelled out to Katen. Nkakak no jutsu. Naruto created a cage bunch and that threw him higher than the flames could reach. The clone dispersed while the original created a Rasengan. He created another clone that threw him towards Kakashi. Kakashi backflipped out of there, but he didn't expect a week back. He looked behind him to see a grinning Naruto. He looked up and saw Naruto disperse. Lesson 1 to Jutsu. Kakashi told Naruto. No book this time? He asked his teacher. Kakashi shook his head and ran towards Naruto. Naruto grabbed a kunai and threw it at Kakashi. Kakashi jumped over the kunai, but it exploded below him, damaging him. Naruto jumped towards Kakashi, who also came towards him. Naruto tried to sidekick him, but Kakashi blocked it. Twisting himself so that he could punch Kakashi in the stomach, Naruto launched his chakra-coated fist in there. The Konoha shinobi let go of his student and staggered backwards. Now, Naruto-kun, Satsuki-chan, it's time to go. A creepy voice said from above. All three looked above them to see Orochimaru. Satsuki sunshine there, but Naruto exploded, leaving Orochimaru and Satsuki free to escape. After the smoke calmed down, Kakashi tried to sense his students, but wasn't able to. He sighed and looked over towards the others. Seeing that they were still in that Jinjutsu, he released Sai and Yamato, but had a clone take Sakura back, remembering that Naruto told him that Satsuki would terrify her. Naruto and Satsuki. After having left the base, Naruto and Satsuki had Horation back to Yuzu. When they had arrived back here, they had intentions to get Fu so she could help them locate one more Jinchuriki. Finally arriving at Fu's location, they saw that she was talking to Karen. Fu looked up to see the two looking at them and instantly started to apologize. Hey, Naruto-san, Satsuki-san, sorry that we aren't training like you asked, but we were a bit tired you see. She ranted fast. Naruto sighed, instantly figuring out that she got it from the villager's treatment. Look Fu, she flinched, thinking they were gonna hurt her or yell at her. It's okay to rest, you don't have to train every minute of every day. Now where are Sajetsu and Jugo? He told her, but questioned at the end. Karen came up to them and, using her sensory abilities, told them, Sajetsu is out in the sea, swimming, and Jugo is next to him, on land. The three walked towards where the other males were, but Fu stayed back. They noticed her and motioned for her to come. After arriving at the area, they saw that Sajetsu was swimming while Jugo was in a meditating position, many animals like seagulls and dolphins around or near him. 
the animals ran off after sensing other people coming while the two teens noticed their teammates coming there. Hey guys, what's up? Sajetsu asked casually, getting out of the water and shifting back to human form. Hello Naruto, Satsuki. Jugo greeted them with a smile. Satsuki stepped up and, with a smirk, told them, we're going to start your training now. They all nodded, and the four new members of Yuzushi Agakur followed the clan Air and Eris. After walking to the other side of Yuzushi Agakur, they arrived at a grassy training ground of Yuzu. Many people didn't know how Fuinjutsu worked, but the Yuzumakas were very creative and tried to do many things with them. When Hashirama had come and they saw his ability Mokuten, they asked to store some of his chakra so they could grow vegetation. They imported many shipments of plants and trees and other similar things and used the chakra to grow them, and they grew fast, becoming lush and ripe and fully grown in a week. They used a multiplier seal so that the chakra was limitless, so they were always good. What are we going to do? Karen asked her cousin an obvious crush. It was pretty easy to read his emotions using her unique sensory abilities. The same was true for Satsuki, which she learned after the spike of jealousy. You four are going to have a 1v1 and show all of your skills so we know what to train you in. The blonde Yuzumaki replied to his aunt's daughter. They nodded while Satsuki paired them up, Fu vs. Sajetsu and Karen vs. Jugo. Remember, show everything you can do. Don't injure or hurt each other. Satsuki told them. They nodded and stepped back as Fu and Sajetsu got ready, Sui vs. Fu, who got in a stance that Jamei had taught her. Her right hand horizontally parallel to her stomach with her left hand next to her face, vertically. The legs were bent at a certain angle, allowing her to do multiple tasks easily. Sajetsu took his sword off his back and got into the stance he was taught by his brother. Fu went towards Sajetsu as fast as she could and swept at his legs. He jumped to avoid this and brought down his decapitating carving knife onto Fu. Knowing that she couldn't dodge the huge blade, Fu took out a kunai and reinforced it with chakra. The loud sound of metal clashing echoed throughout the training ground. Both shinobi tried to gain the upper hand, but at the end, Fu won the struggle and threw the purple-eyed swordsman back. Sajetsu flew back but was able to flip into position. Nice Fu. He complimented the mint-haired teen. Fu blushed at one of the few compliments she received but quickly compassed herself. Sajetsu put his sword back, knowing that the others already knew his capabilities as a swordsman, and went through the hand seals required for Mizubunshin no. Water started to take shape until it formed into a second Sajetsu. Both ran towards Fu and kicked her, but she backflipped away, hitting the clone's chin and sending him upwards. She quickly jumped to the side to avoid the kick sent at her, and then blurred away, appearing high above him. Hockey Whirlwind. She screamed as she flew down towards Sajetsu with her arms stuck out. A whirlwind-like force surrounded her while she came down. Sajetsu jumped away from Fu's target, which was on the ground. When the orange-eyed woman hit the ground, a small crater formed, a foot wide and a half foot deep. When Fu got out of the crater, the Hazuki attacked her. They both threw punches and kicks, both getting damaged. After their little Tajutsu clash, they both backflipped away from each other. They were about to attack each other once again, but Kaiubi interrupted them. Their assessment, alright you two, we've seen enough to know what you both need. He told them. They both nodded and headed towards their comrades' friends. Alright, you both have good tojutsu, but you two are far too slow and weak. We're gonna put a resistance seal on you. Satsuki told them, her Sharingan activated. They both nodded, knowing that they would be criticized. Besides, this would help them better themselves. They then looked towards Naruto, waiting for his own assessment. They were confused when he handed them two papers. They took them and looked at him confused. Naruto, seeing their looks, explained, those are chakra papers. Channel chakra into them so we can find your affinity. You two don't have a high repertoire, so you are going to get. The two nodded and channeled chakra into their hands, the result shocking the two. Sajetsu's paper split into two separate papers, then got wet. Sajetsu was shocked since he never knew that he had an affinity for wind. Well Sajetsu, it seems you have the same affinities as me. I'll teach you some wind techniques. Fu's paper also split up, but instead of weathering, they burned up. Fu, you have fire and wind, a good combination just like Sajetsu's. Both of you can combine to make them stronger. Fu looked up with a grin on her face, knowing how rare it was to have two elements. Next is Yunjutsu. Fu, I know you can't do it since you're A, but what about you Sajetsu? Satsuki asked them, revealing that Fu was A. The others didn't care about that, not having anything against a Bijuu at all. Nah, I need to learn other things that are more useful for me. He said, not undermining Jinjutsu, but thinking it was less important than Ninjutsu. Alright. Now, Karen, Jugo, you two will spar with Suki, and I Naruto told them, seeing as they are fighting each other, it wouldn't work. Satsuki had seen the same and agreed with a nod, which was replicated by the Retids. Jugo went with Naruto so he could use full power, while Karen went with Satsuki. Satsuki vs Karen. Satsuki got into her clan's Tajutsu stance, the interceptor fist. Karen got into the Yuzuken, a style taught to her by her mother. 
Tsutsuki smirked and used her hand to gesture common to Karen. The redeed charged at the teen, punching her at the gut. Tsutsuki nearly got hit since she had gotten to level 40 on her resistance. She got to 13 on first year 25 on second 38 on third, and she increased it bit by bit during the series until 40 now. Same with Naruto. If you're wondering how hard it is to move like this, think of having 4,000 pounds on you and trying to move. One level equals 100 pounds. Now I know that they could only handle 1,300 after one year. Don't care if it seems too much, they should be able to resist that much weight. She activated her Sharingan with intentions to use the advantage of having one of the best Keke Jinkai ever. After activating the red and black eyes, she blurred in front of the Uzumaki, punching her in the face, forcing her to slide backwards. Karen suddenly had golden chains that came from her back, flying straight towards the Achiha. Satsuki was able to dodge every one of them, jumping back from each of the chains coming at her. Naruto's was much faster than Karen's chains, so it was pretty damn easy. The redeed used the distraction from her chains to appear behind the clan heiress and aim a sweep to her legs. Satsuki sensed the move and backflipped over her, kicking her in the back of her head when Karen stood. The crimson-eyed girl almost crashed into the floor, but her reflexes allowed her to roll away. She quickly jumped to her feet and back, giving her some distance from the onyx-eyed teen. Is that all you got? taunted Satsuki pridefully, angering Karen. She went through many hand seals and snarled out Suetan. Sir Uedin. A torrent of water came from the nearby ocean. It slowly transformed into the face of a dragon, with a huge open mouth and yellow glowing eyes. The attack headed towards her comrade, like its creator commanded. Satsuki saw the attack coming at her and rolled her eyes. That was a weak attack, compared to her and Naruto. She went through the required hand seals and blew out a stream of white fire. The flames took the form of a dragon and clashed with the water dragon. Katen. Karyadin. She spoke in her mind. Steam rose from the clash, obscuring the Yuzumaki and Ichiha's view of each other. Karen didn't need her vision however, thanks to her unique sensory abilities. Karen tried to think of a plan, knowing that Satsuki wouldn't attack her. The crimson-eyed girl's eyes brightened and she went through hand seals, allowing her to perform silently. Satsuki saw the smoke dissipating, but didn't distinguish Karen herself. Satsuki focused her chakra to form a semi-sphere around her, only to send it flying in all directions, trying to feel Karen. The prideful girl smirked and jumped up, just as a pair of hands came through the ground Katen. Usenka no Jutsu the whispered mentally. Doten. Shinj Xanshu. Whispered the glass-wielding teen. She looked up, only to see multiple small balls of fire coming down at her, and went underground once again. Baron came out from another place, jumping away as Satsuki's sword almost impaled her. The adamantine chain wielder growled at Satsuki and slapped her hand on the ground, a rock shaped like a cone came up and was sent flying towards Satsuki at high speeds. Doten. Directs him. Karen announced her. The lightning and fire using the girl attacked the sharp rock, using Karasu, that she infused with lightning, to slice through it like a hot knife through butter. Then, they rushed at her, putting her hands in a cross position with her ring and index fingers. Cage Bunshin. Sensing the team behind her, Karen jumped up and went through the required hand seal Suetan. Miserapa the redeed launched a large jet of water from her mouth through her hand. The clone and original went through some seals and jumped at the jet of water. Once they got near it, they released black lightning from their hands. Jibashi. The streams of lightning connected to water and traveled to the source in an instance, shocking Karen. She fell through the sky and into the floor. While falling, her form turned to earth and started to separate. Tsutsuki nodded to her clone and started to walk close to it. It got into a stance, having up a single hand seal. When the Achiha got close enough, she threw her hands at the clone's back, making it go poof. Once it cleared, in its place was Karen, on her knees, having a paralysis seal on her. H. How? Karen questioned Tsutsuki. Her reply was a smirk. Simple, I sensed that the one that came up didn't have as much chakra as it should. Doten. Shinji Xanshu doesn't take that much chakra, so it was a clone. I destroyed the clone and had my clone sense you. It substituted with you right before it was hit with a paralysis seal, so it was on you. I had it substituted at the last second so you couldn't escape. Tsutsuki took the paralysis seal off her, and they both went to the others, a repair seal repairing the training ground they messed up. The Ichiha heiress once again spoke, this time to give her assessment. You have good tojutsu, but Naruto has one that you can use that is better. You are his cousin so you should be allowed to use it. You, like the others, will have resistant seals on you. In Jinjutsu, you were able to dispel a few of the ones I placed on you, which I'm sure has to do with you, sensing that Naruto told me you have. She paused, letting Karen confirm with a nod, your ninjutsu is good, they have good quality, but you could have more. Your adamantines aren't very fast, so you should train to make them faster. You should also train to change their shape, since they are made of your chakra, you should be able to manipulate its shape. You should also learn, seeing as you're in Yuzumaki. She finished her assessment.
Perrin agreed with the assessment, knowing it was true. You couldn't argue with your chance of getting stronger, after all. Naruto vs Jugo Naruto and Jugo walked to an area that was farther from where his crush and cousin were. They both got into position, ready to attack their opponent. Naruto got into his learned bloody whirlpool dance, while Jugo just stayed there, gathering energy around him, trying to control it. The nature lover held out his right hand, transforming it into an axe. Naruto saw this and grabbed Benahem from his sheath and flew towards Jugo. Said team saw the attack and intercepted the sword slash with his axe, creating the sound of metal clashing against rock. The two teammates tried to overpower each other, but in the end, Naruto won the clash. Hugo was pushed back by the blonde, but he jumped back to not take any damage. The orange-haired youth transformed the axe back to a hand. He pulled out a kunai and shuriken, charged them with his chakra, making it sharp, and threw it at Naruto. The wind-charged shuriken and kunai were multiplied 100-fold when Jugo shouted out Cage Shuriken and Kunai Bunshin. The Uzumaki air looked at the barrage of kunai and shuriken and let out a smirk, sure to stop them near the attacker. Tong. Tapa. The large gust of wind slammed against the weapons, stopping them in their tracks, near the thrower. Naruto ran towards Jugo at full speed, but right as he was about to reach him, he disappeared. The blonde reappeared behind the unstable Senjutsu user, kicking them in the back, sending him flying forward. Naruto reappeared under Jugo and kicked him upwards. The orange-haired boy spun around in mid-air and swung his hands downwards. The attacker met the blonde shinobi, only for him to go poof. Jugo tried to look below for Naruto, forgetting to look up. Triple Uzumaki Barrage. Naruto shouted, right as three feet connected to the orange-eyed boy. The nature-loving boy was sent down at high speeds and crashed into the ground. The former Konohanin landed on the ground and dismissed his clones, waiting for his opponent to get up. Jugo got out of the human-shaped hole and grabbed his head, feeling dizzy. Enough Jugo, I've seen enough. Here's my assessment. Naruto started out in a professional voice. From what I've seen, you have no Tejutsu style. Don't worry about that since I have a Tejutsu scroll you can learn from. It's called the Iron Fist. It uses strength over speed, which you have plenty of. You can also use your transformations to add to it. You'll still have speed, but more strength. Naruto explained while opening a seal in his hands, taking out the aforementioned scroll and throwing it to Jugo, who caught it. But ninjutsu, your chakra levels and potency are good, but not very high. Your chakra control is pretty good as well. You don't have many ninjutsu, seeing as you didn't use that many. Here. Naruto throws him a chakra paper. Jugo, already knowing what to do, channeled chakra into the paper. At first, the paper split in half. Then, one half started to turn brown and crumble away, while the other half dampened. Naruto whistled, impressed with his three affinities. Um, wind, water, and earth. Not bad. Wind types are extremely rare and are always very powerful. Water can be used for both offensive and defensive, as well as supplementary. It can also be combined with wind to make it more powerful. Earth is used mostly for defense, but could be used for offense too. Naruto continued, explaining the affinities and benefits for Jugo's affinities. In Jutsu, I am not gonna even try and just say that you won't use it right. Naruto asked with a roll of his eyes. Jugo nodded his head, knowing that he wouldn't and couldn't use Jinjutsu. They both headed towards their teammates. They arrived there a little earlier than Satsuki and Karen, so they watched the battle for a bit. After the battle, Satsuki and Naruto had headed off by themselves to make the schedule and training. Once they had completed the task, they both came back ten minutes later. All right, Fu, Karen, come with me, I need to put resistance seals on you too. Satsuki told the two women who followed her. Once they reached a faraway place from the boys, Satsuki told them to lay down so she could put the resistance seal up. She took out ink from a storage seal and started to draw the needed fuin on Karen's navel. Once she finished, she moved on to Fu. After putting it on both of them and giving them control, all three headed back to the boys. Naruto had also drawn resistance seals on both boys and given them control. They waited for the girls to get back so he and Satsuki could tell the others what they would be trained in. The three they were waiting for arrived a minute later. Training for Fu, they trained for eight hours a day. Naruto and Satsuki had both trained Fu in the ninjutsu parts. The first she learned was the cage bunshin, due to her being a that granted her high chakra reserves and had learned very fast. After that, they had made her create as many clones as the orange-eyed girl could. The Ichiha and Yuzumaki air heiress had made her create 500 clones each day for multiple tasks. The first hundred were to do chakra control exercises. They upgraded her from water walking to waterfall, walking to gaju few in water walking to gaju few in waterfall walking. The blonde had also both trained Fu clones in her elemental affinities. Naruto gave 100% of the leaf cutting exercise to do for the wind to increase the potency. After five days of trying she had finally got it. Another 100 during that time were taught a lot of Futen Jutsu. The clones were taught Ftong. Shink Takyoku, Ftong. Shink Rampa, Ftong. 
Shinkyoku, Tan, Shinka, Tan, Repchen, Tan, Datapa, Tan, Tapa and a few more. After that, he had made sure to get 200 of them to cut a rock in half. He knew that it would not be easy, but it was better than the waterfall, which was harder. Tsutsuki had taken 200 clones to train them. She had the first 100 train their fire affinity by using a leaf and trying to set it on fire in an instance. This also took 5 days. The Ichiha had the other 100 constantly use the fire she taught so they could be closer to being mastered. Some of the fool earned were Katen. Nkakak no Jutsu, Katen. Enden, Katen. Menka, Katen. Korekton, and Katen. Msenka no Jutsu. When the mint-haired girl completed those, the onyx-eyed girl had taken 200 clones for the next 5 days so they could try to evaporate about a gallon of water. She wasn't able to complete it, but Satsuki didn't honestly expect her to. While the clones were learning that over the 10 days, Satsuki had taught the real woman to better her to jutsu. The resistance seal made it hard to move, so she was able to fix any mistakes, since she was so slow. She was able to get to level 2 100s, thanks to Chimei. They didn't bother doing anything with Jinjutsu, knowing that Chimei would do it for her. What a surprise that had been, knowing that the two worked together. Perrin's training. Perrin was mostly focused on Tujutsu. She had already learned some before, so it would make sense to focus on Tujutsu, which is an advanced version of your style. Naruto had taken the Tujutsu style of his family and gave it to his cousin. He couldn't exactly give her his own style, so he just helped her improve the one she used, using his one for references. The trek was hard, but she was able to do it with all the clones she made. She had been taught Cage Bunshin by Naruto and could create 300 at max. 100 worked on chakra control for a few days, but later got onto elemental. She might already have some, but having more would just help more. She had very good chakra control, even enough to use medicine with her Yuzumaki reserves. The other 150 hundred were sent out so they could learn Fuinjutsu. The 50 that were left tried to master their chakra chains. They were able to make it faster, but not able to change shapes. The chains were fast enough to catch level speed, while Naruto's could catch cage level. She had trained with them before, but didn't know how until she learned from her cousin. The resistance seals didn't get very high for Karen, only up to two one hundredths. This was expected since she was just starting. It would take her more time to get used to it and more time as each level increased. When the crimson-eyed girl had complained about why she should do this, they had given all of them the answer. Flashback, why do I have to learn this, I'm the tracker, not the frontline fighter. Cried out Karen as she panted in exhaustion. Naruto was right in front of her, staring at her. Just because you're the sensor and tracker in the team doesn't mean you can't fight. What happens if you're trapped by someone? What if all of us but you are exhausted and you have to fight an Anbu who might kill us? You are an Uzumaki cousin, and Uzumaki live their lives without regret and never surrender, not even to the gods. The Uzumaki told her calmly. He then addressed all of them, but still looked at Karen. We all have our roles here, but we have to be able to fight. Me and Satsuki can sense people, but not like you. You are our sensor and tracker. Jugo and Satsuki can gather information with either the animals or Sharingan. All of us will, however, be frontline fighters. He told them. The blonde was right after all. They each had more than one field. The two Yuzumaki and the Achiha were the few Injutsu and sensors trackers specialists. Though not as good as Karen's the two cousins were the healers, due to their Yuzumaki bloodline, giving them the ability to heal people with bites, because of the life force they possessed. Yeah, I gave it to Naruto, deal with it. Satsuki and Jugo were the info gatherers, due to the aforementioned abilities. The boys and girls, but Karen, were the heavy hitters, specializing in ninjutsu, tojutsu, and or kinjutsu. Satsuki was the jinjutsu specialist, due to the Sharingan. Naruto and Satsuki explained this to the other four, and they all understood. Karen too understood this and didn't complain again, and neither did any of the others. Flashback end. Yugo's and Sajetsu's training was similar to the others. They all had to adjust to the resistance seal, but they didn't get to another level. Jugo had to improve his Tajutsu style that incorporated his transformations. Both of them had a small supply of ninjutsu, so they were taught more. Neither learned the cage bunshin since their chakra wasn't high enough to make it useful. Chapter 10. Return. Ujido Nai was jumping through the trees, headed towards the village along with her team of she had been assigned an assassination mission by the Rakage. She had accepted the B-ranked mission given to her by her father figure. The muscular man had asked her to choose three to go with her. The Nibi Jinchuriki wanted to choose three experienced people to come with her so she could finish it faster, but there wasn't enough. The blonde got stuck with a rookie instead. The mission required her to assassinate a wealthy noble in the land of Hot Springs. The noble was apparently guarded by many samurai that were very skilled. At least, that's what the requester said. She had immediately gathered three random people and headed out. Finally, all four Kumonin arrived at the outskirts of Zanami town, the town where Zato, the noble, lived. 
she looked at them, transformed to look like normal civilians, and made sure there were no traces that lead back to Kumo, gathering info, Yujito ordered as she also transformed. Now, she had long black hair that reached her lower legs, tied in a ponytail. Her face stayed the same, but now with no makeup on. Her Kinoichi outfit was replaced with a blue t-shirt that exposed a bit of cleavage with black flames at the middle black, forming an upside-down V. She now had on black pants with blue shoes. The other three also had on civilian clothes. All three entered through the gates of the small town and walked about. Yujito used her sharp hearing that Matatabi had granted her to listen around to gather information. She heard nothing useful, however, only casual conversations with the occasional business ones. As she continued to head further and further, she finally heard a conversation of Zato. So we need to pay even more to Zato? Questioned a man. Yeah, damn bastard making us more than we need to in tax. I wish I could destroy that castle of his. I wish I was a ninja. The other replied. Ijido stopped listening as she had the information she needed and quickly headed towards her teammate's poorly concealed chakra signature. The blonde woman sighed in annoyance at the Chunin's incompetence. There could have been an enemy ninja who could easily kill them right now. Ijido paused while she was walking. If I go by myself, I should be able to assassinate this Sado and come back in time. I can't have their incompetence ruin the mission the blonde woman thought to herself. Ijido then turned from her destination and walked towards the giant castle in the middle of the town. The beautiful woman shook her head at the arrogance of the man. How could he foolishly believe that he wouldn't get hurt and not even try to hide? The mad Atabi Jinchuriki walked through the doors and closed it behind her. She could destroy the entire palace, but then, the village would have economic issues that might trace back to Kumo, making it have to pay. Once the doors were closed, Yujito blurred out of sight. She reappeared on the structures of the palace above. She quickly and silently made her way through the area, making sure to be quiet. The Kumo ninja arrived where the door was below. She looked at the two guards right next to it. Discreetly molding her chakra, the Nai smirked as she channeled lightning chakra to her hands. Even though it was not a chakra nature, she could still use it. Silently, claws slid from their hidden places from the small holes in her gloves. Lightning crackled around it as she quickly descended down to her opponents, a clone right beside her. She appeared behind the armored samurai and covered their mouths so they wouldn't scream and sliced her claws through the weakling. Her clone mimicked her actions, and they both let go, causing the guards to land with a thud on the floor. The elite quickly took the guard's armor. Thank goodness that it was a woman and the armor was more comfortable. You should strip the male too, you, a perverse voice echoed through her head. Ma, so not the time. Yujito screamed at the flamingo. Had anyone realized that Biju was actually Jubi with the bai in front? Just to stop stupid reviews, I said if you switch by to the beginning of Biju, it would be Jubi. Not that Biju were Jubi, which they are, just fragments. There is always a time, Matatabi giggled again. Ijido's eyes twitched as she transformed herself into the female with armor still on. She opened the door and saw that there were multiple guards looking at her. Not wanting to deal with this and Matatabi's ranting, she sent out a strong burst of killer intent towards them, but kept it contained to the room. The burst knocked out all the guards and she walked through the bodies, not sparing them a glance. Maybe we can come back and have a th Matatabi perversely started, but was interrupted by Yujito's mental shout. Ma, no. Yujito shouted in rage at what the millennium-year-old female said. She would not give her body to anyone. Spoil sport, Matatabi pouted at her host. Besides, we already did it, so technically the woman was once interrupted by the heated shout of her lesbian host. Yes, I'm serious. Ma, that's only you and me she admitted to the blue-haired woman inside her own mind. They had corrupted her at a young age, but she had been far too disgusted to let any man have their ways with her, so she had made sure to only let Matatabi do that to her. Eventually, she grew to love her, even with the woman's quirks. In the real world, Yujito had reached the door that contained her target. She continued with her disguise and opened the doors once again. Why are you disturbing me? Zato asked. Zato has puffy black hair and wears a small pair of sunglasses, as if to make himself look cool. He looked to be around 40. He also wears a purple suit that clashes horribly with his black tie. Yujito was thankful that she had a helmet on or he would see her turn green in disgust. Yes, he is that ugly. Ma, pictures, now. She screamed at the woman inside her mind. Matatabi, who had blocked her connection to the side of Yujito, quickly sent some of their private time to Yujito. She then cast over her lover to make it so that they saw a better-looking man in front of her. Well, what is it? The ugly bastard shouted. Oh, right, Lord Zato, there is someone here to meet you, she said, the helmet hiding the devious smirk on her face. Who? Zato asked. The Shinigami. She yelled before she disappeared in front of him. Before he had a chance to react, his head rolled clean of his neck. At least, that was what he felt. What he didn't realize was that Yujito had trapped him in a 
while this was going on in the, Yujita retrieved all the important things from his mind, like where his money was, if he knew any information and anything else she needed. After retrieving it, she then acted out on what they showed, killing the bastard once and for all. After killing Zaido, Yujito had taken her team back to Kumo. When asked about their mission, she had quickly told them that she had completed it when she came across the guy and assassinated him after having the pervert come with her to an alleyway. Jack, a slice of a sword was hurt as Yujito quickly jumped away from her position on the tree she was hoping from. Unfortunately for her team, they were too slow and all got killed by the strained scaled sword. Yujito flipped in midair to land on a branch and narrowed her eyes at the man in front of her. She was able to remember the blue skinned fish in front of her. Isam Hashigaki. S ranked missing nin from Kiri. Wielder of Samahada and has large enough chakra reserves to compare to. Samahada has the power to absorb chakra. You, this man possesses more chakra than you and better control. I suggest you try to delay him until someone comes. We are close enough. Try to get closer though, so the clash can be felt easier, Matatabi ordered after sensing the depths of the shark's chakra levels. Alright Ma Yujito responded to her tenant as she flew towards Kumo. Isam quickly realized what she was trying to do and blurred in front of her before kicking her stomach, sending the blonde flying back and farther away from Kumo. She recovered from the kick and flipped herself in midair. She rocketed to the blue-skinned man in front of her, using Ma's fire abilities to propel herself like a rocket. Isam ducked under her and did a rear horse kick to her ribs. The woman grabbed the heel of the shoe before it connected to her and flew under him while tossing him up into the air. She quickly went through multiple hand seals and put her hand up as though she was holding something. A blue fire flickered into her hands and started to grow in size until it was the size of a house. Matatabi Arts. Hi Bakudan. She shouted as she did a flip and kicked it up, sending the scorching ball to kiss him. The shark man put his hands to his lips after going through the necessary hand seals. Suitan. Dakendan no Jutsu. Thrusting his hands forward, Kissum sent a large shark at the fireball. Unfortunately for Yujito, her fireball was destroyed and absorbed by the shark, causing it to grow even bigger. Unfortunately for the shark, the attack had been laced with Matatabi's chakra, so when it did absorb it, the shark started to disintegrate. Kissum growled in annoyance as his attack was made useless and decided to use another one that didn't absorb. Ma, what happened? Yujito asked, dumbfounded by how her firebomb and the shark were destroyed. My chakra was absorbed by the shark, and since all chakra is corrosive, he disintegrated, the blue net within her replied. The conversation ended when Kissum yelled out the name of another. Tsukundan no Jutsu. Once again, Kissum sent a shark at Yujito. Yujito dodged and flew up to where Kissum was falling. She sent a punch to his stomach, but he grabbed it and pulled her with one hand, while swinging the unsheathed Samahada with the other. Yujito substituted with a piece of rock on the ground, then appeared above him, trying to hit him in his face with a roundhouse kick. Kissum was sent flying into a tree below before he exploded in a shower of water. Another Kissum appeared above her, and she realized what he had done. Suetan. Mizu Bunshin, he whispered into her ear as he slashed Samahad at her. The woman felt some of her chakra from her reserves get absorbed as she was sent to the ground. Quickly moving through the pain, she landed on her feet and looked up, just in time to catch Kissum's foot. So the saying, cats always land on their feet is true, huh? Kissum asked with a smirk on his face. She used the leg to twist while trying to land a hit on his face. Before it could hit, Kissum sent his foot to the ground, intent on smashing her against the ground. Yujito saw the plan and pushed herself up so as to not hit the ground. She then focused Ma's chakra into her, lighting it on blue fire, and swung the appendage at Kissum. A blue arc made of fire was sent towards Kissum, who smirked and slashed at it with his sword, causing it to dissipate. Is that all you got? He taunted as the blonde in front of him started twitching. Yujito's eyes twitched as she placed her hands in a triangle. Isum was curious and being the battle maniac he was, let her continue. Blue flames formed between her fingers and she started blowing at it. Matatabi Arts. Furusuba Buru. She thought to herself. Bubbles started to come out of her hand and floated around Kissum, completely surrounding him. Isum, realizing what she was trying to do, quickly created a clone that trapped him in a suetan. Surum. Unfortunately for Kissum, the bubbles didn't do anything, while the Kumo Jonin tried to jump towards the path of Kumo. Isum's clone decided that he would chase after her and blurt in her direction. Unfortunately for Yujito, even if he was only one-tenth as strong as his original, he was still pretty fast. He tried to kick her in the face, but Yujito was ready for it and did a mid-air backflip, completely avoiding it and continued. Clone Kissum tried again, but this time, when she dodged, he grabbed her by the waist and threw her up in the air, spinning rapidly. Before the elite Kinoichi could stop herself, she was sent flying towards the opposite direction of her destination. As she flew, she created a small ball of fire and threw it at Kissum. Ah, is that all you can do, little kitty? He insulted as he dodged it. 
The ball sailed past Kisum, but it exploded in a bright flash when Yujito closed her eyes and said Kai. The flash startled Kisum and turned around. Big mistake there. Yujito sent out a flaming kunai with explosive tags on them. Page kunai bunshin. She yelled. Before Kisum could react, hundreds of them were sailing towards him and all exploded. The shockwave, explosion, and propulsion by the force caused it to burst into crystal blue water. Down below with a real Kisum, he had just got out of the water when he heard a loud Kai. Above him. Before he could react, the blue flame bubbles started to spin around him, creating a dome and started shrinking. Kisum put his hands by his side and created a shell of water around himself. Using his water manipulation, he enlarged it and tried to destroy the bubbles. It only half worked as they all exploded like flash bombs. Naruto suddenly stopped as a bright flash to his right set off. He could also sense the enormously large chakra of Kisum Hashigaki, smaller than his own, but beat Satsuki by a large margin. The blonde shinobi quickly changed direction towards the destination where he might be located while relaying what he had sensed to his tram. Satsuki was quick to follow her newly discovered crush, as were the rest of Team Yuzu, but he looked at the four behind him and told them to stay put. They decided to do as told, even though Sajetsu growled at the chance of missing a fight, especially one with Kisum Hashikage, and the chance of getting Samahata. They quickly arrived at the flash, and Naruto saw Kisum fighting a blonde woman, probably a. He landed beside her and just before she could attack him, Matatabi told her not to. Don't attack him you. He is my brother's. He probably will help you if he knew who you were, her lover told her. Hello, my name is Yujito Nai, I am Nibi she got interrupted by the man next to her. Nibi's in Shuriki, right? He interrupted. Her eyes twitched at the interruption, but she was able to rein in her temper. I am Naruto Yuzumaki, Kaiubi Zinchuriki, nice to meet you sister, he joked, referring to her as a sister because of being a. Before their conversation could finish, the now clear-sighted Kisum attacked the two. Naruto, deciding the fight wasn't worth it, grabbed both Yujito and Satsuki's shoulder and waist individually, and here I shined them to his team, more specifically, the mark on Sajetsu's sword. They all hid their chakra signature so Kisum couldn't find them and started to talk. Thank you for saving me from that guy, she thanked Naruto. She knew that if the fight had gone on, she would eventually lose. After Yujito had thanked them and they discussed something, Team Yuzu and Yujito went their separate ways. Hey Naruto, did you get Samahata from Kisum Senpai? Sajetsu asked as they were tree hopping towards each other. I still don't know why you want another sword when you can't use two, Fu commented as she used Jamei's wings to fly. I want to collect all the swords so I can make seven more swordsmen women with me as the leader, Sajetsu stated to her. Note that he didn't say seven more swordsmen of the mist. No Sajetsu, I wasn't there to get the sword, I was there to get Yujito out of there, Naruto answered the question with an eye roll. Damn it. Sajetsu exclaimed with annoyance. After a few hours of tree hopping, they finally got to Konoha. Once they finally arrived, all of Team Yuzu widened their eyes to the scene in front of them. Most of the village had been abandoned. The buildings were almost all destroyed. What few ninjas were here were leading cuff ninjas to prison. Sakura was walking towards the village gates in hopes of finding Kakashi there. Once she arrived at the northern gates, Sakura widened her eyes, not believing her eyes. In front of her were Naruto, the female Sasuke from her nightmares, and four other people she didn't recognize. Naruto. She yelled as she waved to him. Naruto turned his eyes towards her, and Sakura froze. There was no kindness from Naruto in those eyes any longer. The Naruto she knew wasn't there anymore. What did Orochimaru do to him? She asked herself. Finally, her eyes went to the team, and more specifically, to Satsuki. Naruto, who is that? She asked. And where is Sasuke-kun? Both of you did go to Rachimaru after Sasuke took you, right? She asked in a desperate tone. Naruto rolled his eyes at the tone in her voice. The girl behind me is Satsuki Ichiha what Sakura shouted, not believing that there was another Ichiha alive besides Sasuke and Itachi. Naruto glared at the interruption, causing her to shut up, and continued. She is the real Sasuke. There was never a Sasuke Ichiha. Satsuki disguised herself as Sasuke, so the council wouldn't be able to turn her into a breeding stock before she turned 16. Naruto told her. While he hated the girl in front of him, he had to act nice, but not as before because that would be suspicious. A guy is taken to Orochimaru for two and a half years, and nothing changes. Yeah. No. Sakura was in tears, not wanting to believe that a crush was a girl all along. She fell on her knees in shock, but realized that behind her, Kakashi wasn't at all surprised, not even a little. Hey K Kakashi-sensei, did you already know about this? Sakura asked shakily. Um, yeah. Naruto and I figured it out in the wave mission. She didn't want us to tell you as you would have told someone and might have repeated until it turned to the council, who would force her into a baby factory before she was 16 and could choose who she wanted. Kakashi told her, remembering back to the reveal. 
flashback, a large killing intent blasted everyone on the bridge, causing the level ninja to pause in their clash and Sakura to faint like the pathetic little bitch she was. I don't think she could handle a blast, especially from Kayu. And the demonic crystal mirrors. Sasuke? Are you alright, Sasuke? I'm sorry, Ninja-san. But your friend is gone. Is this the first time you've seen a friend die? A form in the mist rippled, nearly becoming visible. He's dead. Haku nodded. Yes. I'm afraid so. Naruto felt himself start to shake as Haku began speaking of the pain of being a ninja, the suffering of life, the loss of one's heart, and the service of a ninja, as nothing more than a tool. The masked ninja words poured into his ears as he stared at the body of his teammate, a spike of jagged emotions welling up in his heart. Sasuke was a bastard, a dick, a jerk, an annoyingly arrogant jackass. But he was Naruto's teammate, his fellow leaf ninja. Dead. Naruto-san. Haku's voice was questioning, trying to draw out the hidden blonde. The Hyuden user was beginning to run out of chakra and needed to find Naruto to end this quickly. I'm going to kill you, Naruto growled out as red chakra started to swirl around and encase him. The form of a one-tailed fox covering Naruto's darkened face. Naruto-san. Haku's only answer was an enormous column of bloody red chakra erupting from right next to one of the mirrors. Haku was suddenly thrown out of the mirror she was within. The mask on her face broke apart and Naruto looked within the brown eyes that held no emotions. You? Naruto questioned as he looked at the girl below him, remembering when he met her a few days ago. W why did you stop? Are you not angry that I have killed your friend? Naruto stole a glance back at Sasuke's still form before reverting his eyes back to the teenager in front of him. Why are you doing this? Why are you with Zabuza? Why are you doing Gato's dirty work? He demanded. Because Zabuza san is my precious person, he was the one who saved me and for that, I have made myself a tool for him to use. For a moment, a memory flashes through Naruto back at their first encounter. Do you have someone precious to you? Do you have someone willingly wanting to protect you? He remembered. Naruto was disgusted at what came from Haku's mouth, but he can also see the familiar look in her eyes. Loneliness, the same way he had felt back when he was alone in the village until Itachi, Iruka-sensei, Kakashi, and Satsuki had come along, even if she was in Sasuke form. Don't talk like that. You are not a tool. You don't have to do what you don't want to. You are a person. Shouted Naruto, his killing intent pulsing a little. Perhaps. But this might be my last thing to do as Zabuza sends tool Haku glanced at the direction where Kakashi and Zabuza were at. Naruto, with his eyes still blazing red, could make out a figure of Zabuza immobilized by Kakashi's summon dogs. Kakashi himself was about to make the final blow, a lighting attack, a technique he created called Raiden. Rikiri. This is your end demon of the mist. Kakashi quickly ran towards Zabuza, starting his assault, he was about to pin his attack on Zabuza, when suddenly a mirror-like ice came into his field of vision and Haku came out. Shit I can't stop. Kakashi cursed, it felt like slow motion, his momentum not slowing, and his thrust out arm closing into the young girl's chest. A little while later, Zabuza was dying right next to his apprentice. The girl that he thought of as a daughter. Naruto was walking towards Sasuke's body, there was no one on the bridge, the villagers had gone back with Tezuna, while Naruto and Kakashi stayed back. Poof, Sasuke's body went up in smoke. In his place was a raven-haired pre-teenager. Kakashi's eyes widened but was able to compose himself quickly. Sasuke is a girl. Naruto placed his hand on Satsuki's stomach and sent a small burst of chakra along her skin. Naruto, what are you doing? He asked a boy who he had helped in the past as an ambu. Taking these needles out, Kakashi Nai, Naruto replied to his second brother figure, the first being Itachi. He and Kakashi had developed a strong bond after Kakashi had once rescued him. After that, Naruto was secretly trained in while Itachi had trained his body. Naruto hadn't made much progress back then, but was able to get to level 2 by shinobi standards by 10, where Kakashi stopped training him, not wanting to be discovered by the council. After all, they could just find him training Naruto in a training ground with a the shinobi they sent. Kakashi didn't know everything about Naruto, so he didn't know about Itachi, so he didn't know about Satsuki. While they were talking, Satsuki finally woke up. She looked around and saw Naruto and Kakashi looking down at her. The girl looked down and saw pale skin, paler than usual. It was also more feminine. The preteen looked at herself and saw that the transformation Hiruzen had put on her had been undone. Chapter 11. Arrival. The head had finally arrived at the Kanoha gates. After being led in by Kitetsu and Izumo, they met Sakura and Kakashi. Naruto. She yelled as she waved to him. Naruto turned his eyes towards her, and Sakura froze. There was no kindness from Naruto in those eyes any longer. The Naruto she knew wasn't there anymore. What did Orochimaru do to him? She asked herself. Finally, her eyes went to the team, and more specifically, to Satsuki. Naruto, who is that? She asked. And where is Sasuke-kun? Both of you did go to Orochimaru after Sasuke took you, right? 
she asked in a desperate tone. Naruto rolled his eyes at the tone in her voice. The girl behind me is Itsuki Ichiha what Sakura shouted, not believing that there was another Ichiha alive besides Sasuke and Itachi. Naruto glared at the interruption, causing her to shut up, and continued. She is the real Sasuke. There was never a Sasuke Ichiha. Satsuki disguised herself as Sasuke, so the Elder Council wouldn't be able to turn her into a breeding stock before she turned 16. Naruto told her. One, while he hated the girl in front of him, he had to act nice, but not as before because that would be suspicious. A guy is taken to Orochimaru for two and a half years, and nothing changes. Yeah. No. Sakura was in tears, not wanting to believe that a crush was a girl all along. She fell on her knees in shock, but realized that behind her, Kakashi wasn't at all surprised, not even a little. Hey K Kakashi sensei, did you already know about this? Sakura asked shakily. Um, yeah. Naruto and I figured it out in the wave mission. She didn't want us to tell you as you would have told someone and might have repeated until it turned to the council, who would force her into a baby factory before she was 16 and could choose who she wanted. Kakashi told her, remembering the battle at the bridge. Sakura couldn't believe this. Her teammates had kept such a secret for so long. Even worse was that her precious Asuke was not real, just a fabrication created by this Atsuki bitch. She glared at her original teammates, but they were ineffective. Sakura was much weaker compared to them, and none of them held any love for her except Kakashi, and that was only as a leaf shinobi, nothing else. Before anything else could progress, five Anbu appeared, Niko, Hibi, Inu, Nizumi, and Baku. Come with us. You must report to Tsunade-sama and the council, the purple-haired woman with the Niko mask said. You must come as well, they told the other four. They nodded before the eleven disappeared in their own shunshin, be it with bugs, water, smoke, fire, lightning, wind, or a crimson wind. All of them suddenly appeared in the council room. Sanadi scouts had reported that Naruto and Satsuki were coming with others, so she had prepared the council, even though they didn't hold much power. 2. There were ten people present in the meeting. Sanadi Senju, Danzo Shimura, Hiyashi Hayuga, Tsu Minyazuka, Enoichi Yamanaka, Shibi Aburam, Shikaku Naka, Choza Akamichi, Kahari Yudatan, and Hamura Medikado. Naruto Yuzumaki, Ichiha-san, do you know why you are here? Sanadi asked. No, Naruto deadpanned at his godmother. They had just got here, how would they know three? You have willingly left Orochimaru and abandoned Konoha. Why should you not be sent to prison? Hiyashi asked. I went to Orochimaru as the curse seal knocked me unconscious. I was not willing to go there. Then, I got captured by Orochimaru's elite bodyguard and they messed with the seal, rendering my body uncontrollable, and it took Orochimaru against my will. When I arrived there and the influence wore off, I realized that I wouldn't be able to escape. I then decided to trick Orochimaru to train me by saying I would be his vessel after I killed Itachi. She took a deep breath. She and Naruto had created a lie that was sure to fool a lot of the council and have proof. My plan was that I would have Orochimaru train me then kill him so I could gain what he stole and has gained for Konoha. I took back the snake summoning contract, as well as every technique he taught me, and she finished the lie. As proof, she unsealed the contract that Naruto had taken from the base. She hadn't revealed that they had the Kusanagi. Besides, she didn't need the snake contract. She had a much more powerful contract with the Phoenix clan, just like Naruto had with the Dragon clan. Flashback, the Yuzumaki clan were fucking geniuses. It had been two years since they had started training at Yuzu. Today was one of the days that she and Naruto had gone exploring. Why were the Yuzumaki clan geniuses? They had created an underground city that was only accessible to those who could unlock the seal that guarded it, and only those with Yuzumaki blood could unlock the blood seal. Apparently, they had created a fake area on the surface that had stuff they could easily recreate, but underground laid the true treasures of Yuzu. The underground area had buildings that weren't damaged. Even though almost all Yuzumakis were dead, the underground area was still there. It held everything that the Yuzumaki held sacred, their seals, contracts, documents, everything. They had discovered the area a few months ago, and now, they were exploring more of it. Naruto and Satsuki headed into another building that had the word summoning contracts on the outside. Both of them grinned slightly at each other and raced into the building. Inside were many shelves loaded with large contracts. At least 20 were there. Both Air and Eris looked through the assortment and tried to pick out a contract that they liked. When they reached a contract, they felt a small pull towards it, the Ichiha with the Phoenix and Naruto with the Dragons. Satsuki picked up the large scroll and unrolled it. Inside was a large phoenix at the top, and many columns had a name inside them. Tsutsuki bit her finger and quickly imprinted her name and fingerprints, before going through the necessary hand seals before she shouted out Kuchius. Phoenix. Tsutsuki then disappeared in a poof of smoke at the same time as Naruto, when he also did the jutsu. I'm going to do their trial with the meeting in the Amak. I don't feel like writing this now. Also, I know that that's not how summoning works. 
flashback end, all of them nodded and although most of them believed it, two people didn't. Sanadi and Danzo. Well the story was good, both could easily see the signs of lying within the story. The plan going perfect, Arachimaru's stupidity, none of it added up. The girl wasn't intelligent enough to plan all that out and not get exposed, at least not yet. She also said that Arachimaru taught her and gave her everything. Arachimaru might want a vessel that bad, but he wasn't stupid enough to actually do that. For now, they decided not to say anything, both for their own reasons. Then, everyone turned their gazes to Naruto. But I chased after Satsuki, Kabuto intercepted me and knocked me unconscious and took me back to the base. Apparently, they thought that I would be a valuable ally. I was told that Satsuki was there and they were under the illusion that I was in love with her. I realized the opportunity of getting Satsuki was much higher if I stayed there. But I was there, she indulged me in her plans, and I went along with it as I wanted to go back to Konoha and bring Satsuki here. While I was there, Hirachimaru made me study every book he had that he would allow me, making me more intelligent. He also tried to train me to lose my emotions, as he didn't want my condition to break free through work, but not that much, Naruto finished the long explanation, taking a deep breath. Again, the council nodded, although here, only Tsunade caught his lies, but she decided to let them go. So Orochimaru is dead? Shikaku asked skeptically. When they nodded, he continued. You expect us to believe that two 16-year-olds managed to defeat one of the Sanin? He was sick, couldn't use his, and we did a surprise attack. Even he couldn't handle those while trying to fight us. I used a Chidori in the heart to kill him, Satsuki explained with a smirk, remembering how satisfying it had been to kill the pedophile that nearly caused her to leave behind Naruto, even if she didn't care much back then. The summoning contract you have is proof to your claim. Very well, I believe that they are not traitors, Shikaku concluded. All the other members agreed, except Danzo. Tsunade then approved the vote. Satsuki Ichiha and Naruto Uzumaki, you will not be charged with abandoning your village as you had no choice, and it benefited the village in the end, Tsunade continued, even though it was total bullshit. The council had little to no power. Tsunade was the Hokage. Konoha was not a democracy, it was a dictatorship, and Tsunade, as a cage, was the dictator. She loved Naruto, the one of three people she cared for, and she loved Naruto more than both Jiraiya and Sakura combined. He was her family after all, however distant it may be. For now, Naruto, who are those four behind you? Tsunade asked. She had to remain professional in front of the council, she couldn't show favoritism to her godson and son figure. When we killed Arachimaru, we ran into Karen here, and I learned that she was my cousin. We also met Fu when she was being attacked, and after we saved her, she asked me to train her. Sajetsu here is a swordsman. Jugo here was a traitor from Arachimaru's village, he explained. Tsunade once again nodded, mentally nothing to bring them to her office for the truth. All right, you're dismissed, Tsunade stated before telling Team Yuzu to come to her office. When everyone left, Danzo cursed. Damn that Jinchuriki and Ichiha. They manipulated everyone to believe their lies. I need to kill all of them off so they aren't a threat to Konoha. Tsunade was looking at Naruto, her eyes narrowed. Thankfully, Shizun was running an errand for her right now. All right Naruto, tell me what really happened. What do you mean? He asked, acting confused. It may have worked if one, she wasn't very experienced and two, if she wasn't his godmother mother figure. Naruto. I know both you and the Ichiha here lied. I am your family first, and the Hokage told me the truth, she practically growled out. Naruto sighed before complying with the order. Suki-chan and I went to Yuzushiagakur and trained. Then we went to Orochimaru, killed him. Afterwards, we came across Fu and rescued her from the Akatsuki. We sought out useful people and came across Ajetsu, Karen, and Jugo. They don't trust others very much. We earned it though, at least some of it. Tsunade nodded. Satsuki, I want you to take those four to your district and settle them in. I need to have a private talk with Naruto, the order. Satsuki was suspicious at first, but after an unnoticeable nod from her crush, she complied with the order, telling them to follow her before shunshining away. After they had left, Tsunade dropped her formality and disappeared from her seat before hugging her godson. I missed you, she grinned as she kissed him on his forehead. Naruto also smiled, happy to see one of the few people he cared for. Tsunade was one of the seven people he cared a lot for. He liked a few others like Sajetsu, Fu, and Jugo, but he wouldn't miss them horribly. Only a few people had made it on the list. Konohamaru, his apprentice. Bakashi, his brother in all but blood and teacher. Hiraya, his godfather and the one who gave him necessities after Itachi had left. Itachi, his master and best friend. Tsutsuki, the girl he loved. Perrin, his cousin, even if it wasn't much, she was still here, even if it was at the end of the list. And Tsunade, his godmother and distant relative. They were his most precious people. I missed you too, Bachan, he responded. So want to tell me the true introduction of yourself? She teased. 
she wanted to know the real Naruto, not the fake one that had acted as an idiot in Konoha and around people he didn't trust. Sure. My name is Naruto Uzumaki. I like fighting and the people I care about. I dislike those who judge without any knowledge as well as the shinobi system of shinobi. My hobbies are fighting, training, and hanging out with him. My dream is to destroy Konoha and eventually the shinobi system and to revive my clan, Naruto introduced, looking amused all the way throughout it. Five, six, revive the Uzumaki. Have a special girl for it. She teased. To her surprise, he nodded. Well surprised she could easily guess who it was. To the other parts of his dream, she was only surprised about his dislike of the shinobi system, though again, it wasn't against shinobi, but rather what shinobi were and what they were forced to do. He didn't care if people fought so much, after all, he loved fighting. Destroying Konoha. He already told her that, along with Yureya and Kakashi. Naruto didn't hold many secrets from them, only about Itachi, no one, but Satsuki and Naruto knew that, this included Sanadi. Reviving his clan. That was obvious, except for the Satsuki part, that was a surprise. Why did he call her that though? After catching up with Tsunade as well as telling her his plans, Naruto asked what had happened to the village. When she had explained the attack, he asked to go see the prisoners, more specifically the female ones. When asked why, he had told her that he had made a seal that let him know when a person with Uzumaki blood was near and he had felt one earlier from someone that he was sure was a prisoner. After accepting this, she led him there and went through all of them until they arrived at Fuka. Fuka wore a dark pink guy and disconnected arm warmers that reached down to her light purple spandex shorts. She wore a pair of black low-heeled boots. She has long flowing maroon colored hair, which falls down to her waist. She has blue eyes and fair skin. She also has a beauty mark under the left side of her lip. What do you want, bitch? She snarled at Senju. Tsunade narrowed her eyes before using the seal on Fuka to slightly shock her. Didn't hurt a lot, but it still stung like a bitch. Naruto here says you are in Yuzumaki, is that true? Tsunade asked, her glare still on her face, a scowl replacing the smile she had a little while ago. So what if I am? She replied. Naruto stepped up. Fuka-san, I can promise you protection and integrate you into the Yuzumaki clan. You will, however, be interrogated so that you are loyal when we free you or at least make sure that you won't hurt the clan and anyone in it, he proposed to the elder Yuzumaki. The maroon-haired woman glared at them, but what choice did she have? If what the kid was saying was true, she still had family left, and as in Yuzumaki, family was the most important to her. Even though she didn't have any morals, she still cared for family. Here was a kid offering her a place in her true family, but still, could she trust him? How was she supposed to know if he was in Yuzumaki? How many Yuzumaki were there? Pined, but I want to speak to the kid myself. No one else, no Anbu. I will submit to the interrogation if I am satisfied, the former grave robber replied. Tsunade was about to deny it, but Naruto beat her to the punch. All right. Bachan. He asked Tsunade's side but agreed, but only if Fuka wouldn't come into contact with Naruto. When Fuka agreed to this, Tsunade let the prisoner out, put on a chakra restraining seal on her, and led the two to a private area before leaving. After a few minutes, Naruto broke the silence. What do you want to ask? Fuka took this as her K. How do I know if you're in Yuzumaki? Do you have any proof that you can protect me from the others? How many Yuzumakis are there? How do I know if I can trust you to keep your word? She rapidly fired. Whoa, whoa, one at a time. Okay, let's go in order. A few weeks ago, I released a seal that went all over the elemental nations. It is branded as Yuzumaki with a spiral mark somewhere. If you feel it, you're in Yuzumaki. I can show you my mark here, he stopped to uncover his right shoulder, showing a red spiral. Buka thought back to when she had found that mark on her left hip and nodded, having proof that he was in Yuzumaki as she had never told anyone about the mark and no one knew why it was there, not even her. As for how I can protect you, I am the Yuzumaki heir and have the Achiha and Senju clan by my side. I have the support of the goddamn Hokage and she ruled this place. I am the son of two very important and powerful people in Konoha and even if they're dead, their names still hold a lot of pull, Naruto continued. Buka was speechless. This 16-year-old had the backing of the two clans that created Konoha and the support of the Gadim that basically made him a very powerful ally, and he was probably strong as the Uzumaki heir, with the support of those he mentioned. He didn't seem spoiled, so it was safe to assume that he would not be a brat. As for your third question, I know only four Uzumaki right now, even though I'm pretty sure that there are more in the world. Tsunade Senju, me, you, and my our cousin. Four, we are Uzumaki. You know what we hold most important. You are family, so I trust you and you can trust me. I don't expect you to do so right away as I don't trust you fully either, but we have just met so can you blame me? He asked at the end with a smirk. Fuka sighed. All her questions had been answered, at least the one she had at the moment. 
Alright, I agree, but if I find out you are lying, I'll make your life worse than hell and make you beg for death, got it? She threatened. The blonde Yuzumaki looked at her in amusement before agreeing to her terms. After all that had been settled and Fuka had gone to the interrogation room to be interrogated by Inoichi, Naruto had gone back to the Achiha compounds where Satsuki and the others were residing right now. Satsuki had changed clothes when she had arrived back at her house from the clothes she had for a black jean and crimson red shirt, although the shirt seemed a bit too tight on her. When she saw him, she quickly brightened up. Hey Naruto, what took you so long? Naruto smiled at her, huh, he seemed to be doing that more often. I just met another Yuzumaki. This makes four so far, Naruto replied with a grin. Tsutsuki nodded, happy that her best friend found more clan members. While she was jealous that there were Yuzumaki out there, she realized that Naruto deserved a family as much as herself. It would be selfish of her to want him not to have a family, just so he could be with her and be like her, someone without relatives. After all, she only had one relative alive, while he apparently had three. Wait three. Who are they, besides Karen I mean? She asked. Well, I found that Fuka-san was in Yuzumaki, and Tsunade Bachan is Mito Yuzumaki's granddaughter, he replied. Tsutsuki nodded. So that's why they get along so well, and it explains why he can get away with things she would pummeled other people for she thought. So where are the others? He asked. They went to Tsunade after they realized they weren't enlisted as Konohan in yet, she replied. Hey, you wanna hang out together? This place is boring, Naruto commented. He was, bluntly speaking, asking her out on a date, but he was being discreet here. Unfortunately for him, Satsuki saw through it. She slightly blushed, but agreed to it. Sure. Where to? She asked with a small smile. He just shrugged. Hmm, you can choose. Movies, eating, sparring, whatever you want. Let's watch some movies, she grinned slightly. She already knew a movie they could watch, and she already had the disc for TV. What do you want to watch? He asked, eyeing the shelf loaded with discs. It was already near night so I might as well do a marathon. Hmm, I'll pick some out. You can go get some snacks from the kitchen, she told him. Naruto saluted and said yes ma'am. Before he went to the kitchen to get whatever snacks he could find. Soda, popcorn, chips, other junk food and other stuff. Apparently, Kakashi had loaded the place up after he had encountered Naruto and Satsuki at Orochimaru's base. When their teammates arrived back at midnight, they just saw their two leaders sleeping next to each other on the sofa with junk food all over the table and a movie on. Perrin just cooed at the adorable and romantic scene in front of her while Sajetsu, the insensitive idiot he is, laughed his ass off, although silently as to not wake them up. He did not want to be the target of the Achiha and Yuzumaki's wrath. Thank you very much. Fu and Jugo however were kind enough to unroll a futon and place them on it, rather than have them sleep uncomfortably on the sofa. Afterwards, they just left the place as it was. The next day, Satsuki snapped her eyes open as she froze. She could feel a warm presence next to her, but pillows aren't that warm. Suddenly, the memories of last night flowing into her brain. She blushed as she remembered the position that she and her crush had ended up into before they fell asleep. Realizing that they were on a futon and she was sleeping comfortably, she did two of the few options she had at 6 a.m. First, she thanked whichever teammates had done this for them in her thoughts, and second, the busty teen snuggled closer into Naruto's warm chest. She fell asleep again a few minutes later. At midday after everything was sorted, Naruto and his team of five had reported to training ground seven on orders of Kakashi himself. When the Hex had arrived, all of them were greeted with the sight of the rookie nine, along with team guy. Hey, Kakashi nai. What's up? Naruto greeted me. Hey, the silver-haired Jounin replied. Tsunade sama decided that you six probably aren't at genie level, and decided that you and Satsuki never got the credit you two deserved back at the original, plus a field promotion for your mission from the last three years, he continued, doing an eye smile with a U-shaped eyebrow. Tsunade had decided to cover up the going to Orochimaru as a mission, and had told Kakashi about it. They decided to use that instead of saying what Satsuki and Naruto had given the council. Anyways, not many people saw your battle powers and thought that you were getting special treatment, so she decided to hold a battle where you guys have to beat a few, so you can get promoted to special. You can be a Jounin as you don't have the experience of leading a team yet. He finished. Naruto and Satsuki sighed but agreed to the terms. So, who do we fight? Satsuki asked, her infamous Achiha smirk on her face, as she thought of how she could beat up Sakura or some other unfortunate friends. Hopefully, she got Sakura. Lady Luck loved Naruto, and since Naruto loved Satsuki so much, that luck was passed a bit to Satsuki too. She got her wish. Satsuki, you have to fight Sakura for Tejutsu, Asuma for Ninjutsu, and Kurenai for Jinjutsu. You can use anything you want, Kakashi told her. Satsuki sadistically laughed to herself inside as she thought about what she could do to Sakura. Jinjutsu torture, Kinjutsu horror, sealing uses or maybe even combine them along with her other skills. 
Naruto, you have Niji for Tijutsu, me for Ninjutsu, and Hinata for Jinjutsu, Kakashi said. Alright, but what about the rest, the, and Sanadi-sama in the tree? Naruto asked, nodding towards the tree he felt the others at. All some seemed surprised at the fact that he could detect them when they had suppressed their chakra, the others just dismissed it. They will be proctors and decide if you are strong enough to be a Takibetsu Jounin, Kakashi continued. Naruto and Satsuki both nodded their heads. They both wanted the promotions so that they never had to do stupid chores again. The ten people from their generations had been surprisingly calm, but Naruto and Satsuki both deduced that they were being professional. After the fight, they would probably be hounding them with questions. Thank God that only a few people had seen them in Konoha so far. No one except the Konoha 12, their senseis, the Hokage, the Council, Kitetsu, and Izumo, seemed to know about their presence. Hmm, maybe because they never really walked through the village. Whatever it was, neither were ungrateful. Both disliked the civilians and didn't care for most shinobi. Hopefully, they wouldn't be meeting anyone inside Konoha. Naruto did however, want to see Konohamaru. The kid was basically his apprentice. He may have disliked Hiruzen, but that didn't extend to his family. Anyways, Naruto had taught the kid a lot, including chakra control exercises as well Rasengan, but had beaten it into the Saratobi air that he should only use that technique as a last resort and not show off. He could use the few fires he taught, but not the Rasengan. It was deadly, and he didn't hand wanted the small guy to deal with his first kill so early. Sure it was optimistic, but what could he say, he liked the guy. He had never been bothered by his first kill as Itachi had once told him some wise words. It's kill or be killed in this world Naruto-kun. If you want to protect my precious little, you cannot hesitate at anything, not even killing, understood those words still held on, even after a decade. Those words and Itachi's emotion training made it so he didn't care. Even still, he was a child back then, so maybe it was a good thing that Itachi made him get ready for it by getting rabbits and having Naruto kill them. Naruto never understood the Ichiha's hatred of rabbits. Enough reminiscing, time to fight. Tsutsuki was the first one to fight. She got into her Ichiha interceptor fist and prepared herself to absolutely crush the bitch in front of her and take joy in it. That was the day Naruto saw his sadistic side. Done. I would and could have gone longer but decided against it as I still have to write the omic of their meetings with the dragons and phoenixes. It isn't the funny time, but the plot type. Anyways, the fights will be in the next chapter so prepare. Also, can you believe that I finished the above parts in two days? It was pretty goddamn lucky that it's Thanksgiving and I had no work to do over the break. Anyways, make time. Amic. When Satsuki met the phoenix, Satsuki had never expected to be transported to where the phoenix lived, she expected them to come to her, not be reversed and summoned, even though she didn't know what that meant. When the smoke that covered her disappeared, she was in a completely new area. There were large volcanoes all over the outskirts of the land. The sky was filled with many colored birds covered in fire. The ground had trees that seemed healthy along with light blue flowers all over. Suddenly, the Ichiha heiress felt hot, very hot. Sweat trailed down her body as she tried to look for the sense of heat. There, in front of her was a large phoenix. Who are you? Why is a human in our sacred lands? It growled out. I am, Satsuki Ichiha. I'm he are to ga in the ph enix on money contract, she painted out, the heat making it difficult to breathe. The phoenix lowered the heat it was excluding before introducing himself. I am Kayo, the leader of the summoning contract. To gain the summoning contract, you must go through two trials, succeed in each, and you will be deemed worthy of the contract. First, I must ask you how you found our contract as only the Yuzumaki have it. He asked. Alright, I'll prove myself worthy of the contract. As for how I found it, my best friend is a half Yuzumaki, and he had access to the summoning contracts. The busty woman replied. I also want to ask you one last question. Why have all the names for the Yuzumaki clan members disappeared from our contracts? All of us have met and no one from the Panthers to the Dragons have any summoners left. He told her. Tsutsuki wished with her eyes as she realized that they didn't know about the massacre of the Yuzumaki. Still though, she answered his question. The Yuzumaki clan was destroyed during the Second Great Shinobi War. Only a few members still exist though we don't know any of them. The Phoenix seemed dismayed, but he seemed to accept. He had probably concluded that they were dead a long time ago. Very well. Come with me and I shall lead you to your trial, he told her as he started to fly away. Tsutsuki was quick to follow him and started running after the large bird. Finally, she and the boss arrived at a cave. Go in and start your trial, he commanded her. She nodded and walked through the dark cave. As she walked around the cave, she lit her hand on fire, hoping to see something, but she was still surrounded by darkness. They walked further and further until eventually, she came to a pedestal. On it was a jar and inside them were two eyes. As she got a closer look at them, she froze. In front of her were pale purple eyes with four rings surrounding it. The Rinnegan. Before she could do anything else, she heard a voice behind her. Help me. 
The voice seemed to echo even though it was barely above a whisper. She turned around, only to see a five-year-old with cerulean eyes and a Yuzumaki clan symbol on his back. He was being held by the throat, a large man trying to strangle the young Naruto. When she turned around, she saw that the jar contained the legendary eyes. She quickly made her decision, her body reacting before she could do anything. She stabbed the man through the head from her lightning-covered kumasi before catching the little Naruto. He was crying in her lap as she held him, sobbing all over her shirt. Thank you pretty Nichan for saving me from that bad guy, he said, his eyes still filled with tears. Before she could reply to the chibi Naruto, she was surrounded by a white flash that teleported her into another place. The voice echoed through her head. You have passed the first test. Let's see how you do with the second and final test. The dark room she was in suddenly transformed into a large open area. Battle me. If you defeat me, I deem you worthy of the contract. If you lose, you will never be allowed to return, nor will you ever be able to use any summon contract. Tsutsuki spun around, trying to locate who said that and looked at the man in front of her. He had shoulder-length brown hair and bluish-green eyes. He wore red samurai armor that covered his shoulders and upper body. Underneath the armor was a black t-shirt and gray cargo pants. As she observed him, he attacked. He pulled his fist back and thrust it forward. To her surprise, a large ball of blue fire came from the thrust. All the flames were fast, she was faster. The Achiha heiress decided to fight fire with fire, literally, and shot forth a cane. Kakaku. The man didn't even bother to dodge as the large ball of fire hit him dead on. Tsutsuki narrowed her eyes. No way was he defeated that easily, he wouldn't be. She was proven right as she heard laughter coming from the ball as it dispersed. Foolish girl, fire doesn't hurt phoenixes. He exclaimed, his point being proved with no scratches on him. Tsutsuki tsked as she unsheathed her sword. She rushed forward and slashed at the man, only for him to jump over it and remain in the air, his phoenix wings on his back. Aya rocketed forward as he covered himself in fire. Tsutsuki was very glad that Naruto had let her copy some of his water right now. Tsutin Sir Yuiden. She exclaimed as a water dragon formed in the air, using the water under the stage. Ayo had to fly to the side so as to not be hit with the water, but he didn't see Satsuki coming at him from the side. Before he could realize, he had a Horatian seal placed on him and was stabbed through the stomach. Thankfully, being a phoenix gave him instant regeneration. He charged at the young girl in front of him, but she vanished in a black flash. While he was busy trying to sense her, she appeared below him, Manjekyo activated and ensnared him in a Jinjutsu. While he was busy trying to dispel it, he was busy putting explosive seals, chakra seals, and fire vulnerability seals all over him. Thank you for Cage Bunshin. When Kaio dispelled it, his opponent activated all the seals. The Phoenix Boss screamed out in pain as the explosives took him down. When he tried to send out his stronger attacks, he fell to his knee, the chakra exhaustion getting to him. Tsutsuki looked at him and declared herself the winner. Chapter 12 promotion. Everyone, aside from Sakura and Satsuki, jumped away from the area so the two could have their battle. Satsuki vs Sakura. How should I fuck with the bitch? Satsuki thought to herself as she stared at her opponent. She was too busy thinking that she didn't realize Sakura had gone in for the attack until she was right above her. Satsuki did a low backflip while kicking Sakura in her midsection, causing her to spit out a bit of saliva at the force. Sakura was quick to recover and grab Satsuki's leg. She landed and started to swing her around before throwing her straight up before jumping above Satsuki to deal a heavenly foot of pain to her stomach. They saw the girl above her and quickly created a bunch and before smokeless substituting with the air behind Sakura. The pink-haired woman delivered her kick at the clone below, only for her to pass through it. Confused at what happened, she stopped before realizing it was a bunch and trying to sense her opponent, she extended her senses. When she felt the Achiha, she turned above, only to have a katana coming towards her. The medic crossed her arms to minimize the damage, and her arm was slashed. There was a deep gash in her arm, not big or deep enough to seriously injure her, but it caused a lot of pain. You bitch. She yelled at her opponent as she held her arm in pain. Tsutsuki merely smirked before taunting her. Is that all you got, Waruno? She asked. Sakura yelled in rage as she used her right arm to deliver a good hook. Unfortunately, Tsutsuki blocked it with her sword before attacking. She summoned multiple cage bunch and before having them all thrown towards the airborne girl. They tried to block, but the gash in her left arm left her in pain and slower. She was hit straight in the stomach by multiple girls and was sent flying to the ground. She landed in a crouch before jumping back, just as a fireball hit where she once was. Sakura created a bunch of bunshin before trying to heal herself. The instant that she used her chakra for it, Satsuki released her. The large stream of fire flew towards her, causing her to jump out of the way. Oten. Durik and Sakura yelled as she slammed her hand against the rock. The earth was uprooted as many pieces of rock flew above ground level. These rocks quickly came together to form a muddy dragon that flew towards the airborne Achiha Eris. Tsutsuki rolled her eyes. 
It seemed that the screeching banshee forgot her second element nature. Right? Chidori Spear, the girl whispered as she released a straight beam of contained lightning, cutting straight through the dragon before it started to fall to pieces. Sakura gritted her teeth as she realized something. She couldn't use ninjutsu. Cursing the woman in front of her, she started to use tojutsu now that she was at ground level. Sakura rushed towards her opponent, but it seemed that Satsuki was finally getting serious. The smirk that had been etched into her face the whole disappeared as she scowled at the the 16-year-old punched the ground as hard as she could, unearthing it even more for visual cover. Then, she augmented her legs with chakra so she could speed up to levels she believed that the Achiha couldn't keep up with. Tsutsuki looked at the unearthed area and scowled to herself. The woman decided to use the attack to her advantage and, after activating her Sharingan, decided to disappear. As she raced to her opponent, she caught sight of her with her blood-colored eyes. Tsutsuki smirked as she realized that the Konoha Kanoichi was searching for her with no luck. Deciding that it was time to finish this, Satsuki used a variation of one of her old moves. She moved over to Sakura and stopped right in front of her. This caused a surprised woman to stop, giving the Achiha heiress her opening. Moving under her, Satsuki kicked her up to the sky before using the shadow of the dancing leaf to move behind her, but not before creating several clones. Not giving the bitch a chance to do anything, Satsuki had her clones attack her with a dropping axe kick. Sakura fell straight to the ground, gaining more speed with every kick until eventually, she received a lot of damage hitting the floor. Tsutsuki decided to make her win complete and used really fast for a quick torture. Tsutsuki's world. Weak version of Tsukuyomi. No cost. Sakura opened her eyes and was met with a sword slashing her against her stomach. Screaming in agony, she tried to pick her hand up to heal herself from the injury. She was unable to do so and realized her hands were chained to a cross. A sadistic chuckle vibrated through the area around her, causing Sakura to look around herself. A dark voice hissed at her from behind. How does it feel? Sakura whipped her head to look at her attacker, but saw nothing. Satsuki chuckled, a little happy at what was happening, before realizing that she couldn't traumatize Sakura unless she wanted to explain what happened, which she couldn't do as she didn't trust the Kanoha Shinobi, not even Sanadi. She decided for one last attack and slashed at Sakura's face and let her scream in pain for a bit before releasing the hat that she had named Mini Tsukuyomi. Winner. Satsuki Ichiha. Reality. In the real world, Sakura completely collapsed, unconscious and tired, but released a silent scream, full of pain. Good job Satsuki-san, you passed the first test, even though Sakura used an ninjutsu. Next is Asuma, Sanadi told her as a few abbey appeared and took her home. Upon hearing his name, Asuma Siratobi jumped to the clearing. Satsuki vs Asuma. Satsuki was trying to think of a plan. Right now, she has to beat Asuma in ninjutsu then Kurinai. She could beat Kurinai with ninjutsu and tojutsu since she was faster, but how did she deal with Asuma without showing her real strength? Alright, I can beat Kurinai with nin and tai. I don't know Asuma's technique. I guess I have to wait to see what he can do. I can use kenjutsu to beat him, but I don't want to show too much. How good is he she asked herself. I'll go with figuring him out first Satsuki thought to herself. The girl tried to think back to his bingo book record. Asuma Siratobi. A ranked. Approach with caution. Jonin of Konoha. Specializes in chakra blades and ninjutsu. One of the twelve guardian ninjas. And a few more things that weren't important. The young Achiha heiress got into the defensive form of the Achiha's tojutsu style. She also shifted her arms a little to show a fake opening that would lure him in. Asuma was a man who was very experienced in fighting. Once he saw the opening, he instinctively flew towards it to exploit it. He had previously gotten out his chakra blades and covered them with wind chakra. Tsutsuki saw the incoming attack and threw a few transformed clones at him. The clone flew right past without Asuma even moving. Asuma was suspicious of them and quickly took sunshine away from them. Damn it. The Achiha heiress thought to herself, seeing that her attack didn't work. Satsuki tried to think of a way to use the hand, after a few moments, smirked. The veteran missed the smirk and decided to use it to cover himself and trap her. Quickly placing a flint in between his teeth, Asuma released his pain. Ash pile burning. He yelled as he released chakra-infused gunpowder from his mouth into the air. The gunpowder was expanded by the oxygen in the air until it covered Satsuki and a lot of area around her. Satsuki saw and knew the attack and let it go on. When it had finally finished, she had substituted with the kunai smokelessly. Asuma didn't see the substitution, and right when he was about to ignite the attack, he was kicked into it. Unfortunately, the man jumped too late as Satsuki had already ignited the gunpowder. Fortunately for the man, he knew the weakness of the attack and threw an explosive that ignited the gunpowder near him so Satsuki's ignition wouldn't get to him. Satsuki had a different plan than that, and so, she sent Siratobi and used the shadow of the dancing leaf to get behind him without his notice. Veteran Shinobi had a sixth sense of when people were near them. Asuma was one of them and knew she was there. 
This helped him as he himself used the shadow of the dancing leaf to get behind the bustier chair. He then coated his chakra blades with wind chakra, imagining two pieces grinding together to make them sharper. He wasn't trying to kill her so it was a weak one. Too bad that it still made sound. Hearing the blades and deducing who was there, she summoned a smokeless clone that quickly grabbed him. It took him by surprise and slowed his reaction down. The Achiha Eris clone took this opportunity to throw the man down before she used a technique she had been given permission to copy by Naruto. Dutin. Great breakthrough. She mentally yelled as she thrust her arms forward, creating a giant gust of wind to help the original. Tsutsuki dispelled her clone and waited for Asuma to counter with a wind attack. Just like she expected, the man did the same as her, though he actually didn't know that she did and he shouted out. They smirked before releasing her first. Pain. Grand fireball. She yelled out as she took a deep breath before releasing a crimson red ball of fire. The ball itself was large enough, but when it hit the two clashing wind justice, it expanded till it was the size of the Hokage Tower. Asuma just looked at the incoming with dread, having nothing to counter it and being too slow to dodge, even with Shunshin. After all, Shunshin wasn't a teleportation, but a technique that allowed you to move at very fast speeds. A downside was that it gave you tunnel vision, but it was only for a moment. It was one of the reasons no shinobi had ever used it to get close to someone in a fight. Well, Shisui Ichiha had, but the guy was a prodigy and had the Sharingan to counter the tunnel vision. Fuck. Was his last thought as he realized that he just lost to a 16-year-old. Thankfully for Asuma, an Anbu member had taken Asuma out of the way. Winner. Satsuki Ichiha. As soon as the fireball dissipated, Sanadi went forward to check on the two. After healing Asuma's and Satsuki's minor injuries, she started the next fight. Satsuki vs Kurenai. Kurenai used Shunshin to move to the battlefield. She was quick to perform a triple layered one that was not very visible. Unfortunately for Kurenai, Satsuki knew who she was and had activated her Sharingan to counter the. These eyes instantly allowed Satsuki to locate and dispel the illusion that had been weaved without her notice. She then created herself, one that Kurenai quickly broke out of. Both quickly realized that they were getting nowhere and decided to get on with something else. Fortunately for Kurenai, Satsuki had wanted to hide her true skills, so she made herself look tired and exhausted. It helped Kurenai out a lot when she charged towards Satsuki to fight. The two engaged in a fight of Tejutsu and, well, Kurenai also used Jinjutsu, while Satsuki used Ninjutsu. Kurenai threw forward a kick, but used it to disguise it as a punch. Satsuki had deflected the attack with her arms and delivered a 90-degree kick to Kurenai's head. The red-eyed woman ducked under it while spinning around to deal a kick to Satsuki's abdominal area. Satsuki quickly thought of a plan and smirked as she let herself get hit high up into the area. High above, Satsuki created a few clones and had them throw her towards Kurenai at high speeds while increasing the velocity by spinning. The clones copied her movements before they all covered themselves with a thin sheet of fire. Meteor Dash Driver. Satsuki yelled to herself as the large bullets of fire that looked like meteors flew towards the ground. Kurenai jumped back to dodge the destructive technique only to get kicked in the back and sent flying towards the Kurenai hadn't seen Satsuki create a clone and substitute with it while in the sky. Kurenai flew towards the dashing meteors with a look of dread on her face. She couldn't think rationally enough to even substitute with something. Fortunately for the mistress, she was saved by an Anbu member, one who was thankfully a female. Winner. Satsuki Ichiha. Once Kurenai had been looked over, Tsunade came forth with a Jounin vest, with a few obvious differences. Satsuki Ichiha, you have proven yourself to have the skills required to become a Takibetsu Jonin. Your skills surpass this rank, but you do not have the experience to become a full Jonin of Konoha. You must prove your ability to lead as well as gain enough experience to earn the title of Jonin, Tsunade formally told the future wife of her godson. The Ichiha woman nodded respectfully to her and was handed the vest. She decided to customize it later to her style if she didn't decide to not wear it at all. Naruto Uzumaki, you are next to be tested on whether or not you shall become a Takibetsu Jonin. Step up to battle to prove your worth, Tsunade said with an inward snort. She knew that Naruto was one of the strongest shinobi here, not the strongest, at least in her mind, but still one of them. The blonde Hokage had no doubt that he had the skills and power to become an Anbu already, if not higher. Naruto vs Niji. Naruto and Niji took their place in the training ground. It's nice to see you again, Naruto, Niji greeted the blonde. No, no, pleasure is all mine, Naruto said back casually. He didn't want these people to get suspicious of him. How Satsuki acted was natural to her, but he had to act a bit like his old self, but more mature and less childish. Niji suddenly went on the attack, grabbing a few from his pouch before throwing them towards the blonde. Naruto easily saw the true meaning behind them and, with his decade of experience in shuriken kunais, threw his own with such precision that they turned around Niji's with a higher speed and kept his own going in the same direction, albeit less speed. 
Naruto's also had explosive seals on them, more powerful than normal, so when he detonated them, they also detonated Niji's. Niji finally decided to get serious. By Akigen. He whispered as his wide eyes suddenly bulged with veins showing around his eyes. The Hayuga had activated just in time to see another blonde behind him, a Rasengan in hand. The brunette was quick to use a jab to destroy the clone behind him. Naruto had learned something in his fight with Niji nearly three and a half years ago. The Byakugan gave the perfect 359 degree vision with a small blind spot right behind them. What many people did not, however, realize was that it had another blind spot. You see, the Byakugan have 359 degree vision within the same elevation level as them, excluding the peripheral vision that gives them a small direction upwards and downwards. They could not see things in a spherical direction, but a circular cylindrical direction. This meant that unless they looked straight up or down during a fight, they wouldn't see you if you were there. He had used this to knock Niji out in the Chunin exams. Now, two clones were high above in the sky, ready to defeat Niji. One created a Rasengan in his hand while the other grabbed his legs. Swinging his fellow clone upwards, clone two suddenly jerked him downwards. Clone one was going downward at high speeds, spinning to make his velocity and the Rasengan stronger. Unfortunately for Naruto, Niji had also realized the blind spot three and a half years ago and had tried countless ways to counter it until he finally came to a solution. Ninjas had usually developed a sixth sense to literally sense when people were hostile to them. In battle, everyone was hostile to someone, even if they were husband and wife who loved each other, more than anything else they loved combined and cubed many times over. Even if it was barely there, it was always there. It was a fact of life. It was as true as the sun rising in the eastward direction and setting in the western direction. Niji had tried to develop the sense so that it had a wider range than normal experienced shinobi did. His range was enough to cover roughly 20 meters in any direction. As such, when his blonde opponent came rocketing down to hit him, he had already used Shunshin to move away from the blonde. Unfortunately for the blonde clone, he couldn't stop and dispelled as he hit the ground. He had lost concentration on the ball of ninja energy, so when he made contact, it created a small explosion of white smoke as it spread the dispelled clone smoke. That could have killed me, the Byakugan user deadpanned at Naruto. He wasn't even sure if the man he considered a friend was trying to kill him or not. It was weakened. Besides, I was confident you would dodge. A lie. He wasn't actually sure how Niji had dodged. He had made the Rasengan weaker than normal, so if it had hit, Sanadi would be able to heal him with a bit of effort though. I'm glad you had such confidence in me, Niji deadpanned. Naruto just waved it off before grinning at the man. He's stronger than I expected him to be. Too bad that he became so loyal to Hinata and the Hyuga clan. He would have been useful in Yuzu Naruto thought to himself. Honestly, Naruto didn't need a lot of help wiping Kanahagakur off the face of the elemental nations. It was one of the reasons he had created his most powerful weapon in his arsenal. Futon. Big Bang Rasen Shuriken. A variation of Futon. Rasen Shuriken that, instead of causing a lot of damage with a high area splash splash damage, was more focused on creating a large area explosion that was laced with weak wind blades. If he could use multiple ones at a time, he would destroy Kanoha, but that wasn't what he wanted. He wanted to destroy, not the village, but the people. Kanoha was its people, just like a kingdom was its people, not the land itself. They had destroyed him too much to get such an easy death. No, Naruto wanted to burn this village down and watch as they all got what they deserved. Now, Naruto wasn't a heartless monster, nor was he a saint and bleeding heart. He did what he wanted, but he wasn't a sadistic monster. He would only torture those that had hurt him, a feat easily done using his photographic memory. He would not torture the innocents, but he would still kill them. He wasn't stupid. What if the kids or innocents tried to get revenge? It would be rather bothersome to kill thousands of people who would have trained their asses off to kill him. He wasn't a saint, it didn't matter to him if he killed others. The only things he cared about was his clan, precious people, and most importantly, Satsuki. I should probably defeat him Naruto thought to himself as he witnessed Niji destroy even more of his clones. Right now, he had just created thousands of clones to wear him down, whether it was physically or chakra-wise didn't matter. After an hour or so, Niji was finally exhausted enough and the Naruto clones knocked him out. It was a weird way, but not many people could take such an onslaught without either having a mass killing or something else, especially not Niji, who used purely to jutsu with a few Hyuga. Neither would really help him against thousands of clones, even if they only took one hit to end. Winner. Naruto Uzumaki. After force-feeding Niji a soldier pill to replenish his chakra, Niji was taken away to the hospital for rest. After that Kakashi went up to test his sensei father figure and his mother figure's son. Naruto vs Kakashi. Many of the people knew that Kakashi was one of, if not the, strongest shinobi in Konoha. Kakashi himself knew the opposite. There were three people, maybe four, people in Konoha right now that could defeat him. Naruto Uzumaki, Satsuki Uchiha, Might Guy, and maybe Tsunade. 
Naruto, Satsuki, and Guy were far too fast for him, even now. If Guy were to go into any of his gates past the fourth, Kakashi would be defeated. If, hypothetically, he used Kamui on any of them, not that he ever likely would, they would be too fast for him to even do so. Maybe if he could outlast them, something he probably couldn't do with Naruto or Guy, he would be able to when they weren't able to move. Tsunade would depend on the situation. She could hide from him with all her skills, even though she wasn't faster. Kakashi wasn't a sensor, and if she used the surroundings to hide, he might not catch her. While he didn't know it, Kamui sent others to another dimension. Naruto and Satsuki could Horation back, something he didn't know they could do. So anyways, while Naruto was stronger, there was no way in hell he would let his little brother figure win this match easily. Kakashi put away Icha Icha and got into his board stance. Kakashi was going to be patient and try to learn about Naruto's technique and how much stronger he was. Naruto blurred through the clearing, creating a few clones. Every clone threw a kunai at him. Kakashi hadn't been lazy and had analyzed the battle earlier. He knew what they were for and so, just like his student had, the silver-haired man threw his own, knocking them back. He didn't expect to see his kunai knocked off course by a wind and had to quickly recover from the slight shock as he jumped away from the multi-sided blades. Naruto and his clones all jumped towards Kakashi, who also created a few clones to match them. His fellow shinobi apparently wanted to use ninjutsu now. Well alright, let's see how he handled it. Suiten. Suryuden. He yelled in his mind as he created a large water dragon. Kakashi quickly went through many hand signs as he let loose his own water dragon. Both dragons roared with power as they rushed each other, trying to destroy its counterpart. Naruto clocked his teeth in annoyance as his dragon was stopped. Oh well he thought to himself as he ran past the two water creatures. Kakashi met him in the middle, and they both clashed against each other as their kunai sword created flint. Metal hit metal before both decided to abandon it in favor of a tojutsu fight. Page Bunch and Naruto thought to himself as he created a few shadow clones next to him. The clones instantly knew what to do and jumped forward to Kakashi, ready to use the Bunch and Daibakuha. Kakashi knew there were very few things you could do with clones alone and realized the most likely possibility was the exploding clones won. He decided not to waste energy and just sent them, sending them up in a puff of white smoke. Done. Naruto thought to himself with a grin. Kakashi saw his students grin and grew suspicious. He reacted a little late to Naruto's kick and was sent flying to a place where he noticed a clone slapping him with a seal. He reacted too late however, as he was paralyzed and kneeled. Paralysis seal. Kakashi asked. Naruto nodded to his father's student. He had had a clone drawing one the entire time fighting and had stalled for it. He had needed one that was more advanced, so it would also stop chakra usage for a bit. He didn't need Kakashi to escape after all. Winner. Nerd. Kakashi disappeared in a poof of smoke, causing Naruto to let out a loud fucking damn it. Before running towards his brother figure's chakra signature. Chapter 13. Back to wave. Naruto rushed through the small forest of the training ground. He had just sent out a pulse of chakra to sense his older brother figure and was now heading towards him. Once he came within a 20 meter distance, he stopped himself. He sent out a few clones to look for traps while he himself stayed on alert, ready to defend if necessary. His clones found some of the traps, an explosive tree, a trigger for kunai, and a few more things. Kakashi looked down from his place in the trees. He couldn't hide much longer as his students' clones blasted from tree to tree, searching for him. Deciding to use the element of surprise, Kakashi jumped behind Naruto, a kunai ready in his hand. He quickly places it at his student's throat, slightly digging to his neck. A job, sensei, Naruto whispered with a smirk before he blew up. Kakashi had jumped back the moment he had heard his first two words, the explosion propelling him even higher. The jutsu Kakashi thought to himself. Naruto rushed to his brother figure, ready to deliver a double phoenix punch. Kakashi used his momentum to grab his fists and pull his knees out. The blonde shinobi stuck his leg out and pushed against the knee, doing a backflip to kick Kakashi's chin. The silver-haired man dodged the kick before using the shinobi's momentum to put him on the ground, a leg on his back and his arms in a lock. I win, Kakashi, someone hissed in his ears as a blade was held against his throat. The cyclopean ninja eye smiled before dissolving into water. Wrong Naruto, I win, he whispered to the blonde. Naruto smirked before he exploded in a shower of sharp wind blades. Kakashi had cuts appear on his arms, shallow cuts before he too exploded in a shower of smoke. Using the smoke to his advantage, Naruto looked for Kakashi before using a he had learned not too long ago. He started to go through the necessary hand seals since he hadn't mastered them yet. Suiten. Bakusui shma, he yelled as he released a large wave of water. The attack was meant to clear out the trees and root out Kakashi. It seemed to work as Kakashi appeared on the wave. The Kanoha shinobi quickly went through the hand seals before dubbing his hands into the water. Gibashi. He yelled. Water did not conduct electricity, but that was only true for pure water. 
when the water had minerals such as rocks in them, they would conduct it within the water. When Naruto had released the attack, a lot of dust and dirt had been collected. The electricity traveled quickly through the water, hoping to shock Naruto. The teenager knew the meaning of the attack and decided to stop it. He unsheathed his blade, secretly creating a cage bunshin nearby, before jumping high above the sky. Bakashi focused on the one above him, not seeing a clone swimming towards him, unaffected by electricity. The original Naruto smirked as he saw his clone slide in from behind and made his next move. Shinken. Naruto shouted, distracting Kakashi's focus with a simple attack. Bakashi was about to counter the attack with a Gakaku, but felt something being slapped on his back. He turned around, only to see a clone with a ram seal. Knowing what the hand seal was for, he jumped away. Shinken cut the surface of the water but fizzled out not much later. Bakashi tried to charge at his student, but froze. He stopped moving and started to descend to the ground. What? Kakashi asked, trying to figure out what happened so that he could counter it or destroy it. Wait seal, Naruto smirked, lying through his teeth. It was a paralysis seal, but he didn't need to know that. Bakashi tried to think of a way to get out, but was stopped by a kunai to his throat. I won, Naruto commented. Winner. Naruto Uzumaki. Naruto vs Hanada. Hanada had become very good at it. Kurinai was the best user in Konoha. While not as great as someone like Itachi Uchiha, she was the best in Konoha. Kurinai was much better at using than any other art. She was still good with Tejutsu and Ninjutsu, but she excelled in Jinjutsu. Hence, she taught her students, but with Kiba's horrible control and Shino's constant use of his insects, she couldn't teach them much. While she didn't neglect them, she focused on Hinata more, due to her perfect control and willingness to use them. During the three years after Naruto had left the village, Hinata had become more moody, angry, and started to dislike everyone, mostly the villagers. Hinata had become less shy, more confident. She agreed to dislike her clan's way, although not stating it out loud. She was ignored, even as the heiress, so she was free from the Hyuga's normal tradition, which she considered stupid. After all, what if someone found the Byakugan's weakness or was too fast to catch and used long-range ninjutsu? They would be useless. That's why she had gone to a little bit of ninjutsu. She had improved her tojutsu massively. After figuring out why she was bad at using the normal jayakin, she improved it. As it turned out, she was far too flexible for the stationary gentle fist to work. Using this flexibility, she created a new type of jayakin. She had taken the next two years, training for at least a few hours, to master it. She had even gotten as far as using 8 trigrams. 128 palms. After training in both, she had tried to combine the two, using a gen tai jayakin. This helped her very much, using it to distract opponents while she got close. That was not the attack she used on Naruto though. She, after all, loved him and wouldn't attack him just to hinder him. Why should she hurt him when she didn't have to? The Monica illusion. False surroundings technique, she muttered to herself, secretly doing the hand seals behind her back. Naruto was entrapped straight away, not recognizing it as nothing had changed. Naruto, I trapped you in a I want to talk to you. Please. She said in a soft tone. Her stuttering had disappeared a couple years ago. You know. Someone once told me that people could talk to each other through battle, Naruto told her. While he didn't dislike her, he didn't like her either. I don't want to battle you. I love you her desperate cry was interrupted by him. Hinata. I know you have a crush on me. I don't feel the same way. I like you and all, a white lie she didn't need to know. But my feelings aren't like that. I already love someone else. He yelled at her. Hinata gritted her teeth. She knew who he liked already. He hadn't made it subtle when he had only talked to Satsuki and no one else. She had st observed him yesterday. She had done it from far away, but she had seen their interactions. While she couldn't hear them, their body language and facial expression showed that Naruto liked Satsuki. She wanted to desperately break them apart, make them hate each other, but she couldn't, wouldn't, do that to Naruto. Loving someone was to keep him happy right. She would let him be happy with a woman, even if it meant that her heart would be shattered into pieces. Anata rushed forward. She should probably get this started. It didn't matter as she already knew she would lose. Naruto quickly disrupted his chakra to escape the illusion. He needed to be on constant alert now that he knew she could and would use it. Anada was on Naruto instantly. She threw a jab at his left, creating an unnoticeable when he dodged. Naruto instantly flared his chakra when he realized that foreign chakra was in his system. Anada went on the defense as Naruto charged at her. Using the Yuzukan was a good move as it allowed him to stay out of range enough that she couldn't block him, but he could still hit her. Hinata was quick to counter the attacks, using her own creation, Gentle Step. Twin Lion Fist. The attack let her block his attacks, slightly increase her range, and attack, all at the same time. She flew backward, trying to think of a plan. Bad choice. She was suddenly kicked in the back, straight towards the blonde. Naruto smirked as he rushed towards her. He rushed through a few hand seals before blowing out a large gust of wave. 
Inada, having seen him doing the hand signs and molding the chakra, used her arms in front of her to redirect the winds. The wind flew past her, but it did nothing to help her as the lion heads on her arms had made her temporarily blind. Naruto rushed forward, grabbed her by the shoulder, swung himself behind her, and placed a kunai at her throat in an instant. Inada tried to think of a way to escape, but Naruto didn't seem to want to give her the chance. He pushed the blade slightly deeper, freeing the crimson liquid running down her neck. She sighed as she gave up. Winner. Naruto Uzumaki. After their promotion, Satsuki and Naruto were dragged by their classmates to a barbeck. Fu, Sajetsu, Jugo, and Karen were also dragged along. Why did you guys leave? Ino asked. She had long outgrown her stupid crush on Sasuke, so while well the gender had confused and shocked her, it hadn't had much of an effect. Satsuki and Naruto had already discussed this too. It didn't matter if they showed their personality, at least a bit, to these people. Why not have fun and let loose? Secret, Naruto smirked. Ino gained a twitch in her eye as she glowered at him. Shikamaru could see where this was going and sighed. Ino, if he doesn't want to tell us, don't make him troublesome blonde. He sighed again as the purple-wearing girl turned her glare towards him. Ugh. Fine. But tell us who the other four are, she growled out. Satsuki just looked amused at her predicament before shrugging. Couldn't really hurt, right? Fu, Sajetsu, Karen, and Jugo. Fu is a friend outside the village we met. A white lie. They had made up a backstory for their teammates. Jugo is her brother. They were both genin of Taki, and they decided to come with us after we helped them out, she told them. It wasn't a complete lie, not that she cared about lying to them. The two had helped Jugo and Fu, and both decided to follow them, but not for that reason. Fu was a genin of Taki. They both had orange eyes, though a slight difference, so siblings could work, especially with their rare hair color. Karen is in Yuzumaki, my family, Naruto continued. He would follow his friend's lead, but wouldn't divulge much info. Sajetsu was a friend we made in Wave, he finished. Ino seemed satisfied, if only a little, at the answer. The waiter brought them the grill as well as the meat for them at that time. While quickly grilling and eating piece by piece, Naruto asked his own question. So what have you guys been up to? The others had changed a lot during the three years. Apparently, Ino had moved on from Sasuke. She seemed to be more interested in Shikamaru now from what Satsuki could see. She didn't really care about the chemistry between them. Their lives were theirs alone, not a concern. Shikamaru seemed to be the same as before, if not less lazy. He was good with Shogi, beating both her and Naruto, although she had almost won. Tauji had seemed to get stronger and seemed to grow more mature. He was no longer offended if other people called him fat. I don't care if other people call me fat. They don't know me, so why should I care? That was what he had said. That had given him a bit of respect from the Ichiha heiress. Niji had become calmer than what she had seen before. He had left behind the fate shit he kept sprouting before. He was seen as the strongest of the Kanoha Ten at the time, having apparently become Jonin. Denton was someone she hadn't interacted with before, nor was she very strong, so Satsuki's interest in her was little. Inada had changed the most. No longer was she a shy, stuttering, meek girl. She had grown confident, a lot like Satsuki herself, although still different. Kinder, nicer, more smiley and all that. She seemed like a good potential friend, even if she would die in the end. Hiba was the same as before, brash, confident, borderline arrogant, and insulting as ever. Satsuki grinned a little statistically as she remembered how she had beaten Kiba after he had tried to make a move on her. Shino was the same as before. Sakura had not been there, understandable as she seemed to have grown a large hatred of Team 7, not that anyone in the team had cared. Naruto hated the bitch for who knows what. Satsuki hated her for her patheticness, uselessness, and overall personality. She had constantly annoyed her fake persona a little too much. The pink banshee was a disgusting disgrace to all Kanoichi who were serious about their lives. Sakura had remained all the same, just stronger, just a tiny bit. Lee had remained the same. He had shouted about how youthful she seemed. It would have been taken the wrong way if he hadn't been smitten with Sakura and was just Lee. Now, here she was, witnessing a fight between Lee and Naruto. Naruto winced as he held his shoulder in pain. Perrin slapped the hand away as she laughed at him. She still couldn't believe the fight between the green-wearing guy and her cousin. It was hilarious. Shut up. It's not funny. He yelled at his laughing cousin as she dislocated his shoulder. It wasn't his fault that he had accidentally got Lee drunk. Lee was already strong and fast, but he was apparently a natural with a drunken fist. Only with his gravity and paralysis seal was he able to hold the bastard down. Unfortunately, it cost him a shoulder and a lot of bruises that would thankfully be healed by Karen. Fortunately, the property damage had been relatively low, something he could easily pay off with the reward he and Satsuki had gotten for Rachimaru's bounty. Yes, it is. Karen roared out in laughter as she moved on to the next bruise. She had learned medical ninjutsu when she had gotten tired of having people bite her when she was younger. 
After a few days, Anbu came to the Ichiha Estates. Akubetsu Jonin and Ichiha and Yuzumaki are to report to Hokage-sama by 800 hours, he told them before shunshining off. The other members hadn't been promoted beyond Genin since they had no field achievements, nor had they participated in the exams. They had been getting C-rank missions from Sanadi since she acknowledged that they were powerful in their own rights. Dean Yuzu didn't have a Jonin sensei for some reason that they couldn't remember. It was currently 7.30, so they had some time, but they didn't want to be late, so they left straight away. Tsunade was sitting on her desk, downing some sake. Shizun hadn't hidden all of it. Off to her side, a few cage bunchen were doing the paperwork. Hey, Bachan. A familiar voice greeted as two swirls of wind and fire appeared in the middle of her office. Hey, rat. She grinned as she sat her sake down. Naruto just smiled at her, silently asking why he was asked here. She suddenly got a serious face as she ordered her to leave. She reached into one of her drawers and threw a book at her fellow blonde. What is this? The diary was only for the Hokage. They were the only ones who could open it. The seal on it made it so it would record everything outside and would only allow it to be opened by the person acknowledged as Hokage. Anyone who was registered onto the Kanoha barrier was counted as a potential. Voice recognition, chakra, and a few other things were used to identify the one who held it. If the Hokage left it open, however, anyone could access it. Infused, the two opened the diary to the marked page and widened their eyes at what was recorded. Itachi continues to teach Naruto. It seems he's growing fond of the boy. Good. It will keep him loyal to the village, more than his parents. Training in Tajutsu form will help the boy. It continued with different entries of what Itachi trained Naruto in, although mostly the same. The next entry made Satsuki freeze. Makoto is once again trying to adopt the weapon. Unfortunately, her life has been reduced like this because of Kashina. It doesn't seem as though she is a part of the coup, but she must be killed. I can't have Naruto know about his parents, especially not Kashina. Naruto stopped reading as he felt the woman he loved suddenly release a large amount of Kai. Hachan. Was killed. Because of. Naruto-kun. She thought to herself. No. She just wanted to help him. The bastard killed her, not Naruto-kun. She finalized. This did nothing to settle down her killing intent. The bastard had killed her mother just because she cared about Naruto. Naruto laid a hand on her shoulder, shooting his chakra through her. It seemed that she got the message as she responded with hers. Finally, her killing intent was lifted. Tsunade raised her eyebrows. What had gotten her so pissed? Yes, I should have read the whole thing she thought to herself. What about it? The blonde asked. Hookah's being released. Naruto asked. Tsunade nodded. She had personally gone through the paperwork for the release of the woman. Naruto was very fortunate that he had friends in high places. He had Konoha under his control through Tsunade, as long as it wasn't suspicious. He was best friends with the Kazakiage. His teacher, his first one, was a trusted member of the Akatsuki. Unfortunately, she was classified as a slave. While Naruto and the others wouldn't treat her as such, she was still a prisoner. Since she had no village loyalties, she couldn't be exchanged, and since Naruto was the only one who had tried to get her so far, she belonged to him. Ifuka, this didn't really affect her much. Just because she was classified as something didn't mean that was who she was. If she was said to be a slut due to her body, did that mean she was? No. Just because she was classified as a slave didn't mean she was one, nor would she be treated as one. It was all for formalities. A mission to wave? Naruto asked. Tsunade nodded. Zuro, the daimyo, has reported that bandits have been spotted near the edges of wave, Tsunade said. He has requested Jonin Shinobi for a high air rank mission. I am sending you due to your previous excursions there. The rest of your mission is within the scroll, Tsunade said as she threw a scroll at the two. Naruto and Satsuki nodded as they both disappeared in a shunshin. They soon appeared in the Ichiha complex. They could see Fu and Karen inside the house. Karen had been getting to know her family member Fuka, while Fu had been hanging out with the only person besides Naruto and Satsuki that she felt most comfortable with. Sajetsu and Jugo had gone off with a team of Genin to eliminate a bandit camp near Kashu, the capital city of Fire Country. Karen, Fu, we're going on a mission, K. Naruto informed them. The two just distractedly nodded as the two packed for a week long trip. Satsuki was suspicious when Tsunade had stated what she said as an air rank. Air ranks were much higher than just elimination of a bandit camp. That would normally consist of a C rank. The bandits were most likely a ninja bandit camp. Even so, unless there were multiple jonin level ninjas, it should only be considered a medium B rank. Even with jonin, it would still be a low air rank. This was classified as a high air rank. When she had left the complex, she had snatched the scroll from Naruto. Mission details. A group of bandits made up of missing men have taken residence in the northwest coast of Wave Country. Mitsumi, daughter of Zuro, has been captured while within Wave. Suspicions have been on the bandits due to having been seen with close proximity with Mitsumi. Type. 
Mass Assassination Search and Rescue Location Northwest Coast of Wave Country Multiple locations spread out Pound Around 250 bandits Priority Priority is to search for Natsumi Bishop Age 19 Brief description Long blonde hair, usually tied in a ponytail Gray eyes Known threats Threats identified by spies in Wave or Jumi of Awagakur, Aaron of Kumagakur, and Melissa of Sugi Village as she continued to read the scroll, she quickly realized the reason for the high ranking. Apparently, a pseudo-princess had likely been captured by bandits with high-level missing men. Um, it seems like we're rescuing a princess from missing men, Satsuki hummed with amusement. Naruto rolled his eyes at her, knowing the reason behind it. When he was younger and in his dead last persona, he had asked Kakashi if they were going to rescue princess, fight evil ninja, etc. They approached the gates and looked at the gate guards, Izumo and Katetsu, two retired Anbu. Not many below Jonin knew this, but all guards in Kanoha gates were. After all, the village should be protected and who better than the elites among elites. Chunin would never be appointed to such an important job. They were responsible for mission leaves and returns reports, recorded all ninjas, called their previous peers for interrogation and greetings of important people. They had much more jobs than just that though. Akubetsu Jonin Yuzumaki and Ichiha leaving on mission A54067. Mission accomplishment expected in a week, Naruto stated formally. The two nodded before signing them, taking a few minutes. Satsuki inwardly smiled. It was her turn to lead this time. As they quickly jumped to the trees in the surrounding forest, she thought of a basic plan. MMM, she hummed. Get to the daimyos and get all the information they have. Be respectful, she ordered before speeding up, enjoying the wind breezing through her face. Naruto rolled his eyes as he followed her. An hour later, they arrived at a large bridge. As they got closer, they could read the inscriptions on a plate that was melted onto the bridge. The Great Naruto Bridge. Naruto asked in confusion, wondering why people had named a bridge after him. HN, probably cause you encourage the little kid to rally up the villagers, Satsuki grunted. Naruto just grinned at her before walking across the bridge, his friend scowling in front of him. Satsuki slightly frowned as she looked around the town. The last time she had been here, the raven-haired teenager had seen little kids, much younger than her, begging for food or money, sick and homeless, malnourished, all because of Gato. Back then, and even now, she didn't care much, but it slightly reminded her of Naruto. It was almost the same now. She could see the men of the village having to work, women were being sexually harassed. Satsuki scowled deeply as a bandit tried to rape a woman. She despised many things in the world, although she tolerated them as well, but rape. She picked up two small pebbles from the ground before waving her hand, invisible to all. The small rocks flew from her hand and into the man's source of ocular vision. Usually a non-lethal point, but Satsuki had been the one to attack him. The rocks she had thrown had gone at much higher speeds than when people jabbed others' eyes. The man released a chilling scream of pain as he held his eyes, letting the woman fall to the ground. The others were shocked at what had happened, but looked around to see who had done it. Unfortunately for them, the woman savior had left after effectively blinding and probably killing the man. The small pebbles had become embedded into his head, not quite reaching it, but causing a large amount of pain, just like she wanted. Naruto and his fellow Jonin had separated as soon as they got to the other side of the bridge. Satsuki had been sent to Zuro to get the information they needed, since she had led this time. Naruto himself had gone to visit Tazuna to ask a favor. Tsunade had written a letter for him, trying to convince him to start trading with another hidden village in a few months. Sometimes, he was glad his godmother was good with politics and diplomacy, something he had never cared for, no matter how much Itachi, Kakashi, Iruka, or Jiraiya said it was important. He simply wasn't interested and cared for it, but for Yuzushi Agakur to run, it needed not just a strong and smart leader, but diplomatic as well, at least a little bit. Thankfully, Fuka seemed to know about it and had told him that she would teach him, along with Tsunade, even though they didn't like each other. Fuka had apparently been a counselor in Kiri. Better. She will be a strong asset to protect the great Kai, an old man said, as two armored men rose from their bound position. Chapter 14. Assassination. Reading Daimyo-sama, Satsuki greeted as she nodded her head in acknowledgement. Zuro was a short man, standing at about 4'10". He had short flat white hair that jutted towards the sides with an occasional bang standing upwards. He had light green eyes and a small, hopeful look on his face as his gaze stood at her. He had a colorful but darkly shaded kimono on, covering everything from his shoulders to his ankles. His feet bore shinobi sandals. Hello Ichiha-san, I assume you are here to request details of your objective? He questioned. The dark-haired woman nodded her head in confirmation. The leader of Wave reached out to his side, clutching three scrolls that the onyx-eyed woman noticed earlier. He gave it to a servant who was near him, silently ordering the man to give the document to the mercenary. The heiress accepted all the scrolls before she quickly went through a few hand seals with her left hand and placed it on each scroll. 
Satisfied with the knowledge that the scrolls weren't booby-trapped, she bowed to the man and left the mansion. He knocked softly on the wooden door to the bridge builder's house. Soon, the door was opened by a young child, a few years younger than himself. The eleven-year-old looked up at the man in front of him, squashing the fear that had grown within him as he immediately assumed the man was a bandit. Subtly placing one hand behind him, grabbing one of the few kunai that Naruto had left behind after he had trained the kid a little to protect his mother while waiting for the completion of the bridge. The Nari examined the man in front of him, feeling familiarity within as he observed the man in front of him. Suspicious of who the person might be, he looked into the man's blue eyes, recognizing the image, and a small smile graced his lips. Naruto Nai-chan. The boy grinned as he threw himself at his mentor, even if it wasn't for that long. Naruto. Tazuna came forward, recognizing the brat from so long ago and raised an eyebrow. What are you doing around here? Are you here to get rid of the bandits? He asked with a hopeful tone. A few months or so ago, the village had been attacked by an organized rally of bandits under the command of what appeared to be three people, two women, and one man. The adults of the village had tried to repel the subjection of the raiders, but they were untrained men and women up against trained men and women. They were outweaponed, outnumbered, and outmatched, but under the fear that their freedom would be suppressed like it had been years ago, they had attempted to retaliate against the attackers. The villagers had wasted their efforts as the bandits had attacked. The defeat had been swift and organized, ending within a few hours. Now, they were all subjected to the rule of the bandits. Some of the people had tried to escape or get help, but were quickly and publicly executed, setting an example and showing the supremacy of the mercenaries. Now, they couldn't do anything but helplessly live through the rule as the men had to heavy labor, ate very little, slept little, and were sometimes even killed for the sadistic pleasure of some sick fucks. Some were even raped by the willing bandits. The women were treated the same way, being subjected to the same conditions as the men, but were also forced to have sex with the marauders. Some were raped so much that a few women had committed suicide, some had literally cried to death, some killed for actions against the tyrants. The Zuna's bridge had been taken over by bandits that wore citizen clothes, obvious to ninjas like Naruto and Satsuki, but normal citizens remained oblivious. No word had gotten out of the small nation. No one was allowed to leave the island with any method. The ship traders were restricted to the ship only when visiting any foreign island with parts of the tyrants always observing them. Merchants were half bandits that never left the other half out of their sight, no matter the area they went to. Three figures rushed through the trees, the darkness of night covered them perfectly, giving them night invisibility. Finally, after a few minutes of travel, all of them landed on a single branch, crouched down, observing the small mansion below them, a few hundred feet away. Mido, take left, I'll take right, Sira, take up, Khan will take care of the info and transformation, the one on the right ordered. Mido, a blue-haired woman, nodded as her only response before she vanished into the air, returning to sight on the roof of the mansion. She quickly, silently, ran to the edge before looking over, confirming the location of a window. Grabbing onto the ledge given by the house, she flipped herself upwards before gracefully twisting her body in the air. Letting go off the edge, she flooded her legs with chakra, keeping a perfect amount, allowing her to stand on the wall without so much as a thud. Placing her fingers on the corners of the glass window, the grey-eyed woman whispered her next words. Suetan. Mizutariga. Just like her word said, water vapor was taken from the other side, taking an abnormal and easily noticeable amount of chakra had she not had Jonin level control. The liquid gas was soon cooled down to its middle state, liquid. The liquid started to take an orb-like form as it floated to the top of the glass paned windows. Gripping the lock, the spherical liquid slowly slid it to open with a click that was absorbed by the chakra liquid. Mido smirked at her easy entrance and quickly slid the jalousy up before thrusting herself upwards at a direct angle to get right above the door. Mizu Bunshin, she whispered as the liquid from before grew larger before creating a humanoid shape. The liquid began to fade as an identical copy of the blue-haired woman stood in front of her. The water clone held her hands up to form a few hand seals before she was covered within a torrent of water. Her shape began to change once again, this time to a much smaller being. Finally, the small tornado of water began to collapse, displaying a firefly, flying in the air. Sliding the door open, just barely, the woman allowed her transformed clone to fly forward. The insect looked towards both sides of the hall, and seeing no one, the firefly let off a small flare of chakra. This alerted Mito to walk forward and, after confirming again that there was no one around, she jumped up and flipped herself around in midair, so she was upside down on the ceiling. She nodded to the firefly who, with a quick flare of its chakra, created another clone, made of water. Both spread out in different directions and flew forward with their creator walking down the right side, following the original clone. After a few minutes of making her way through the mansion, she finally reached a normal-sized door with a fan made of wavy waters. She looked down at the door and saw some guards. Staying in her position for half an hour, the guards finally switched shifts. 
assuming that this was the door for the daimyo, as their symbols usually consisted of a fan, looked for a way to get in. Seeing none, she, after looking in all directions to make sure no one was there, jumped down, making a small thud. Her eyes widened as she heard some shuffling through the door. Fuck. She shouted at herself as she quickly placed a slightly smoky transformation. When the metamorphosis was complete, she had a new appearance, the typical servant look. She knocked on the door politely, a small psychology trick she had learned long ago. If you were in danger, you would expect that the perpetrator would be trying to be sneaky or rather noticeable as they arrogantly walked in. You would never expect that they would knock politely on the door, at least normal civilians wouldn't. You would expect your assassin to try to get in without anyone noticing, not just knock on a door. Letting off a small flare of chakra, her two clones appeared, quickly dissolving into green water that she caught with her chakra and the other one transformed into a cup. Placing the green liquid, fake tea, within the cup, she allowed the daimyo to open the door. Zato sama I've brought some green tea for you to relax, she politely said to him as she handed him the cup. He accepted the ceramic cup and thanked him before dismissing the woman. Mido bowed as she placed her hands behind her back, creating a mizubunshin that appeared on the other side of the man. Closing the door, the man turned around and lifted the brown cup to his face and allowed the liquid to flow down his throat. Before he could do anything else, he felt a sharp and metallic object go through his throat. Unable to make a sound or move, due to shock, the man started gurgling in his blood. He fell down on the floor, eyes glazed over as he died. Come in. Mido reporting. I have killed the daimyo. Come over, she whispered as she placed a finger to the transmitter in her ear. Some static, then, the other two answered, along with a subordinate infiltrator. Sira. Information has been gathered. I have collected everything the daimyo had written. Her acquaintance spoke, believing that every information had been in the diary and scrolls she had been holding. Understood Mido. I'll be there soon, Khan said as he cancelled the communication device, creating some static. The job Mido was the short complement of Sato, although unnecessary as the job itself was very simple and easy to carry out. Still, the sentiments were appreciated by the bluenet and she smiled, even though she knew he couldn't see it. Ninpo. Hentai. Khan said as he went through the 20 hand seals required to utilize the. Slowly, his form started to change as he went through the physical change of bodies. Soon, his physical appearance resembled the daimyo perfectly. Khan had infiltrated the daimyo's ranks two months ago, after the four had gained the ambition to create their own country. Infiltrating the ranks had been easy enough, and so, for the next two months, Khan had kept an eye on the daimyo, so that when he had finally learned his mannerisms enough, he could easily replace the man without suspicion. After all, if they had just used tyranny and killed the daimyo, then Kanoha would have known, and they would have been destroyed within a week. No matter how many bandits they had and trained they were at the time, a single squad of Anbu would be able to completely destroy the entire operation right now. No, they could not fight a single squad of Anbu right now. If they wished to succeed, they needed to plan carefully, cautiously. They couldn't go in half-cocked and expect to come out on top. As of right now, they needed to start out small and eventually grow until not even the combined might of the entire nations could beat them. Tsutsuki jumped through the trees as she rushed towards Tazuna's house. Hey Suki Haim, Naruto smiled at her. What's up? He asked her. Translation. What took you so long? You were gone for a couple of hours. The daimyo gave me these and I thought I should look through it before I got here, she told him with a casual shrug. She took out one scroll and out of it fell a picture. Use your cage bunshin to search for her, she ordered. Naruto grinned at her and playfully saluted her as he said, yes ma'am, before creating the clones she wanted. Each of the clones jumped from their location and fanned out across the island in search of the daughter of the daimyo. While they were searching, Satsuki decided that they should get some sleep. Instead of going to Tazuna's house, they were offered to sleep there as thanks for saving them before, and most likely now, his best friend dragged him to a hill where two sleeping bags had been set up. Naruto smiled softly as he looked at the sleeping woman with him. It was late at night, somewhere between 4 to 6 am. He had woken up early, an ingrained habit forced onto him by Itachi. Always wake up early, Itachi had told him years ago. Normally, he would be up at around 6, but the light from the star and moon awakened him early. Besides, he wanted to check a few things he had thought up a few days ago. Naruto walked a little away from the Ichiha heiress, creating some henge cage bunshin to guard her. Creating four cage bunshin, the blonde ordered his copies to create a one-way sense barrier. A rectangular prism, invisible to people, that blocked everything from leaving, including sound, light, smell, taste, or anything out of it. Naruto took out multiple shurikens and dropped all but one to the floor. Hope this works he mentally stated to himself as he closed his eyes for better concentration. Focusing his wind affinity to the chakra conducting metal, he started to shape it. Slowly, an icy white wind began to extend from the blade as it grew larger in size until it was comparable to a demon wind shuriken. 
opening his eyes, he allowed a smile to grace his features, instantly losing the shape of the attack. Fuck. He muttered to himself as he sighed and let loose a deep breath to calm down. Trying the process once again, but not celebrating prematurely, Naruto once again created the wind shuriken. Naruto drew his dominant arm backward, making sure to keep it from touching him, and threw his arms forward, letting his grasp of the metallic object loose. The attack flew forward, its speed enhanced greatly by the wind. As the inanimate object approached its target, a tree, the size began to quickly diminish. As it struck, the size was thrice of the original shuriken. The wind blade cleaved cleanly through the trunk of the tree before dispersing, leaving only the shuriken to fly forward, lodging itself into a rock. Naruto grinned at the attack, glad to have it working so fast. Now, he just had to fix it so it wouldn't grow smaller and have control over it. I'll work it out later. Need to do the other ones too the blonde thought to himself. Inhaling deeply, he relaxed before opening his eyes, determined to at least make his theories practical. Naruto first pav, experiment, I held the metallic blade over my right hand as I focused on creating a tiny Rasengan within the hole in the shuriken. A mini blue sphere formed in my right hand, fitting within my shuriken. The throwing star started to spin rapidly above my hands as I placed a single finger below it to keep it from flying off. I held my arm back behind me before throwing it forward. The shuriken flew forward, spinning much faster than it normally would, but unfortunately, my Rasengan didn't have the ability to obtain itself after leaving my hand. The tiny orb I had created dispersed within seconds after leaving my hand. The same problem that Rasen Shuriken has damn it. I need to figure out a way to make it contained. How the hell do I do that? Let's see, the Rasengan has a shell to contain the chakra inside so it doesn't burst out. Maybe I can make another shell to coat it. No, a shell or coating wouldn't work. It would still disperse fast cause I can't put too much chakra in it, it's too weak to waste too much. Maybe a feed. The first shell can be fed chakra so it won't disperse, but how do I make it stable? I shook my head as I thought, screw it, I'll just start on the other two before I figure it out. There was no point in trying to master it right now. I don't have much time to do it, so it's useless to try right now. Well, time to try the wind ball. Okay, it has to be like a Rasengan, but made out of wind instead of regular chakra. Sighing, I knew I had to have a clone for this. I wasn't good enough to manipulate the wind yet by myself. Page Bunch and I said to myself as I split my chakra into a small piece that later became my clone. I held my arm out, slightly curling my hands to create a cupping motion. My clone placed his hand on my own, channeling his wind chakra through as I manipulated the shape to become a sphere. This would be a weaker version of Futon. Rasengan, but also less chakra taxing. I have a tremendous amount of chakra, but that doesn't mean I won't run out. Sure, it would take me throwing S ranked out for a couple of hours, but that's a very likely possibility with me having to fight Akatsuki. Itachi Sensei told me that there were two people in that organization that were hunting the Jinchurikus down that were stronger than himself. I know that I can't even take down Itachi Sensei right now, even with Satsuki's help, so what were our odds of beating someone even stronger? This Bane guy and Abito guy would be hard to kill. Apparently, one has the Rinnegan, how the fuck do I fight something whose abilities I don't know? Abito, according to Itachi Sensei, was even stronger and was able to make himself intangible. It was like fighting a ghost, trying to hit something you can't touch. Thankfully, the guy wasn't always invulnerable. If he believed that he would hit me before I hit him, he wouldn't become intangible. I smiled as I looked at the results of my effort, held in my hand. I walked up to a tree and thrust my hand forward, allowing my new to hit the tree dead on. My attack cut halfway through the wood before dispersing in every direction, releasing blades of wind throughout the trunk, slicing it into many, long pieces of wood. That was awesome. I didn't think that it would actually slice everything up. I thought it would just cause a bunch of cuts to appear. I quickly got over my excitement. I still had to try my next and last one. Unfortunately, if it goes the way I think it will, it's gonna create too much sound. I created two more clones and had them set up a sound barrier connected to the original. I grinned to myself, unable to hold my excitement as I thought of what my next attack would be. All the other attacks had been awesome and functional, even though I would have to work with each of them, and I was pretty sure that this one would also work. This one was pretty basic though, and wouldn't need much work after the creation, just changing the power which should be easy with just adding chakra. I created a Rasengan in my hand. I rushed towards another tree and thrust my hand forward. Just as I was about to make contact, I released the stability from the attack, causing it to explode, just like planned. The tree was forced back from the explosion, uprooted from its position as it flew towards my barrier. It passed through quite easily before it landed in the surrounding water. Hey Akane, do you know where your brother is? Who? Hmm, not really. I know that he's in Kurigakur, but I don't know his precise location. I haven't really thought about it. Are you finally going to get him? Akane responded to the man in front of her. 
The cane was a beautiful woman with dark crimson locks flowing down her back, all the way to her legs. Thick bangs of her hair framed her face. Her porcelain skin matched her dark violet eyes. She wore a white heiori with red accents, a red hakama, and a pair of zmrai with white tabi. Yeah. I was going to request a mission to Kiri from Bachan cause I heard that they had a new Mizukage, Mei Terumi, and she's supposed to have red hair. I was thinking that maybe she might help me or at least be an ally, you know. Naruto asked. So I was wondering if you know if any of your siblings were in Kiri. He asked her. I don't know yet. I'll need to concentrate and bring them all to my mindscape. I'll tell you when I know, K. Okay? The second strongest Bijuu told him. Naruto had met a cane years ago, around a year or so after Itachi had left the village, around the same time when he first physically met his godfather. Flashback, DCH, idiots a seven-year-old Naruto smirked to himself as he used one of the few that Itachi had taught him. He shunched into his apartment after having left all of them near the interrogation and torture division building. Anko had always loved frightening the villagers and unknowingly helped Naruto as he always led them to where she was. The woman had no idea about this but didn't care and took pleasure in their fear of her snakes. Naruto grinned as he jumped onto the ceiling, hanging upside down as he took his key out of his secret compartment. He placed a key inside the door and turned. He heard the sound of locks unlocking as well as a long rod turning. Naruto had placed a defense mechanism so that if the door was ever opened without the key, the rod wouldn't turn, so the strings he had placed on the floor wouldn't stretch upwards to let the person in. He opened the door and walked forward to the bed before laying down, hoping to fall asleep. A few seconds later, his eyes snapped open as he gazed around the place he had spawned to. The hell am I? He asked himself as he walked through the sewer-like area. Eventually, he came across a large cage-like prison. He started into the darkness before violet eyes snapped open and stared at him with the child returning the gaze. So, my jailer finally deemed me worthy of his presence. The voice questioned, its voice filled with bitterness and loathing. Are you Kai Ubi? Naruto asked, his voice echoing throughout the location. No shit, the fox responded as Naruto's eyes finally adjusted to the darkness, allowing him to see them in all of her glory. Naruto snorted as he rolled his eyes. No need to be so rude, he responded as the fox growled at him. Ayubi was slightly surprised at the lack of fear that the small child in front of her showed. Aren't you surprised to see me? Do you not wish to know where you are? Kaiubi asked the adolescent in front of her. No, not really. I found out a bit ago that my father sealed you within me seven years ago. We're in my mindscape, the blonde responded to her. Do you hate your father for sealing me and you? Do you hate me for everything you suffered? All your loneliness, pain, torture that was induced onto you. Do you despise me for all of that? Do you wish to call me a demon like everyone else of your kin has? She growled out to him, expecting to be greeted with malicious intentions from the blonde. Naruto shrugged as he responded to everything she asked. I don't hate my father for what he did to me. I can understand why he did it. Although I don't like that he sacrificed me, I can't blame him for wanting this pathetic village to be safe. After all, everything he loved was here. I don't like it, but I understand. As for hating you, why would I? You said that you're responsible, but are you really? You didn't cause me anything. That was all the villagers' fault. It's their closed-mindedness that caused me to suffer. You haven't done anything that warrants me to hate except for killing my parents and attacking the village, but I don't even know why you did it. Itachi sensei told me that there's always a reason for everything, even if it's not logical. For all I know, you had a loving family and someone from Kanoha attacked them and killed them and in your rage, you attacked the village. I won't judge you like these villagers did me without knowing shit about you. The cane was frozen in shock as what he said washed over her. He was basically saying nothing was her fault and that all blame lied with the villagers. He was right of course, but she never expected him to actually say that, nor did she expect him to not care what everyone had said about her. I like you, Kit. You have my respect for not being stupid like the rest of these idiots. You aren't entirely wrong, but guess I can't expect you to know everything. She said as she smiled down at him. Err, thanks, I guess. He said to her, not comfortable with being complimented by her. I could grow to like this kid. If he truly believes this, then he might even be able to earn my full respect. Who knows, he might be able to help me kill that bastard Akane thought to herself. My name is Akane, Naruto, she said as she shrunk down to her humanoid form. You're a female? He asked before shrugging. Makes sense, he told himself. Chapter 15. Planning the strike. Naruto Uzumaki laid upon the branch of a lone tree that he hadn't destroyed. Underneath him laid his best friend, having been moved by him. The sunset had just risen, giving birth to the usual rainbow of red, orange, and yellow, splashing the sky with a golden veil, as the warm colors danced throughout the heavens, overlapping each other to create a mirage of red, yellow, and orange. He had always enjoyed the sight, along with the sunset and the starry night where the sky was not obstructed by the trees, one of the perks of waking up early in the morning. 
While not the most beautiful sight, as Naruto had seen too, where one unsurprisingly surpassed the sight, the knight, and the other whose allure could not be surpassed, no matter how hard anything tried. Even the sunrise, sunset, and the night sky couldn't compare to it. The most beautiful sight in the elemental nations. Naruto was interrupted from his enjoyment by a soft yawn from below, indicating that the well-endowed woman under him had finally risen. Sup, Haim, Naruto greeted the half-asleep woman who grunted at him as she rose from the tree, leaving the pillow and throwing the blanket off of her as she lazily sealed them into the ceiling scroll. Next, she unsealed some water, toothpaste, a toothbrush, and the other things needed to complete every ninja's morning rituals. Hygiene was important to every ninja. What was the point of being a ninja if someone could smell you from a mile away? After washing her face and brushing her teeth, Satsuki slapped herself on the cheek lightly a few times to fully wake herself up. Hi, Naruto, Satsuki greeted him as she looked up at him before jumping to the tree and taking her own spot on the branch above him. Relaxing on the soft bark of the tree, she asked her crush if his clones got the info needed. Yeah. Apparently, the girl is being held hostage at one of their side bases. She is guarded by a few bandits, shifting guard positions every other hour. Their base is at 78 from here. My other clones found all of their other bases and check this out, there are over 20 here. Naruto got out the map of Wave that had come along with the mission scroll, as he used his memory to mark the 23 bandit camp sprayed throughout the small country, as he used a swirl to label the camp with Natsumi. There's also the three Jonin we need to find, Jumi, Aaron, and Melissa. The bandits probably know where to find them, so we need to interrogate a few. I have a clone that's infiltrated their ranks to get some info, but I haven't found anything that mentions the three, Naruto continued as he thought of where they could be. Three Jonins on the loose within a future allies' country was not good. He couldn't have them ruin Wave, it would set him back a few months in his plans. They could be using code names. After all, the word might get out, and the other villages might send out hunter mins out to capture them, Satsuki proposed with her crush agreeing as it made sense, especially with the surrounding evidence. The best idea for now. After all, Wave was a large port for importing food from land such as rice and vegetables, in exchange for lumber and fish products, Kanoha for the lumber in exchange for marine products as well as food. It was much faster to trade by water than land so, as one of the few ports in the elemental nations, it was pretty wealthy. They could have been trying to gain control of it, just like Gato, but that couldn't be the only plan. After all, Wave didn't have exquisite luxury to buy with wealth like places such as Honoshudo or Tenzakugai. Maybe they're trying to take over this country. That way, they can gain the profit from all the exporting and importing. If one of them is smart enough to transform into the daimyo, he or she could raise the tariff on all the ships and increase the selling price, Naruto proposed. True. How long have they been here? Over a few months right. Why wait so long and do absolutely nothing? Sure, these people aren't very rich, but why not just kill them off, have blocks and blockades around, and have the bandits become citizens to remove suspicion? It would be so much easier than just wasting time doing nothing but taking the money. Maybe it's something else. Why would they even need bandits? They could easily scare this village into submission through either Iwa Bunshin, Mizu Bunshin, or Kasai Bunshin. They should be able to clone around 30 total, and with their abilities in ninjutsu and tojutsu, they could have destroyed this place, Naruto suggested. They could still need the civilians since some merchants are better with managing economics. They can't go because their chakra would be sensible if there was a sensor nearby. Can't take that chance, Satsuki continued his train of thought. They needed to get all the information, not most of it. They knew where T of third objectives were the bandits and the pseudo-princess. Now, they needed to find out the identity and objectives of the three missing ninjas. Have two clones infiltrate the daimyo servants and the bandit camp each. Try to get the info for those nin. Later that day, Naruto's four clones had successfully infiltrated the ranks of both sides, along with two clones of Satsuki. Heading into the daimyo servants had been noticeably harder, very noticeably. It was suspicious that he had questioned them so thoroughly, especially with his sharp eyes that Satsuki had not previously seen. Naruto, I'm gonna go see the daimyo. My clone just dispelled, and I don't think the daimyo is still the actual one. I'll see his chakra to make sure it's still him, Satsuki told Naruto as she walked towards the daimyo's residence. Naruto, I found a sobu. He told me that he was sleeping in a lake. He also said that he doesn't want to be sealed within anyone. I convinced him to relocate to Yuzushio, since it is better than the lake he's at. Anyways, he should be pretty willing to go there as long as he is treated fairly be everyone else, a cane spoke from within his mind. The blonde expressed clear confusion on his face as he questioned her on why Sobu would want to go into the waters around the large island country, instead of on land. The cane snorted in amusement as she explained. That lazy brother of mine likes his turtle form much more than his humanoid form. Besides, he has to do so much less. 
Plus, he loves swimming more than anything so in the waters, he can do nothing except swim without interruption and a shit ton of food. So as long as we don't bother him without need and give him free reign around the giant ocean around Yuzu, he'll stay with us and help if we ever need it. Naruto asks skeptically. Was it really gonna be that easy to get a being of such power, on his side, technically, by just offering him things that he didn't really care for? The water and fish in the ocean around Yuzu wasn't needed for anything. Maybe some fish would be helpful in the future economy, but it wasn't really much, and he didn't really care about anyone residing in the lake, as long as there weren't any problems. That's what Boo said when I asked him. He also didn't want to get into any unnecessary conflict with other people for no reason. He knows you wanted to strike Anoha, but he doesn't want to be involved. He won't help them or you, Akane told him, not really caring if her brother helped with her host's plan. Naruto already had enough to destroy it, but he still needed to use Konoha's name to get a few things, such as an alliance with small countries such as Spring. Naruto smiles at her. I don't really care if he doesn't help me with my revenge. I just don't want Akatsuki to get any of the biju right now. Plus, he's your brother, so of course I'd at least try to help him, Naruto explained. If Akatsuki got the biju, they would become an even bigger threat than they already were. Right now, according to Itachi and Jiraiya, they didn't have enough power to force back the whole of the Akatsuki. Out of all their willing allies, only Kakashi, Jiraiya, Akane, and maybe Tsunade stood a chance. Even then, taking out the big powerhouses like Abito or Kisum or Pain would be extremely difficult, what with their abilities to naturally be in the water or be practically invulnerable or just plain too diverse and powerful. Plus their scouts like Konan and Zetsu. Do you want to get out so that you can go find him? Naruto asked. The red-headed powerhouse just nodded her head. Naruto took a deep breath before he started to focus on gathering her chakra. Red chakra began swirling around him, but was quickly put to an end as it left his body and took the form of a woman. The chakra slowly began to take form before it became a cane in her little kid form. After all, the ninja couldn't sense the chakra and realize that there were other ninjas on the island. They had to be discreet. Not many people knew how to sense chakra like Akina's as it was pretty unique, and not many even knew what it was. She was now a blood-red fox, being around 45 centimeters in height, 82 in length, and her tail was 42. Her limbs were rather short with her limbs only being 10 centimeters in height. Her fur also had darker spots, barely noticeable. At the top of her tail, the fur became soft blue, with the peak being pure white. See you later, Naruto, the vixen said before she turned around and moved from the position, heading towards the location of Isobu. The cane would go and approximate the location of Isobu and then send back the location using their telepathy. The cane hadn't truly left him, just her spirit mind. Her real body and most of her chakra was still within his seal, and so, he could still communicate with her through his mind. Tsutsuki had finally arrived at her location, the roof of the mansion that the wave daimyo possessed. Carefully, she broke into the mansion, making sure that no chakra was in use, so no one would sense her. After arriving at the location, she quickly located her own clone, thank god for using an easy, but common, form to recognize. Her clone saw her just in time and nodded her head imperceptibly before she continued to do what her job required. After waiting for a few moments, the clone made her way to the bathroom before dispelling one sin. Tsutsuki confirmed her suspicions. The daimyo looked different now. His eyes were sharper and deadlier. Using her chakra sensing abilities, taking a few seconds to activate she recognized the chakra of the man to be unfamiliar. He also had an abnormally large chakra reserve for a civilian. Besides, while his henge may have been pretty good, it could not fool her. So, the shinobi killed Zato and took over his position. Why? What do they want? Can't be money, they could steal that so they must want leadership. Why? The Achiha heiress asked herself as she stayed hidden inside the roof. Increasing the range of her senses, she was able to know ice that there were three more people with abnormal chakra reserves. So, there are three more shinobi here. Guess that they didn't know. One more than warned or he or she just wasn't listed in the bingo book. The mission is null and void now since the daimyo isn't the real one. We could use this. Make Tazuna the new daimyo the woman smiled deviously thought to herself as she realized what she and Naruto could gain with this. She quickly left the mansion to get to Naruto. Night, Naruto glided through the trees, getting closer and closer to the camp the bandits had set up. His eyes snapped open as he took a deep breath and prepared to get a quick job done. Slamming his foot on the ground, he flew through the air as he approached the bandit that was guarding the area along with his three friends. Grabbing the man's shoulder, he flipped over him to a handstand and grabbed the bandit's neck. Twisting his hands, the eight people near the dead bandit heard a disgusting crunch of bones getting cracked. Naruto has quickly broken the man's neck, leaving him lying dead on the floor by punching his nose so that he would drown in his own blood. 
the shocked bandits didn't get a chance to respond to the attack as the blonde shinobi pushed off their friend and took out multiple kunai before launching the 21 blades at them, three for each person, one at the heart and another for the brain with the last for the throat. The bandit's head and skin was pierced by the kunai's sharpness and velocity, splurging the red liquid flowing through their bodies towards the ground as two vital organs, the heart and brain, were pierced, leaving them dead. They didn't even get a chance to scream as their vocal cords had been completely punctured. Burning their bodies with a small fire just as Itachi taught him to light a campfire, Naruto continued on his way through the camp. While he was doing that, Satsuki was going through the other camps with her own cage bunshin, with four Naruto's following each clone. Every camp was to be burned to the ground, then use their water and wind to make sure no one saw the burning or smoke. The four clones' fire job, however, was to use a one-way barrier so no one could see from the outside. Tsutsuki's main job was to destroy all the other bandit setup, while Naruto's was to destroy the one with Natsuki. Then, the tents and bodies all went up in flames before, Mizurapa cleaned up the flames with a futon. Tapa cleared out the smoke while the barrier obstructed this from outside view. His infiltrated clones had already dispelled, giving him information on where the girl was hiding. Of course, he didn't have to save her, but it would be beneficial when everything was explained as well as when the alliance was made. After getting her out of the camp, the plan continued, and the whole area was burned to the ground with just ashes and burnt ground remaining. It wouldn't do any good to wait any longer, so he quickly headed for Tazuna's house, his and Satsuki's agreed meeting location. Satsuki rushed through all the men in front of her, drawing her sword and cutting all of their vital points such as the liver, lungs, spine, jugular vein, carotid artery, brain, kidneys, heart. Each one was either pierced, stabbed, cut, or shredded by her karasu. Of course, you could survive without a few of those, so she sometimes attacked more than one point. Her blade was coated in lightning chakra as well, so it also filled them up with electrical bursts to electrocute them. This continued throughout her assigned camp. Killing bandits using her sword and burning them before burning the whole area before Naruto's clone used water, then wind jutsu to get rid of the smoke. Thankfully, she didn't have to smell it as everything was burned to ashes in the ground. Arriving at the old man's house, Naruto brought the unconscious girl inside and used some smelling salts to bring her back to reality. When the teenager woke up about their age, her eyes looked around and saw everyone. The 12-year-old, Satsuki, Naruto, Tsunami, and Tazuna. W who are you people? The teenager stuttered out as she locked eyes with Satsuki. Satsuki chose to play with words in their favor to make them more trustable. We were asked by your father to get you back. Unfortunately, your kidnappers decided to kill him for some reason. We were able to kill them all and bring you back, but I think there's still some people at the tower, so we kindly request that you stay here with Tsunami and her family, Satsuki explained. She didn't mention that they were shinobi, were paid for it, made it sound like they were the good guys, and phrased it to sound like she was being helped. Wording was everything. Um, thank you for saving me, but what will you do now? Natsuki asked politely. Satsuki kept up the act and told her that they would defeat the other bad guys and have her be the new daimyo. She blinked back as she let out a grimace. I'm sorry, but I am not sure if I am capable of leading my entire country. I have seen my father doing it, but I have neither the experience nor wisdom to lead my country to prosperity, and I haven't a clue on how to keep mine safe, Natsuki spoke. Naruto's eyes widened as the opportunity was given right there and then. Satsuki realized the same thing and grinned inwardly. Well, Natsuki-san, maybe you could hire a group of people to advise you or give you suggestions. Of course, they wouldn't have the same power as you, but it would help, right? You could get someone like Tazuna to help you with construction and economy management, with others pitching in ideas while you, or the next rulers, have the final say, Satsuki told her. Tatsuki contemplated the idea. While having advisors would be a great help in the future, there was still the possibility that the counselors could become corrupted by power. When she voiced this concern to them, the man seemed to give a solution. You could make a non-loophole law that can't be broken or gotten through with any loopholes that say that any member is to receive no special treatment or anything of such solely due to their position. You also had the power to remove any councilman or councilwoman from their position, but no one could do that to the monarch. Naruto stayed with her, staying far away enough that she wouldn't fear his presence. After all, she had been forced through some fucked up shit with the bandit. He wasn't even sure what happened to her, and he really didn't want to compromise his position by making her relive such moments. The woman was apparently getting used to their presence as her features became more loosened as time went on, while her voice became less formal, casual sneaking in every blue moon. As for your military force. Well, you can do your best, but there is always the chance for someone to get into the army while being an enemy. The only thing I can think of would be to have a complex and chain of security codes registered to every single citizen in WAVE, marked using a blend of undetectable chemicals no one can find and the same with kids. And the daimyo has to personally do it. Each person also gets a different code or something. 
only one with the mark can get in. No one should speak of that code unless with you and you alone. But that would be complex, especially without a way to do it like Fuinjutsu. I don't even know how that would fully operate, Naruto commented, not even talking to her anymore. In all honesty, the blonde heir of Yuzu was probably talking to himself like she sometimes did with a cane, whenever he had an idea that he had to get out before it could fizzle out. Tsutsuki smiles at the Princess of Wave before walking over to Naruto and flicking him on the forehead with two fingers, a small tradition from Itachi used to stop the other from thinking too much or ranting, though with a bit more force. Ow oh, hey. The teenager complained as he rubbed his forehead to keep the hurt act going. Tsutsuki san how about a favor for a favor? Naruto asked after glaring at Tsutsuki a little. The woman looked at him with a confused face, but requested him to continue. We stop the guys who killed your father and get you back in the position, plus an advisor on your council, and in return, you could start trading with Yuzushi Agakur in a few months or at most, a year, Naruto told her. He expected the princess of Wave 2 at least know about the Yuzumaki clan. After all, they were under the protection of the clan from people who had seemed out to gain control over the land, and as such, a very important waterway allowing navy forces. Why it hasn't taken place was anybody's guess, since any factor could have done it, such as the low number in Kumo, Iwa, and Kiri. Tsuna was probably too scared of the Yuzumaki's reputation or maybe being allies with Konoha or something. There could have been other factors, but that one seemed more possible by reasoning. Why in a few months, Naruto-san? Mitsuki asked. Izushi Agakur hasn't been rebuilt yet. I was hoping to hire Tazuna and a large group of construction workers and carpenters to help build Yuzu. I kinda need him to do it in secret, so I don't need that many people cause I can supply him with around 500 people that are more physically adept with it but aren't very good with construction planning. I don't want the country to be too clustered or uneven, Naruto explained. Also, why Yuzu? Aren't you Konohinin? Mitsuki asked. Currently, Yuzu was an ally, so I doubt that there will be problems with reconstruction, Naruto lied to her. Konoha definitely didn't want Yuzu back. But the main problem is part of the specific recommendations from earlier. Naruto finished. Noticing her confused face, Satsuki decided to elaborate. During the Godim Hokage's rule during the past three years, Naruto and I were deployed on an information gathering mission, S ranked, so details are classified. Anyways, in that mission, we found that the governing body that's not the Hokage but chooses them has been corrupted for a long time. We discovered that they orchestrated the genocide of an entire group of people, family, numbering about 350, just so they could gain the land, money, and special abilities they possessed, Naruto told her, weaving the lies to make it unconfirmable. Besides, Danzo had wanted the land and money to supply Rude, but the main reason was for the coup and to gain the eyes. Another example of corruption was the permission to abduct an heir of our village to finalize a treaty. Satsuki finished. Kano has saved our country three years ago, was her final argument. Satsuki let out as she explained what actually happened. It wasn't Kanoha that helped you, it was Naruto, Kakashi, and I standard protocol requires that if a client has lied about the mission, then you must return with no hesitation. At Naruto's and my insistence, Kakashi decided to allow it. The mission, if submitted truly, would have been out of your cost range back then, Satsuki told her. Sakura didn't count. She basically did nothing. Wait, there was no foundation around it. She didn't do anything. She froze up against the demon brothers, she did nothing against abuser or Haku, and she might have even hindered Kakashi with a random kunai. It also wasn't reported as the mission would have been about 50x more than what Tezuna paid for, something that would have affected Wave's rebuilding, since we had no idea where Gato had hidden the rest of his money. After the princess had agreed to the trading negotiations with Yuzu, Satsuki and Naruto left for the daimyo's mansion, discussing the plan as they walked along. Not get all the innocents out of the place by placing a one-way repulsion seal barrier outside the door, Satsuki stayed as they neared the large mansion. The flaws had taken a while to be cleansed, but finally, after some time, continuous comments made on the idea, the plan had finally been perfected. Satsuki used the Ipai Henge to transform into Kakashi, while Naruto himself used Horation to travel to one of his clones left in the mansion. Dispelling the clone, Naruto waited several minutes before rushing to the daimyo's chambers. Zato sama he yelled out as the man turned to face him. A man named Kakashi Haddock has come to speak with you. He finished. The man seemed to be stunned, but soon got over it and ordered them to let him in, while telling every servant and guard to leave the room, except for Mido, Sado, and Sira, all of them hidden with their chakra suppressed. Soon, the silver-haired Jonin walked in, a fake itch itch book in hand. After all, he was known for reading the erotic literature, so the disguise would be more believable. Hello Daimyo-sama, Satsuki began, mimicking Kakashi's lazy voice. Hello haddock -san, may I inquire as to why you have come here? Khan asked the man. After all, it wasn't every day that a legendary walked into your place. Tsunade-sana has asked me to be her delegate. 
She is currently required to stay within Konoha due to the earlier invasion of Konoha to boost morale and help the construction crew using Mokuten, Satsuki said. Sanadi didn't have to go to the Mokuten, but it wasn't official. Her bingo book entry didn't record that she didn't inherit her grandfather's power. So you see, we were hoping that you could send a group of carpenters so that they could help us with the construction. Hopefully, we can get a man by the name of Tezuna as he is one of the best. She finished. God damn it, Naruto, hurry up. She thought to herself as she waited patiently for Naruto to finish setting up the seals so no one from outside the room would know what's going on while also creating a dimensional space seal. The seal would manipulate the space around it to add extra storage, even though the room was the same from the outside. After all, they needed space to kill three. I wish I could grant your request to Hadixan, but due to the bandit invasion from a few months ago, we have needed the help of an accomplice such as Tezuna to repair many buildings and boats that they destroy, Khan denied. They couldn't afford to have a variable outside the village. Their plans may be discovered. I see. Sorry for taking your time, Daimyo-sama, Satsuki told him as she stood up. Turning her back to him, she released her resistance seals. She walked towards the door and reached out to grab it. Turning the knob, she pulled the door before turning around and flying straight toward Khan. Through the door came Naruto, also speeding in, heading towards one of the hidden shinobi above. Chapter 16. Emotions and Goals. They all look like their profile pictures on the bingo book, except for this guy, Naruto pointed out as he stood above the dead missing Nin, looking at Khan. Their surprise attack had allowed them the precious few seconds that it allowed them to engage a ninja each and kill them. It was slightly harder to kill the other two, but, even though they couldn't use ninjutsu, their superior to jutsu and jinjutsu had allowed them to take care of the two, having to be careful as to not accidentally sent them to the walls of the mansion and cause damage, especially not the daimyo's chambers. Maybe they hired him or he's a friend of theirs that wasn't recorded to go missing yet, the other teen replied as she imprisoned the dead into a prison scroll. Maybe. The blonde trailed off, not really knowing the answers before shrugging. He really didn't care enough to spend that much thought on a dead person. After taking care of the jonin-leveled ninjas, they left the mansion to go to Tezuna's house, seeing that Natsuki had resided there for the day so they could take care of the impostors. It didn't take long for either of them to arrive at the house, nor did it take long for them to convince Natsuki that the impostors had been taken care of. She had asked if there were any other impostors, but Satsuki dismissed the concern, telling her that she had gotten out from Khan that they were the only people in the plan besides the bandits that they had taken care of. This included that none of the bandits had actually been a part of the daimyo's house during Khan's one-day reign. After everything had been taken care of, Natsuki had told them that they were both dismissed, politely and gratefully, and they both left the area. The trek back to Kanoha wasn't that long, only taking a few hours to jump through the trees, nor was it very eventful or loud. They made some small talk on the way back, but most of the time, Naruto quietly read Tale of the Gutsy Ninja 2, a book that he had convinced Jiraiya to write a few years ago, due to how much he had liked the previous one. This one was more famous than its prequel because Jiraiya was convinced that for anyone to read the books, it would need more romance and smut. It was still an adventure book, but there were chapters dedicated to romance with a few smutty pages scattered across. The perverted ninja was somehow able to actually blend all of those in and create an attractive storyline. Now that he had snapped out of Yuzukage mission mode, Naruto had more time to think of his personal life, more specifically, the romantic aspect of his life, spurred by the book he was currently reading. He had already fallen in love with a girl next to him years ago, but at that time, he couldn't pursue that goal. After all, there were other, more urgent matters that needed attending, such as encouraging the teen next to him to become stronger by becoming stronger himself, protecting her, finding information about what he needed, planning out everything for the future, however useless, and trying to protect both himself and Satsuki from the clutches of the village. But now, he was older, more mature, and responsible. He could now pursue the person that held his affections freely without many obstacles in front of him. Sure, there were hindrances to this, such as the warhack that was trying to gain both of them to create two powerhouses into his efficient, emotionless, concealed army of teenagers and adults. The Akatsuki would also propose problems, but Itachi was very helpful in that aspect, as long as Itsuki was safe and happy, giving him very valuable information on the members and their goals and abilities through Jiraiya. It was a consistent annoyance, having people block his goals as if what they themselves wanted was actually more important. Who cared about the survival of Konoha? Sure, it would destroy one of the superpowers in the elemental nations and throw the world into an uncivilized area as they tried to claim the land by ridding the daimyo of that country, so no ruler would be there, nor would there be strong protectors. After all, while samurais would easily massacre a group of civilians, a well-trained shinobi could do the same with samurais. If Kano had died, the political world would be thrown into chaos as people tried to gain the fertile land of fire by destroying the influential people of the small countries themselves. 
That imbalance could, however, easily be replaced by the integration of Yuzushi Agakur, but that in itself would cause problems. Kiri, Kumo, and Iwa had band together and created an army of around 40,000 shinobi to attack the small island, only to get destroyed before the Yuzu Nins themselves had perished in a blaze of glory, filling off the mass murders in an attempt to defend their homes and families. However, if Yuzushi Agakur was to gain reliable alliances, then the consequences of war would cause them to hesitate, especially if they were to regain such fear and skill again. And if he were to become even stronger, then the reputation of Yuzu would skyrocket. After all, there would be at least two Jinchuriki, four cage-level ninja, not including Naruto or Satsuki or their group, along with strong defense and locations, and three, maybe four proficient seal masters. He already had that, and he hadn't even done everything he wanted to do. They had two Jinchurikis who, if what Fuu said was correct, could easily use their tenant's power if need be, three Bijuu helping out, if indirectly, such as Akane, Jimei, and Isobu, and they also had multiple cage-level ninja with more in training, such as Kakashi, himself, Satsuki, Tsunade, Jiraiya, Itachi with his allies such as Fuu, Sajetsu, Karen, Jugo, trying to reach that level. Ujido and Gara, basically Sun Agakur, were indebted to him for saving their lives, so Sun Agakur was in a secured alliance until either a new leader or the council tried to take over by force. They couldn't leave Kumo to chance, so it wasn't in an alliance yet. He had mastered Horatian to a degree higher than his father, with Satsuki behind him, unable to perform it the same, but closer than any other person alive, so now, they also had a yellow flash and a raven flash around, even if they were not as strong as Minato yet. They also had skills in Kenjutsu, not as much as their mothers, but still high enough to have the fear of the old duet going on for them as they got better. Right now, Yuzu was very protected, but he still needed more allies. Well Yuzu did have all of that protection, it still wouldn't be enough. Well he had very high quality on his side, his opposers also had quality. Quantity was also a quality, and both Danzo and the other villages had those, the villages more than Danzo, but Danzo still had his army of elite trained emotionless droids. Akatsuki itself had some people stronger than those that he had ever met or known about, excluding the legends such as Madara Chiha or the Rikidu Senin or anyone else around those levels. Naruto doubted that even Jiraiya would be able to beat a beat or pain, seeing as one had the Rinnegan and the other had a Sharingan that allowed him intangibility. Sure, Jiraiya has Sage Mode to help him, but wasn't one of the abilities of the Rinnegan to be able to absorb Chakra. Although, it might actually be beneficial that it could, seeing as if you were to be discreet enough that the enemy didn't know you could, such as mastery over it to the point of no marks, then pain would be forced to become a stone statue. That allowed them to be rid of at least one enemy, and one of the strongest, second, according to the Itachi. The scowl lit his face, hidden from the woman at his side, as he analyzed all the threats to his goals, interfering for unreasonable purposes. Why was Danzo so adamant for the supremacy of the hidden village? What purpose did it serve? He had no reason to protect the reputation, nor did he have a reason to destroy with the military's might. Was it all for pride or did he just want to suppress those he believed were underneath him? Did he have a superiority complex, like Satsuki, or did he just want to see the world burn by destroying the other countries? Why did Ibito want the Biju? Did he want a group of godlike beings under his control to threaten the countries? Did he want to destroy all the countries and take over? No, if he did, then Shukaku wouldn't have been absorbed by the mysterious and strange statue, so why did he want the Biju? Was the statue sometimes a weapon? Did it use Biju Chakra or Sinjutsu Chakra to power? Itachi didn't know anything, Abito probably hadn't said anything, obviously not trusting his fellow Ichiha at all, and it was starting to frustrate him. How could he go against someone he couldn't beat or counter, whose goals were unclear, whose motives were unclear, whose weakness was unclear? At least Danzo wasn't as powerful, even with his army by his side. After all, especially in this situation, when the head falls, the body shall crumble. Danzo was an idiot. He simply didn't have a successor, which would be very useful in his old age of 72. However, he was still powerful and unknown in his prowess. He was a mystery in abilities, no known strength or weakness, nothing. They all needed to go to hell, they were in his way, they were trying to hurt her, trying to destroy him, kill them both, use them both. They were an annoyance, and they would need to be purged. Their lives were forfeit. There was a difference between love and crush. Love is an emotion. When a person has a very strong personal affection or attachment towards another person, it is called love. Love is believed to be unconditional. No matter how perfect or how faulty the object of love is, they are always loved by the one who loves. It is an emotion which binds people with each other for a lifetime. The crush can be described as a very strong attraction towards someone, it is infatuation for a very short period of time. A crush usually is based on a person's appearance, their persona, or their lifestyle. The Ichiha heiress could easily determine that she did not love Naruto. 
she knew the feeling of love, the difference of romantic or familial, did not matter in this situation, and the woman could understand that. She knew that the affection she held to her family, her mother, father, brother, and the rest of her clan, surpassed whatever affection she held for Naruto. The clan itself was a measurement of her feelings. She knew that her love for her closest relatives far surpassed everyone else of the clan, and the clan, although not by much, surpassed the amount she felt for Naruto. However, the woman also knew that she did not have just a crush on the blonde Uzumaki reading beside her. She liked him for more than his appearance, after all, he was an amazing person to her. His beauty went deeper than skin. After all, he took care of her when no one else had the ability or motivation to do so, even without her knowledge. He destroyed her ignorance and planted knowledge and strength within her, both physically and mentally. He held her and lent himself over as she cried over all the betrayal she had suffered, from Itachi, the village, her parents, her clan. He was the only one who had not betrayed her, the one person that stood by her for himself and her, not just themselves. In the beginning, he had only watched over her because he was trained for it, made to do so by her brother. He had made it clear over two years ago when she let her insecurities burst. Flashback. Yuzushi Agakur, two years, seven months ago. Tsutsuki laid, crouched upon her futon, deep in thought, similar to every night in which she would let her emotions burst within her mind, something she had to suppress around Naruto in fear of E and her childish anxiety. She knew that he wouldn't do that, but her mind argued against it vigorously, untrusting if anyone and trying to shut out all emotion in an attempt to never experience the pain of loss or betrayal. After all, why would he stay by her forever? He had neither obligation nor reason to be with her, and all the reason, besides Itachi, to be away from her. She herself left him behind, and even though she thought he had no knowledge of her, he did. He knew her very well, as he had stated a few times when she asked how he knew what she liked and disliked, so he should have felt treachery and anger towards her. She always tried to suppress him when under the facade of Sasuke, suppress his skills, his intelligence, suppress his achievements, even though she knew that he was stronger than her, just as smart as her, if not a bit less, and his feats easily overshadowed hers. Her brain reasoned that eventually, he would leave her behind once he found something better, and the only reason he would stay with her was because it was his duty as Itachi's student. I need to know. Does he only stay around me and train with me because I'm Itachi's little sister, because he was trained to protect me she thought to herself, her insecurities finally drowning her pride, after six months, as she lifted herself up, not caring that it was the middle of the night. It only took a few seconds to reach the Uzumaki's claimed room, but it took much longer to gather her courage and curl up her hands before throwing them forward, gently pushing her knuckles into the door, before waiting for ten seconds before she slid the door open. Inside the plain, blank room, Naruto could be seen reading as he laid on the mattress, the lantern providing enough light for him to peruse the book, although not as intensely as she usually saw him in the morning. The moment she slid the door open, his gaze shifted from the novel to her eyes, expressing confusion as he noticed her eyes slightly red and a few streaks of tears running down her face, probably unnoticed by their owner as she forward, her eyes staring at the ground as she advanced upon him, nearly at his mattress. His confusion quickly transformed into concern as he witnessed the tears and unhanded his book, uncaring of it shutting close with a small thud as he elevated himself from the bed moving forward a few steps, directly stopping in front of Satsuki and pulled her into an embrace, his face contorting in confusion as he held his best friend. When her quivering stopped and she looked him in the eye, Naruto finally got my moment to relieve his confusion and her sadness. Hey, Suki, what's up? He spoke quietly, choosing his words carefully and softest. Pride was abundant in the Achiha, and right now, tenderness was warranted. Then Naruto, she began, cursing her stutter as she spoke quietly, softly. Why do you care about me so much? The sentence was uttered in confusion and anxiousness as she prepared herself to hear his response. The blonde Yuzumaki detected a lot of meaning within that sentence and took a few moments to think about everything she was questioning with those few words. He decided to give his answer as soon as possible, not wanting to drive them away from him. You're my best friend, Suki, and one of the few people in the elemental nation that understands me. You know what it's like to be like me, so I can relate to you. You know me a lot more than most others combined, except maybe a few people like Itachi and Kakashi. We are friends. I admit that at first, I only cared that you were Itachi's sister, but after watching you for so long, I grew to like you for you, he told her. That was basically a confession, but he made sure to use the friend so she wouldn't have any burdens at the moment, besides, he wasn't even sure if she liked him, let alone loved him. I won't ever leave your side, and I'll never betray your trust either, Suki, Naruto completed his earlier statement while pulling her clothes in a tight embrace as his friend's arms clutched his waist. She had done the same to him when he had told her about everything, even if his breakdown and sorrow were far more contained. He had more emotional control than her. 
the Achiha heiress could feel herself drowning, both in happiness and darkness as her body collapsed on the teenager, reveling within the answer that had been given to her before she had fallen asleep, crushing her fears of betrayal and sorrow. Naruto felt her slacking in his arms and weaved his arms around the back of her knees and mid-back, before he crouched, leaned left, stood back up and adjusted his shoulder to support her head, while her arms wrapped around his neck for support against back strain, while simultaneously picking her up, while avoiding waking her up or causing too much of a ruckus. He slowly walked to her room, creating a cage bunchon to open to sliding door, and went inside the plain room and gently laid her on the mattress, the cage bunchon stacking two pillows for her comfort, before wrapping a blanket around her figure, spread over the whole bed, besides her face and feet to allow for the cool air. He never knew that while Satsuki had fallen asleep, she was still half-conscious, so she was aware of what happened. Good night, Haim. Present, the woman smiled to herself as she remembered his conviction when he stated the fact that he would never leave her. It was one of the reasons she had grown a crush on him, even if it hadn't been realized until a month ago. But could it still be called a crush? The affections she had for him were surely more than just that of a crush, wasn't it? Amalgamation, that is what Dan's Mshimura seeked for the world, a unification under a single banner, the banner of Konoha. For this banner to exist, Konoha needed to be the strongest, most stable, and he would be the one to lead it to greatness. To lead it to such greatness, he would need to gain a powerful and large army, capable of taking on all the other countries, but within the shadows, using deception, assassination, infiltration, espionage, something all Kanohan and above Chunin were doing. However, if he ordered such things, the daimyo would pull funds away, and the information spread by the regular Kanohan in would cost them necessary funds. After all, Kanohan ninjas were an idiotic and idealistic bunch. There was a reason why daimyo weren't assassinated and their place taken using a transformation. Tsunade was a very powerful woman and would be very useful if she could teach medics within Root, but that would never happen, but manipulation was a powerful tool, and anger was a very powerful emotion, as was betrayal. Sakura Hiruno, a teenager that had been deemed as just a sacrifice for the future, had taken the secrets of Tsunade's weapons, her extraordinary strength and self-healing. She would now help strengthen his personal army, both with strength and self-healing. The Ichiha has helped tremendously, instilling a deep hatred and loathing within the pink-haired ninja, causing easy manipulation for him. Emotions were a weakness, as time had proven over and over again. Promises of revenge for the weak-willed girl had given him strength unrivaled for decades by regular shinobi. However, he had no time to amuse the girl's petty wishes, there were urgent matters at hand. The threat Akatsuki posed could not be ignored, they were too powerful and ambitious for that, attempting to gather all the biju. If they got that power, they could easily bring the entirety of the elemental nations to its knees. Kanoha would not bow, Kanoha would not break. His army would ensure that. I will rise above the Hokage, as Kanoha will rise above the villages, and we shall reign supreme Danzo thought to himself, as he observed and analyzed Sakura lecturing on how to reform Tsunade's legendary strength. Nint Mesem Zm Saisei. Bayakam no Jutsu was impossible for his army to master, the length it would take to master was far too long. Akatsuki had started to act, and even if all the cells were healed, you would not survive decapitation. However, to recreate the chakra enhanced strength was well within the realm of possibility. After all, it didn't need to be mastered to the levels that Tsunade had, or even Sakura's levels. With the chakra control lessons instilled within Root's mind, it would only take a few months of time, rather than a couple of years. After all, if a girl with a pathetic amount of chakra, even if granted a high level of control, could achieve it within three years, especially if they didn't focus on the medical aspect. Aruno san, it is not possible to recreate your mentor's seal, not with the time limit that the Ichiha trader and the Jinchuriki will be executed. Focus all your attention on trying to recreate the strength, Danzo commanded. Of course, neither the Ichiha nor the Yuzumaki would be executed, their values highly surpassed the Hironos, with one having the Sharingan as well as access to the Ichiha's saved money, which was very important if the Daimyo did attempt to cut the funds for stamina. It was not enough, not nearly enough, however, it would still help, as would the Yuzumaki's riches, which was well over the Ichiha's thanks to interest, trade, mines, and every economic decision made by the Yuzumaki clan before their time of death. Kashina had been a pain in his side, resisting the manipulation he had tried on her, for the money, her skills, and the Kaiubi. Minato has also made an impressive sum of money during his time as a shinobi, before he had become Hokage. The Yuzumaki also had the Bijuu Kaiubi sealed within him. The political power and necessity even if he despised the plays of politics, the economic values, and the raw power the boy held, would be extremely helpful in oppressing the other countries. After confirming that the new regime for his army was fully functional, Danzo got up. Time was something he couldn't afford to waste sitting around. Bipolar personalities are when a person acts either manically or depressive. Depressive wasn't really the actual definition of the word, just the person's normal mood. 
Fortunately, after having spent months of time into it, he learned to control both forms, in which he was himself in serious mode, and let loose the manic when it needed to get out, he named it Toby. After all, if he suppressed it, everything would eventually burst all at once, leaving an unhealthy mind. However, if he was able to control when the manic side comes out, the disorder wouldn't have a chance to burst free and possibly forfeit his life. That's why, at this moment, his manic side had been allowed control over his body and was using the energy that he somehow gained to annoy the hell out of Dadara. Hey hey. Dadara Senpai, do you know where Mr. Sanbi is? It would be so nice to meet something so big and huge. Do you think it'll be nice and let me ride on its back Toby, an Akatsuki member, asked as he ran through the large field as they fast approached a giant lake in Kiri. However, both the manic side, Toby, and the serious side, Abito, were able to observe the outside world. They couldn't communicate with each other, they were the same person, just different personas. Abito could see the scowl form on the artist's face and noted that when he threw his arm back, a piece of clay transformed into a small spider. The spider was quickly dodged by the Sharingan user, leaving the exploding clay to detonate behind him. Shut up Toby. The blonde nin scowled in annoyance as he glared at the childish missing nin next to him. He couldn't believe that such a guy was given to him as his partner. He was always excited, hyperactive, loud, and distracted. Worst of all, he couldn't even appreciate art. Even if Sasori was an idiot that believed that art was long-lasting, what a laugh, art's an explosion, but at least he was respectable and acknowledged art. He also wouldn't shut up with that high-pitched voice that ingrained a headache within him every time the mouth opened. Abido sighed as he felt his body release a high-pitched scream and childishly ran ahead of Dadara with a faster pace. Unfortunately for Toby, Dadara wasn't his s rank for nothing, proven by how fast he moved to catch up while simultaneously throwing a couple of spiders at the black-haired man. The ensuing explosion caused a shockwave from underneath the Sharingan user, throwing him towards the air at high velocity. Toby landed on his feet and quickly threw himself into a roll and bounced back up, pouting at the exploding clay user. That means Dadara Senpai. The manic side shrieked. Even the Buddha loses his patience. You're about to know what it'll feel like if you don't shut the hell up, Dadara stayed as he threw a couple of clay balls up and down. Their banter did eventually die out as they reached a giant lake that Sanbi had been reported to be seen in. However, neither of them were able to sense any amount of unusual chakra within the vicinity, meaning that either it wasn't there, unconscious, hibernating, or suppressing its chakra. Deciding that Toby could use a swim, the blonde man snuck up behind him and used his foot to send the Achiha into the body of water. Toby's path was a parabola, splashing into the lake after the force of the attack sent him into the atmosphere. Hey Toby, go find it. He cackled after he had sent the annoying orange masked man flying. The cane had arrived a few minutes ago at the lake Asobu had said he would be at. She detected the faint pulse of the Biju's mixed chakra. Sinjutsu with a little divine energy within. Funny how the humans called them demons, but they were more divine than the humans themselves. Then again, the divine energy could be mistaken for demonic chakra, there wasn't that large a difference. The Sobu has been clearly waiting for her and sensed her as well, judging by how he was in his human form at the edge of the enormous lake that he inhabited. The Sobu preferred to take his male form, liking it more than females. He was a little shorter than her human form that she currently inhabited, with his short flat brown hair not helping his hide all that much. The baggy pants and the grey shirt he had on didn't help him stand out, it made him seem average to the normal person, the perfect way for him to be left alone to do what his lazy ass wanted to do, mostly sleeping or swimming. The gaze he had set on her held confusion and curiosity as she walked towards him. He immediately made his confusion clear when the first question he had met her ears. Why would a human want to help Biju? You said he didn't need my power, even if it would be useful, and he would be willing to leave me be, the chakra creature asked as his hazel brown orbs bore into her own. Naruto's a bastard to people in his way and strangers, but I'm his friend, one of his first. You're my brother so he'll help me by helping you. Besides, I think he can relate to the Biju. he is a Jinchuriki, and he's not going to be a hypocrite and do something that people did to him. I can also sense a bit of Asura's chakra, more than what the other Senjus had. I think it's reincarnation, but it's not really important, besides the fact that, if he is, he would technically be our little brother, technically, a cane finished. Naruto being Asura's descendant was obvious to those who knew Asura's line, but him being the reincarnation. A total jump of conclusions based solely on a higher amount of energy than should be there, but if it was true, then the Biju and Naruto were, technically siblings. The Kane's eyes wandered as she sensed someone enter the chakra barrier she had set around the lake, and her gaze settled down on two figures wearing black cloaks with blood-red clouds on them. Akatsuki, the people after her siblings, for some reason. Asobu, you see those two guys over there? She asked as she tilted her head towards the location of the two hunters discreetly. He nodded in acknowledgement and his eyes hardened after hearing his sister explain that they were Biju hunters. Chapter 17. 
captured, the cane had barely ever used her human form. She usually used her kitsune form, both large and small. She never really needed to go to human settlements, and she never cared to follow the physical standards that humans carried. She never had to fight as a human, but now, it wasn't a choice, it was an ultimatum. She couldn't risk exposure. We need a sneak attack. Otherwise, we'll need to fight and Asogu can't either. I've seen them fight, but no muscle memory. Fuck, I'll need to learn right now. Maybe I should just leave with Asobu, but it's too much of a risk to be followed. Though I could just let Naruto deal with this when he gets here she thought to herself. That last thought was quickly discarded. She was powerful enough to completely obliterate the surrounding landscape. Naruto had shown many times that pure skill, while helpful, wasn't the deciding factor in fights. Asobu, we need to sneak attack. Get ready to flood this place, she ordered as she began to concentrate. The barrier would keep their chakra within, and it would destroy any attacks that would go through it. Lightning was never her strong point, but combined with the water that her brother could so easily produce, it should weaken the blonde in front of her. And be careful. If you show your chakra, then the black-haired guy will control you. She finished as a large supply of salt water rose from Isobu's lake and flew towards the Akatsuki members. Purple lightning burst from Akane's fingers and danced to the mineral-filled liquid. The collision created a large burst of light that blinded the Akatsuki members who realized they were being attacked. Dobi sensed the danger of the attack, knowing that if they were hit with anything that big, they would be very weakened. This Sharingan transformed instantly to its Manjiku form, the black blade spinning rapidly as he used Kamui on himself and Dadara to protect them through intangibility. The electrically charged water crashed to the ground, discharging throughout the area, charring and uprooting many of the trees surrounding them. In a swirling black hole, Toby and Dadara appeared back in their original spot, both ready to be attacked. Toby instantly turned around and threw his arms up, his body bending a little at the power behind the kick of the red-headed woman. Dadara wasn't as fast, and he got launched across the clearing and straight into Asobu, who, once again, kicked him upwards. Manipulating the water behind him, the three-tailed turtle in human form threw forward a jet of rapidly swirling water. Using this moment of freedom, he rushed towards his sister, encasing his human-sized fist in a dense water prison. The first flew to Toby's face, but the man turned intangible again, but when he tried to attack Isobu again, a cane used her speed to send a lightning charge blast at him, forcing him to use Kamui once again. Appearing in a swirling black hole, Toby landed on Dadara's explosive art, created after Isobu had gone after Toby, recognizing him to be the greater threat. Dadara senpai They're kicking our asses. You should show them your art, Toby exploded in anger, his childish voice grating on his nerves, but true nonetheless. The blonde pyromantic was quick to create a couple of explosive arachnids, using them as a stall for a plan. That plan, however, was quickly ruined when their opponents became impatient and launched an electrical wave at them, along with water dancing around in the shape of a draconic beast in front of it. Toby decided to counter the attack with a caten. Kariudo, hoping that the serpent-shaped flames would be able to neutralize both attacks. The Sobu and Akane had been alive for a little over a millennium, created by Hagoromo Atsutsuki, by separating the chakra of the Juubi into parts and using his Amutin. Banbutsu SMZM no Jutsu, a he had developed, to give sentience and emotion to chakra, accidentally mixing nature chakra into the mix. Thus, all Biju, when they were created, were naturally inclined to use their elements, although they were mostly used for helping and healing. They had centuries upon centuries of using their element, with Akane being favorable to lightning and wind and the Sobu to water. They had mastered each element to standards any human had yet to reach. They didn't use ninjutsu, it was a slight against their father, a stain on his memory, his will, his hopes, his dreams, his legacy. The greed of humans had perverted the ancient techniques of a means to bring peace and to connect people spiritually to a weapon of mass destruction, capable of being used by the hands of immature and responsibility-free children to set ablaze to anything their views disagreed with. The cane herself was the most corrupted. Sure, her psychotic little brother Shukaku was, well, a psycho, she had been the most hateful of humans. Centuries of being seen as a mindless monster, a tool to further their fantasies of war and savagery, had caused a deep-seated root of hatred that had begun to consume away at her being. She began to doubt her father. How could humans, driven by pride, arrogance, revenge, and other childish emotions, all hidden by a curtain of deceit to create a public image, become connected, peaceful? Mito, Kishina, Naruto, they all changed that. They cared for family and peace above all else. They always believed that family should be kept, valued, treasured above all else. She too had begun to take up that philosophy. She would protect her family at all costs. She loved her father, she truly did, but even a child must eventually grow out of their shell and grow to gain their own personality. You know, Kane, I love these people here, the farmers, the blacksmiths, hunters, nobles, everyone, but in the end, I love my brothers and sisters above all, along with father and mother. 
I know my father may not agree, but between you and me, if it meant that humanity be destroyed so you twelve may live, then I'll be arson that raised this world to the ground. A soft smile, love and warmth directed to the small fox kid, directed at her. Ninshu became ninjutsu the moment it was weaponized, used for the sole purpose of hurting people. She didn't need ninjutsu, but having created a way to disguise it as such became really helpful during the times of rare travel centuries ago. Wink wink, her feelings on the matter had changed. Although she wouldn't use it if it was unnecessary, ninjutsu wasn't forbidden, not anymore. Tsunade Senju, current goddamn Hokage of Kanahagakur, cited her cousin, demanding for a mission to Kiri. Harigakur has just finished the civil war that had run with him for decades, and while she knew that he could take care of himself, Kiri Shinobi were probably still on edge, and with his name as an Uzumaki, it put him at an even greater risk of attracting the wrong kind of attention. Gureya informed her that Akatsuki had begun their moves, the fundings they required was finished, and Naruto knew this too, having been to Sunagakur a month or so back. He was powerful, but what if the strongest came after him? Naruto himself, even with Satsuki, couldn't handle Itachi right now, and she knew that Itachi wasn't the strongest member. If this pain or Ibido came to the scene, then they would be fucked in Kiri. Amon Bachan, a cane will also be there, and so will Suki. You can even ask the Dragon Clan to reverse summon us if you need to. Naruto reasoned. Tsunade knew of the Dragon Clan, the summons of her grandmother and father, and they knew her too. While she didn't have the contract with them, that didn't mean she couldn't get into contact with them. Fine then. You know you don't need a mission right? She asked questionably. As long as Shinobi were able to answer a call for them, then they could have time off to do what they wish, and they could also request time off as long as they had enough missions completed. These two didn't. Huh? Really? Naruto asked the blonde busty woman who nodded in confirmation. Thanks, Bachan, he grinned slightly at her before he and Suki left. See ya, Tsunade, Satsuki stated before they both left through the window, causing Tsunade to sigh at their incapability of using the damn door right in front of them. You already knew about Naruto. Why did you need to go there? Satsuki asked, but Sura told me that we're gonna start Senjutsu training, you know, the thing that allows you to use natural chakra. Seeing her confirmation through the bob of her head, the blonde teenager continued. So I left her a message on the scroll. It should be burned by now. Anyways, I told her that we're gonna be gone for a month or so because Bitsura told me that that's how long the basics should take and if we need to go further. Apparently, the phoenixes are also teaching you. A month? What the fuck? How am I supposed to spend time with you if we're gonna be separated for that long? Satsuki's thoughts ran clearly through her mind as she got frustrated with the decision. She loved gaining strength and she wanted to be more powerful, but she really didn't want to spend any time away from Naruto. She had grown very attached to his presence and had grown to him always being near her. Now, they would become separated by hundreds of kilometers for so long, 2,592,000 seconds according to him. She felt her heart groan in agony at the thought of such a length of time, without feeling his amazing and pleasurable presence near herself. Oh Rikidu Senen, I'm becoming obsessed aren't I? Her observation made her brain start processing terror, as her growing affections for the blonde Yuzumaki slowly became obsession. Am I really so far gone that I can't even spend a day without him? The black-haired woman thought to herself. It didn't take her long to answer her own question, but she still wanted to know her thoughts. Her gaze shifted from the ground to his face, thankful they were side by side. His face, normal with a small smile on his face and eyes twinkling, was beautiful, but the expression that it gave off was at her heart. What was that smile for? Was it for the training? Was it because he was happy that she would be gone? That quickly faded from her mind, she didn't really want to think about it, it wasn't a rational conclusion, and it was also a painful one. For now, she just needed to focus on her mission. After this month. I'll tell him after we finish Senjutsu training. It would give her enough time to think, to ask a few of the phoenixes, and it would also allow her to prepare for the worst, even though she hoped for the best. Abido Ichiha has enough of this. His counterpart was taking too long and wasting too much chakra in a serious battle. Pamui. Abido's Sharingan eye began to spin, the edges of the jet black designs rotating at frightening speeds. The draconic being, along with the jet of electricity, absorbed into the warp created by the and became part of his dimension. Adara Senpai, I have an idea, can you distract them? The high-pitched voice coming from within his own throat caused the shinobi to flinch, cried damaged, but the response was not to his liking. We don't have time for your shit right now Toby, these guys are really strong, un. The man scowled, but his orange mask hit his face, not allowing the blind to see the displeasure his answer caused. Adara, just do it, his voice changed from his counterpart, not high-pitched, not excited, not hyperactive. His tone held a dark edge, more than Dadara had heard before, deeper, masculine. The shock of the change made him agree, and he quickly used his unique attacks to cause an explosion of fire, smoke, and dust to cover the area that they were in. 
better than I expected Abito thought to himself. Within the smoke that wrapped itself around him, he created a warp near the area where he could barely see them. The liquid and electrical attack from within, formerly targeting them, charged towards the Redeed and her brother, invisible within the black-covered area. Who are these two? Why are they here? Abito thought to himself, unable to understand why there was a woman and man at the lake that currently housed the three-tailed beast. It wasn't likely that they didn't know since they attacked him and Dadara, but why? Did they know who Akatsuki was? If so, why did they defend the Biju? To his knowledge, there was no one that cared for the Biju, and he saw no reason why they would. Biju had always been known as beings of mass destruction and death, weapons for war, and tools for invasion, but they had never been classified by anyone as saviors. Did they also wish to gain the power of the Sanbi? If so, for what purpose? Their chakra, there's so much. How can these two not be enlisted in the bingo book? I don't sense a hinge around them his thought process was cut off as his Sharingan caught a flicker of red within the greenish-blue chakra of the man. Red? Only Jinchuriki have red chakra, but these two don't seem like the current Jinchuriki. Is he the Biju itself? Sanbi. Sharingan. Jinjutsu. He whispered to himself as he blew the smoke away and moved to Isobu, his red and black eyes meeting the Isobus. The Manjiku Sharingan red and black pattern spun around, manipulating the chakra creature through the hazel brown eyes he possessed. Instantly, the now known Biju became ensnared by the illusion forced upon him, controlling his very being against his will. So, you two are Biju. He said aloud, not caring that his partner heard him speak unlike before. He could feel the presence of the Biju chakra through his eyes, that it invaded the mind of his target. A familiar sense of power flowed through him as he realized that once again, he controlled a tailed beast. The cane scowled as her kick landed on the distracted Achea, hoping that it would cancel the illusion cast on her brother. Her eyes traveled to her brother's, turned from his relaxed but warm hazel eyes into the hollow and hateful red with three black tomo. Rage flowed through her being, roiling underneath her fake, human skin as it pulsed out, encouraging her to release it, to destroy and kill the enemies in front of her, to burn them to the ground and get her brother back. The temptation, it was hard to ignore, but she needed a plan. You can release the effects of a by knocking the caster out, interrupting the flow of chakra, or through pain. She couldn't interrupt a flow that wasn't there, Asoba was made up of chakra. It didn't flow, it was just there. She couldn't cause pain either because their senses of pain hadn't been created, why would they? The only option she had at the moment was to either kill or knock the Achiha out. Fuck. He was surrounded by her brother and the other Akatsuki members. Dadara her mind supplied. I need to knock or kill him, or both. A tailed beast bomb should kill them, and Asobu should survive. Her form distorted as red chakra extended from her back, changing their shapes to long, sharp tails of pure red chakra. They came around her extended hands, contorted as if holding an expanding ball. She focused her chakra, negative and positive, through her tails, using her hands as a tool of stability. Bubbling balls of transparent blue and deep red appeared and came together, forming a dark purple ball of pure energy, capable of destroying entire villages, held in the palms of her hands. Her body, hidden by the sun above her, thrust her arms out, launching the ball of destruction straight towards the ground at accelerating speeds. The loud noise created by the attack gave an early warning to the confused opponents below, allowing them to look up at the noise, only to get blinded by the bright light of the sun. The Beto was quick to act, using his shut eye to Kamui Dadara, Sambi, and himself into his own dimension, untouched by the attack that slammed into the ground underneath them, causing a massive shockwave of energy to unearth the surrounding area, lake and all, into a crater of dark brown mud. Ambitious. A strong desire to succeed. Success was a strange word. What was a success? Was it to accomplish something? To attain something? Was it for money? For fame? Power? Glory? Love? Abido Ichiha personally believed success to mean attainment. Attainment of your goals. Anything that could give you an opportunity to accomplish your goals. His goal would be seen by the masses as a project of death, the death of freedom and free will, the thoughts and works of a man who succumbed to insanity. They were moralistic. People who had capitulated to society and the image in which they must uphold within. An image that they believed to be important to their reputation, something that, if destroyed, could ruin the lives that they lived. Abido didn't care. He didn't care for the life that he lived. He didn't care about the image that he could. It served no purpose in his goal, the only thing he lived for. Striving towards the finish line that was so near that it hurt. The plan had been active for over 18 years, and now, he was so close. Everything he had done. Invading Kanoha, using Kaiubi, controlling the Sanbi Jinchuriki, all of it was to further his position in regards to the race he led against time itself. The key? The Biju. He needed to capture and use their very being, their chakra, their form, completely, so that he could revive the monstrous being that had once inhabited this world. It would finally come back into this world and shatter the illusion people loved. The illusion that was reality. 
it would cast upon the world the truth, a world full of white, absorbing the black around it, without ever forming the neutral color of gray that happens so commonly amongst the two colors merging. A world where he could see Rin again. A dark black vortex, an entrance and exit to a different dimension, void of everything, appeared on the massive crater that had been created in front of Akane's figure. Through it came the same figure that had just taken complete and utter control of her little brother's body and teleported him into another area so they could kill him by extracting all the chakra that made him him. An encompassing rage fueled through her body, bursting deep red chakra throughout her figure, swirling around her in a menacing form, hissing and burning the surroundings around her. Abido narrowed his eyes on her, wondering which of the biju she was. She was far more powerful than the Sanbi as she had just shown a little bit ago, and he wasn't sure if he could beat her. She was faster than him, stronger, had more chakra and more justice in her arsenal, and she could use them without words. However, he had one power over that could easily let him win. However, the bitch was smart and she knew what it was. She hadn't looked into his eyes the whole time. Bringing Dadara was useless right now since he would just get in the way and his distractions wouldn't be very helpful due to her speed. He needed to be able to bring her down or just look into her eyes for even a single second. Problem was, she could keep her eyes on his feet and track him down fairly easily when visible, and she could also sense him somehow, even if he was masking his chakra. It didn't take long for her to act, whipping the chakra directly towards, intent on corroding his body through the use of the acidic energy. He wasn't able to use Kamui much more, probably two to three times until his chakra ran out. It wasn't easy transporting something that had over 10x his own chakra. Why are you collecting the biju? Akane asked, hoping that this guy was stupid enough to at least reveal parts of his plans. She really didn't want to allow the Jubi's revival. Abito smirked. This was the perfect way to throw off these people and his true goals. I will use them to bring peace to this world. To eliminate the pain and agony caused by death and the shinobi system. I will unite this nation under a single banner, destroying all nationalism between countries and making sure that the shinobi system is destroyed. She narrowed her eyes, not believing him. She could sense the small amount of guilt released involuntarily into his body by the lie he had just allowed to escape his mouth. So, you wish to use the Biduous powers to beat the elemental nations into submission? She asked. He smirked at her, not that she could see it, as visibly nodded his head, not realizing that due to her ability to sense negative emotions, she could feel the lie being told. He just confirmed it. He was trying to revive the Juubi. There wasn't anything else you could do that required the Bijuu besides either reviving the Juubi or to beat the countries into submission. If that's Akatsuki's goal, then we really need to kill them off fast. Even Tusan wasn't able to beat it and he was the second strongest to ever exist. He was centuries ahead of all these shinobi and decades further than Naruto. If he revives Juubi, we're screwed. Which Bijuu are you? You're clearly stronger than the Sanbi, Abito asked, relying on his opinion that Bijuu aren't very intellectual. I'm Shira. The Juubi no Akami. She declared, bursting out her power, trying to make the Achiha perceive the power released and the surprising news to make him believe her lie. That's not possible Abido's mind cries out, struggling to understand that the woman in front of him was the same being that he had been trying to revive. However, he saw no reason for her to lie. She didn't know that he was trying to revive her, so why make that claim when she could have just said Kaiubi, the most powerful being known to man. She's a Biju so she would know about the Juubi as well. Is she simply trying to intimidate me or is she actually the Juubi? Abido thought to himself as he felt his chest start to feel pressurized, the stress and shock starting to physically strain him. But in his state of shock, a state in which his body became paralyzed due to the fact that his brain no longer focused on the movement of the body, instead trying to process the information that had just been given, a cane was able to attack him, launching corrosive chakra towards him in the hopes of burning his body while following herself to end it. Abido's body, out of pure muscle memory and instinct, was able to move, narrowly dodging the attack sent at him. However, a few wisps of chakra made contact, such as the one that flew through the mask and into his eye, or the ones that made direct contact with his right leg and arm, moving through the medium of clothes to make contact. Abido didn't notice the foreign chakra entering his system, too busy trying to process the explosion of power that had occurred right in front of him. The man began to become aware of his surroundings, just in time for him to throw up his arms in a crossed formation, blocking the leg that had been about to hit his face before throwing it up. The cane flowed with a movement, using the spin granted from the Ichiha's defensive gesture to add power to her axe kick. The Ichiha, with his Sharingan eye, saw the incoming attack and roundhouse kick the foot of the leg, forcing the Biju to rotate to the side. The rotation gave power to the next move a cane executed, a mid-air rotating elbow strike. The Bido dropped to the ground, ducking under the attack before lashing out with a back kick. The woman grabbed his sandaled feet and gripped it tightly, attempting to cripple him. The force of gravity kicked in and she dropped to the ground, quickly adjusting her position to land perfectly on the ground, her grip still on the feet. 
Abido used this to his advantage, throwing himself upwards and using the lead she gave him to spin around, freeing his leg by twisting her arm before hitting her with a 540 kick, hitting her leg, torso, and her face. Unfortunately for Abido, Akane blocked the last kick with her forearm, wincing slightly as she was pushed back a little. Following through with the block, she flew down and kicked him in the back, sending him flying into the air. Quickly spinning back into position, Akane allowed the flow of electricity within her fingertips to burst, following the Akatsuki member with crackling laughter. The hot stream of plasma strode through the air, following its creator's command to attack the Achiha who had once enslaved her. Abido used one of the few winds he had ever learned to create a wall of condensed water in front of him, insulating the electricity that had come for him. Pain. Back of Granbu Abido released a vortex of golden red flames, attacking the wall in front of him to increase both in volume and temperature, flying towards the ground. The cane used her mastery over wind to completely remove the oxygen of air around her and made it flow back towards the Achiha, controlling the flames with her wind. The redirect surprised the Achiha, but he quickly recovered, using a mud clone to throw him out of the way while taking the damage, invisible to a cane. Abido decided to use the time he had brought to create a large barrier, entrapping the woman inside, while he used a clone to bring the gato to drain the chakra of the woman. However, before he could create the clone, a strong kick to his face sent him flying, destroying the barrier and freeing the biju within. He blocked the sword coming from above with a kunai and looked up, only to meet a pair of Sharingan eyes that were glaring directly back at him. Chapter 18 Jubi revealed. Dark red her eyes as gazed at the man with similar eyes to her, and she quickly realized the person beneath her was her enemy, but he was also family. No, he's not. My only family is Itachi. Everyone else is gone. Dead she thought bitterly, her eyes glaring into the orange masked man's eye as she pushed against the kunai, attempting to gain the upper hand with her brute strength. She didn't acknowledge the Ichiha as family, family was more than blood. Realizing the stalemate occurring between the two related only in blood, Satsuki quickly twisted her body, swinging her mother's blade at the stomach of the one-eyed man. The attack was dodged by the man as he limboed under the sharp blade and kicked upward, sending his sandaled foot towards the girl's back, attempting to break the spinal cord. The attack proved ineffective as the girl arched her back, caving her spine in a little, and capitulated to the blow, making it hurt less due to the force being lowered with a lack of resistance. The force of the blow, as well as the lack of resistance, caused her to fly towards the sky. Abido didn't get to rest long as Naruto flew right into him moments later, attempting to break the orange, spiraled mask with his knees. The attack hit, doing no damage to the mask, and caused Abido to slide back before he was soon forced into taking the assault of the Uzumaki and the Kaiubi. Abido weaved around the two attackers, dodging, blocking, parrying, while delivering his own plate of feints, kicks, jabs, and counters. Naruto and Akane had never worked together to fight, and Abido quickly saw this, ready to use it to his advantage, but he soon realized he was running out of chakra. Haze, Naruto whispered as he folded his ring and index finger along with his thumb, jutting out the pinky and ring finger for better channeling of the wind chakra into Benahem. Quickly replacing the previous sign with the seal of confrontation, Naruto soon re-engaged the black-haired Achiha, his attack carrying extra power with the extended sharpness, range, force, and invisible attacks. Were it soon a Taiho, Naruto unleashed a blast of invisible waves towards Abido, causing a cane to jump out of the way, while Abido himself flew back, not allowing his exhaustion to show. The wind impacted the ground, causing a large dust cloud to appear, hiding the two sides from each other. Unfortunately for Abido, a cane could sense his negative emotions and knew exactly where he was. A ball of electricity entered the field of dust, coursing through the brown cloud as it flew quickly towards the tired Achiha. Abido heard the crackle of electricity and jumped away from the area he previously occupied, only to be slashed at by a lightning-covered Karasu. The Sharingan user's flesh was cut right below the pancreas as electricity coursed through his body. The only thing saving his throat from a scream of agony was the pain tolerance he had built up under the tutelage of Madara. He quickly pushed off the bitch who had slashed him, attacking her with a burst of fire that tinged a small bang of hair, causing the keratin within to release cystin and emit a sulfurous odor. The odorous gas mixed with the oxygen and hydrogen to form a horrendous smell that was of, thankfully, small quantity. Satsuki scowled as the repulsive odor entered slowly through her nose, causing her to let out a strong sneeze to get it out. Satsuki didn't get a chance to miss her hair as she saw Akane and Naruto both attack, opening opportunities for her own jabs to the Achiha. Abido panted as the feeling of exhaustion slowly gripped their claws on his body, his chakra reserves dwindling lower and lower as he attempted to grab the biju from the other two. Unfortunately, he couldn't. If he tried, the other two would instantly attack him, which would force him to use Kamui himself or die from blood loss. Fuck. I'm losing too much chakra. I need to retreat Abido thought to himself as he continued to block the attacks they were sending. He needed a moment to activate his Manjikyu Sharingan special ability, but these three wouldn't allow him that moment. 
a weakness no one knew about due to the fact that he didn't really participate in many close to jutsu battles, so he always had time to himself intangible, but when he began to use it, they would simply attack him, then switch out with one of the other two. He was forced to pause his thoughts once again, as the blonde Jinchuriki once again came into direct contact with him, surrounding himself with light blue chakra in a new form of the Rasengan he had developed. It encased his hand in a cloak of blue chakra, which allowed to add a stronger force to his punches. Unfortunately, even for him, it was a chakra-extensive technique due to its unmastered state. It had the added benefit of being a rotating drill at the same time, allowing him to first drill into his opponent from the tip of the chakra cloak, before the normal chakra and his own physical prowess decimated the opponent. Even though his chakra level had surpassed cage level, the amount of chakra that this technique drained as time went on increased exponentially. It would completely exhaust his chakra reserves if he held it on for longer than two minutes. Thankfully, he did have control on the activation and deactivation, allowing him to pull it out for a few seconds, enough to damage his opponents, but not to drain his reserves. The cloak of blue chakra flew towards Abito, forced to dodge due to the drilling aspect of the technique. Naruto quickly dismissed the technique and threw his palm towards Abito's heart, hoping to disrupt his heart. He wasn't good with Jaiwakin, not to the level of which the Hayuga had mastered it, but he knew that if chakra were to disrupt the heart or the 15 in it, or just simply tear the organ to shreds, the man would be dead. Abito once again saw the attack, and seeing as this time, it wasn't cloaked in a rapidly rotating chakra drill, he decided to block the attack, hoping to use it to his advantage. The attack met the Achiha's wrist, and he used the block to rotate himself around the blonde and deliver an elbow to the neck, intent on escaping due to exhaustion of fighting for the past two hours. The attack hit, but Naruto was able to avoid unconsciousness by bracing himself with a small chakra shield at the impact point, slightly negating the results of the attack. Fuck. Naruto cursed as he held his red-colored neck from the attack, as Satsuki jumped near him, ready to help defend him while he attempted to recover from the attack. The cane, meanwhile, engaged a Tajutsu match with Abito, intent on interrogating him for the location of her brother and torture to return him. Abito was more skilled in the art of Tajutsu, so he was able to compensate for his lower speed and strength. Unfortunately, even though the cut from earlier was healing, it still did its part in lowering his overall abilities. Abito quickly created an Iwa Bunshin to buy him some time and flew backward. The extra second gained from the retreat, and the clone gave him enough time to prepare his Kamui to whisk him away to his personal dimension, just in time to avoid the massive crater made by the enraged Biju attempting to crush him. The cane let loose an elongated, rage-filled shout, holding her frustration and anger at what the Achiha had done to her, falling to her knees as her arms limped lifelessly on her side, as her vengeful eyes glared at the ground. Her chakra formed violently, creating red helixes all around her body, constructing into a red pure chakra fox with wisps of chakra, left its body as it slowly increased in size, poisoning the nature around her and killing all the trees due to the malevolence in its nature. Naruto and Satsuki allowed her to release her anger, knowing that the containment of such powerful emotions could only cause harm, whether it be to herself or her friends. After Akane had finished releasing her frustrations upon nature, Naruto approached her, comforting her. The cane Naruto began, only to be cut off by Akane speaking. I'm gonna fucking kill the Akatsuki. Akane growled out as she finally realized exactly what would be happening to her siblings very soon if the people in Akatsuki weren't finished off. The cane. Naruto burst out, interrupting the woman's rant. The voice of her host and friend shocked the redeed out of her speech and turned her gaze onto him. What? She asked him as her ruby eyes gazed into his own cerulean. I tagged him. I've got a Horatian marker on him. If I'm right, then it should take them several days to actually seal a Sobu into whatever they're sealing him into. If I am there tomorrow, then I have the element of surprise, and I can teleport a Sobu out of there using a Horatian barrier under or through him to teleport him somewhere I marked. Even if I'm captured, I can easily get out and we'd have a Sobu, he told her, creating an improvised plan that he would later hash out to include any details or situations that could hinder his execution. She narrowed her eyes at him, her own thoughts running wild as ideas began to appear to her we can run a whole assault on them. Destroy them. How many members are left? Six or seven. We can get Jiraiya, Sanadi, us three, Kakashi, Karen, Jugo, Sajetsu, Fu, and probably Itachi against them. We could kill them. We don't know that. We know one of them has the Rinnegan. You should know how strong it is, and they also have Abito, who we were barely beating. They also have Kisum who we know is on par with Itachi, but to beat him, he might need the others. The others, besides Sanadi and Jiraiya, can't beat us rank that easily. Numbers may be on our side, but we don't know how strong they are. What if we die? What if you get sealed? Then the rest of your siblings are screwed as well and probably the whole world. Do you want the world to fall apart on the chance that we'll win? Naruto snarled, his frustration with her arguments reaching an external level. 
his frustrated tone caused Akane to stop her angry rant, knowing that he was right. If on the chance that they lost to Akatsuki, then all of her siblings would also be fucked and without them being able to do anything. After all, even if they did know, they wouldn't tell their Jinchuriki due to not having, either, a good relationship with them, or tell them, but Akatsuki could still kidnap them. It wouldn't be hard for Ibido to invade one of the areas where her siblings were held and kidnap them while they were asleep using his Kamui. She gritted her teeth, furious at her inability to help her brother and the rest of her siblings, simply because their enemy could use dejutsu based space-time ninjutsu. They're right, she stated after letting loose a deep sigh, allowing her anger out. Before she opened her mouth for the second time, she felt someone enter the field of range for her negative emotion sensing ability and quickly placed her fingers on her lips, the universal sign for be quiet, before quietly stating what she had felt. I just felt someone enter my sensing range. I'm gonna return to the seal. Naruto, enter your mindscape. Satsuki, follow him. That order was followed by her deforming into red chakra as it all entered the seal. Naruto himself had a better idea and grabbed Satsuki by the waist and used Horatian to teleport them to Yuzu, leaving a flash of black behind. The flash of black light quickly faded, seconds before the being Akane had sensed reformed upon the trees. When his form appeared on a branch of the tree, he looked down, trying to locate them along the devastated area, but his yellow eyes couldn't see anything. Where the hell did they go? I can't track them now, he stated before growling, part of his plan collapsing as he had hoped to use them to further his goal. The activation of the Sharingan allowed Satsuki to effectively use Jinjutsu analyses to the point where she could see exactly how to mold it and how the chakra was supposed to flow, creating a copy effect of sorts, as well as allowing her to see movements at a slower speed, basically tracking them down in her mind at the same second her opponent did them. However, one of the few unknown abilities was the ability to delve into the target's mindscape using a Jinjutsu. It was similar to Jinjutsu, but the Sharingan allowed you to go into the real mindscape of the target. Using her eye, Satsuki looked at Naruto's beautiful cerulean eyes and rotated the black in her eyes in a hypnotic pattern as she delved into his subconscious. When she found herself within the mindscape of Naruto, she looked around, appearing in an exquisite room decorated in gold and red, with multiple red couches trimmed in night black, creating the illusion of glowing red. The coffee table made of shiny blue diamond with a soft glow of lavender, decorated with a cup of coffee, obviously for her, and a porcelain vase filled with black lotus flowers, accompanied by black pansies and bellflowers. She let her eyelids down at all of the exotic items and turned to face a cane who was calmly sipping her coffee, eyeing her before stating her thoughts. Exotic loving women aren't you, she snarked dryly as she sat down on the couch before sipping her own coffee before looking at Naruto, wanting to hear his plan to rescue the tailed beast. Shut up, the redeed replied indignantly as she curled her lips downwards, not pleased at the jab the girl had taken at her expense. So she loved extravagant things with good colors, that wasn't something to be ashamed of. She also turned her gaze on the blonde, wanting to hear exactly what he planned to rescue her little brother from the clutches of Ibido. Seeing both of their attention on him, Naruto began to explain his plan. Since I marked Ibido, I can talk to him. Draining the chakra would probably take time, and all of them have to focus on it due to the large amount of chakra so, they would probably be in deep concentration. I can teleport behind Ibido and Tagasobu before they realize anything. If they snap out of it, then I'll use Horatian Guiding Thunder to teleport us out. If they don't, then I'll teleport Isobu out and try to kill anyone there, besides Itachi, if they are physically there. The bad part is, they'll know I have Horatian either way, Naruto explained. You could always use the camouflage jutsu. Then, if you teleport, whether it be in or out, they won't suspect Horatian. I doubt any of them have seen you use it, and the only one who would know who your father is would be Itachi and Ibido, but if they don't see you, then I don't think they'll suspect it was you or that you used Horatian, Satsuki said, sipping the coffee a little again. It seemed that either Akane knew her taste or the mindscape made it taste a certain way to please her. Naruto, that's good and all, but you do this under the impression that all of them are needed. It could just be one person who does it or there could be a guard. Hell, Abido himself might not be present for it, she stated, seeing many flaws in the plan due to his assumptions. What other choice do we have? If we don't, then we can't get him. We don't know what base they're in, nor do we know how to get there. I can always get out and get myself out of there using camouflage, so the only one in danger would be Isobu. The barrier around Yuzu and its water prevents people from coming in or around here, unless given permission by an Yuzumaki via seal, but they can't otherwise. This is our way in. It's worth it, isn't it? If we do, we can also disorient the Akatsuki for a bit and plan for the other biju. Then, we can do senjutsu training over the month, Naruto finished, looking at her with tired blue eyes, making her realize that he wasn't doing this for just himself, but also for her and her siblings' sake. And the only way this would help him was that Akatsuki wouldn't grow. 
Naruto was tired of this fighting, she realized, as she spoke her disapproval of his plan, still not wanting to risk his life. He didn't want to go to war. He enjoyed fighting, but not bloodshed and war. Naruto's only want of blood stemmed from Kanoha's older citizens who had attacked him, mentally, verbally, emotionally, and physically. The only reason he wanted to destroy everyone was simply a precaution, a way to make sure a revenge attempt, similar to his own, doesn't stem from people's hatred of him and love of Kanoha and the family inside. Naruto had become an important person to her over the years she had known him. He wasn't just the kid who happened to be kind to her or just a reincarnation of Asura, but his own person. He was like a brother to her, similar to how she and Asura were. Except, Naruto was a mix of Asura and a little of Indra's darkness. She couldn't risk his life on the chance of Isobu, but she knew what would happen if she didn't. Isobu would be gone, and the Jubi could get revived. She was stuck between Naruto's risk of saving Isobu and Jubi's freedom. Seize right Naruto, Satsuki began. I we don't want you to lose your life on the assumption that Ibito will be there or that all of them will be part of the draining process. You're too important to all of us, she stated, looking at him with pleading eyes, not wanting him to go and risk his life. The only person to not betray her, dead. She didn't want to think about it. He had become more important to her as time went on and on. She was sure she loved him now, but she still needed the time to process all the emotions she felt. That was the only reason she hadn't said anything. Well, that, and the fear of rejection that appeared amongst every man and woman when confessing. But we need to save him. We don't even know why they're sealing him or any of the other biju. What if Abito is trying to create a massive chakra weapon or something? I doubt anyone could stop so much power, he stated. Actually, a cane deterred the conversation, placing her own hypothesis in. He might be trying to revive the Juubi. Great. There's a Juubi now too Satsuki groaned out as she slouched against the couch. Yes, now shut up, the redeed scowled at the Achiha, annoyed at the interruption of her story. Anyways, she dragged out, digging the knife deeper into Satsuki. They're probably trying to revive the Juubi. Now, the Juubi is a combination of my grandmother, Kagail Satsuki, and the Shinju, the god tree that bore a chakra fruit. It attacked the earth soon after its formation, because Kagaya didn't want Chakra to be with anyone besides her own, to allow no one, not even her two sons, to gain the power that could potentially challenge her and her rule over the world. Fortunately, my father, the one you shinobi know as the Rikidu Senen, and his brother, Himura fought it to a standstill. Eventually, they won and sealed the Chakra of the Juubi inside my father, while using the he unlocked to trap the husk of the Juubi, as well as their mother, into what eventually was christened as the moon. He then bore two sons, who happened to be the ancestors to the Achiha, Senju, and Yuzumaki clan, and Bijuu finished, opening her eyes to see the rapid attention the two paid to her, fascinated with the history of the beginning of the Chakra era. Wait, Naruto said, snapping out of his trance. What happened to that Hamura guy? He asked, curious about the barely mentioned person who had taken equal part in such an important battle. Oh, well, I think my father told me that he went to the moon to guard the husk. I'm pretty sure his children descended into the Hyuga clan, she said. Huh? What do you know? Truth is stranger than fiction, Satsuki started as a picture Hinata appeared in her mind. She felt kind of bad for the girl. In love with a person who didn't return her feelings. Anyways, Naruto stayed, snapping them out of the current conversation that just gives us more reason to attack. If the Juubi is that strong, then we can't let it get revived, Naruto stated, still hoping to get them on his side. The king narrowed her eyes at him, realizing something. Naruto, you keep saying that if Isobu gets absorbed, the chances of Juubi being restored is higher, and I agree, but they also need to capture me. Do you think yourself and us are so weak to not even be able to defend ourselves? A king questioned, her tone accusing as she stared at him. I remember reading about the Gold and Silver Brothers, Naruto began, taking a minute to formulate an answer. And I'm pretty sure that they got some of your chakra when they were inside of you. They have your chakra. Who knows? Someone in Akatsuki could learn Ito Tensei and siphon the chakra from those two. It's possible to extract it from them as if they were Jinch Kriki, is it not? They could also go after that Sora guy I heard about from Tsunade Bachan. It's possible that the Juubi may not be revived at full power, but with how strong you make it seem, I doubt it would matter that much, especially since it could siphon nature chakra to restore its reserves and power, Naruto told her. That's another assumption, Naruto, Satsuki interjected, finally deciding to take a cane side in this argument. She did not want him to die, even if it meant that Juubi would be released. After all, they could seal it, right? What if they need the complete chakra of each biju? If they could just revive it, then let it siphon the chakra from the surrounding area, then why haven't they just revived the previous Yinchuriki? They should still have some of the chakra despite being dead, right? Am Mitsuki, you're supposed to be on my side. Naruto whined internally, not allowing the thought to be echoed out throughout his mindscape. The cane, Naruto asked, turning his gaze away from his beloved. 
didn't it take you several years to gain back all the chakra that you lost? He asked her, knowing that half of her chakra was trapped in the Shinigami while the rest was trapped in him. She was able to gain it back by siphoning off of Naruto and his surroundings, filling her own reserves slowly. The eight trigrams didn't just work one way, it worked for both host and prisoner, a strong reason that it hadn't been used for other Jinch Kriki. After all, you can't have the Bijuu simply drain the chakra of their hosts completely and leave them dead while gaining freedom. But her relationship with Kashina and Minato to an extent had gained her the trust of the two, and when she had been controlled, Minato used both the Shaiki Fuijin to seal half of her chakra into himself while sealing the other half into Naruto, seeing as the child couldn't hold all of her chakra during his birth. She nodded to the question, already knowing where he was going with this but not wanting to interrupt him. It was rather rude, especially since they had a little time to spare on this topic. And I doubt that the Juubi would be able to gain it all back quickly. It would take months to years seeing how much chakra it apparently has, he stated, looking at a cane to confirm his suspicions about the Juubi's chakra level. So even if it did siphon chakra from the environment, it would take a long time to finish it. Since they started a few months ago, I bet that they thought they could get every Biju by the end of the year. Seeing as they don't know the Ido Tensei, it would take them some time to steal the Forbidden Seal to get it since it's guarded all the time. According to their thoughts, it would take longer to use the Ido Tensei. The only thing I don't know is why Abito didn't use his own jutsu to capture the other Jinchuriki years ago, Naruto mused, not really understanding Abito's plan. True. He could have captured you after a couple of months of your birth. He could have killed your guards with Kamui or ghosted past them and taken you. Even if I were the last one needing to be sealed, they could have simply frozen you in stasis or something or manipulated you to their side. He could have done the same with quite a few other Jinchuriki. It doesn't really make sense, does it? The cane mused. Welp, Satsuki popped her lips. No point in trying to understand the mind of the insane, she stated. Abito had to be insane if he was trying to revive the Juubi, something not even the famed Rikidu Senen could match on his own. I'd much rather talk about how we're going to stop him from freeing this Juubi or stopping Naruto's suicidal attempts, she smiled as she clapped her hands together, sounding rather cheerful, contrasting her words. Okay. Fine. How about we all go? I can place a Horatian marker on you, a cane, and teleport us both away if we need to, or if we finish the mission. Satsuki can come with us. You two can defend me. I'll teleport Isobu away than us two, while Satsuki uses her own Horatian. Naruto exclaimed, not pleased with the option seeing as how it could risk both of his friends' lives. The cane and Satsuki both looked at each other, blinking their red eyes in confusion, the decision surprising them with its sudden appearance. Satsuki soon made up her mind though. She would support Naruto in this idea. Even if it was slightly flawed by assumptions they each had made. The cane, however, took a bit longer to agree to that part of the plan, but soon, she nodded, knowing that she couldn't risk the chances of the Juubi becoming released would be higher if Asobu were to be sealed. After all, Akatsuki already had two of the tailed beasts sealed. Now, they only needed six more, excluding Asobu. All right then, a cane smiled bitterly before it changed into a sadistic one, imagining how fun it would be if she were to kill the members of Akatsuki who had dared capture or attempted to kill her little brothers and sisters. Her blood-red eyes flashed in a gleam of light and she spoke in a deadly whisper. Let's get wild. Chapter 19. Mirai Senjutsu, ready? The words echoed throughout the area as the three stood on the shores of the once-destroyed village. The confirmation of the two females given, Naruto grabbed them both, allowing the Achiha to drop a marked kunai to the ground. Unfortunately, Satsuki was still unable to use the Horatian to the same level that he was, being incapable of placing a marker with her hands or teleporting to her chakra. She required a set coordinate to teleport to it, and the range was something that she wasn't able to develop with training. She couldn't teleport in a range, only into a determined location. That was a reason he didn't want either of them to go. He had developed the seconds to the point he had, but Satsuki's fighting style didn't use the Horatian. He didn't either, but he could easily incorporate it. This was his escape plan. A red flash appeared from the place the three were just standing as they both disappeared, teleporting to the mark Naruto had left on Toby. The redeed and blonde all ended, crouched to make themselves smaller as they looked up. Hakakane thought to herself as her red-eyed gaze traveled to the figures in front of her. Why did I and Naruto both have to be correct she questioned, jumping to the offensive as she rushed to Dara, hoping to eliminate him from the equation in this war against Akatsuki that they had just stumbled upon. Her chakra appeared around her fist, the dark red energy becoming visible to the shinobi as it swirled around her fist. She released the chakra before he had a chance to react, her hand piercing and burning through his chest. The chakra she wielded allowed her to cauterize the wound while simultaneously piercing through it. She didn't want to step in someone's blood after all. But to Dara dead, she turned her head around, seeing as two members attacked her, a blue-haired woman named Conan and an orange-haired man named Nagato. 
she avoided the two, not really in a mood to fight them, desiring, instead, to free her brother from the large Jito statue that was storing stealing her brother's chakra. Rushing towards the statue that had three eyes opened, she realized that three of her siblings had already been captured and used without their awareness between the time they had met the Akatsuki members a month or so ago. Her mind reminded her to remain calm, lest she get carried away and make a lapse in judgment. Her attention was forced away from destroying the statue when she felt the gravitational pull coming from behind her, pulling her towards the Rinnegan user. The cane had never faced anyone who had the eyes of her father, nor had she ever witnessed the power they held, with the exception of those that she was told in stories. The cane quickly used a blast of her chakra from her feet to assist the pull, quickening her velocity to reach Conan and Nagato. The movement caught the two off guard, distracting Conan from tagging the redeed with explosive paper, instead receiving a kick to the forearm she had raised to protect her face. The cane was quickly attacked by Nagato, who had used a black rod as a weapon. A cane could sense nothing from the strange black rods, thus avoiding the unknown item. She punched Nagato's stomach, but she was repelled by a gravitational force originating from the user. She was propelled towards Satsuki, who was busy in her own fight against Itachi and Kisum. Using the unsuspecting Rabenit's head to throw herself into the air, a cane lent the girl a hand by attacking Kissam. Quick a and listen to Axel World Ost bye bye for the next part and blood history. It was clear to Satsuki that her brother was holding back against her, appearing to struggle against the girl while maintaining his appearance within the Akatsuki. I'm still not strong enough Satsuki thought bitterly as her face lit up with a light scowl. Garasu was met with Itachi's kunai, locking them in a battle of strength that Satsuki avoided by using the leverage of the sword to throw herself over her brother, striking at his back. Itachi had yet to be informed that his sister knew the truth, having only recognized that they had been missing from the world for the past three years. Although Naruto had informed his teacher of some events, he had not told him how he caused Satsuki to join him in his mission to destroy Konoha. Itachi himself had assumed that his sister had gained knowledge of the village's treatment towards Naruto, and her lack of loyalty to the village, combined with the fact of Naruto being her best friend, had caused her to assist Naruto. Itachi himself had grown to dislike the village, specifically for the treatment his sister had suffered, of what he had been informed by Naruto anyways. Avoided at all times yet revered for the same reason why the Achiha had been isolated. Unhelped despite the trauma she had suffered from his own doing. Unwilling to adopt her into a family in fear of her clan name, yet revered and pampered in hopes of gaining favor with her. His previous words to both Danzo and Hiruzen still held true. I love my village over my clan, and I will do anything to keep the peace. But know that if any harm is to ever come to my foolish little sister, I will reveal everything to the world and come back to finish what they started. Kanoha over the Achiha, my sister over the village. His loyalty to the village had begun to fade two years ago, and he had to mentally take back the words he had muttered to Danzo from nearly a decade ago. No matter what darkness or contradiction lies within the village, I am still Itachi Achiha of the Leaf. That statement did not include his sister, and he refused to allow any harm to come to her unnecessarily. If she wanted to fight, he would allow her, but if anyone tried to manipulate or kill her, they would soon be facing the Shinigami. Itachi had also passed on his ideologies to Naruto, who he had guessed had begun to develop feelings for Satsuki. It was something that he was slightly joyful of. Love was one thing that would allow happiness on a truly deep scale, and if they could avoid idiotic drama that he had seen occur in many civilian relationships, which he knew they would because they lived the lives of shinobi, then the pain for them would be reduced to the level of unrelatable levels in comparison to their happiness. He had planned to die in his encounter with her and give her his eyes, making her the tragic hero of the legendary Ichiha clan, but it appeared that Naruto had changed his plan. He could see that Satsuki had no longer the desire to kill him. He could see her eyes, still holding shreds of innocence along with love for him, and it confused him on why she would do so, until his mind finally found the obvious answer. Damned at Naruto, she wasn't supposed to know his thoughts echoed throughout his mind, as the clash of steel echoed throughout the cave, the reason being the battle between the siblings. Nai-chan, please, come back to me, he heard her, the pleading voice, filled with sadness and bitterness, brightened by a sliver of hope contained deep within the darkness, she had always been trapped within by undesired causes. Itachi's chest suddenly became a hole of sorrow as a heavy and dark feeling came across him, sending a feeling of coldness throughout his body, his eyes softening as he looked at her soft red eyes piercing his own. I don't want to fight you. I love you, Nai-chan. Eat. The red gaze of the Sharingan softened further, spinning hypnotically, transforming into the blinding Manjiku Sharingan. Tsukiyomi. The world shifted in view from Satsuki's perspective, now within a red and black world with a blood red moon lighting up the world in a strange, inverted black and white color, similar to what her brother looked like. Tsuki, Itachi stated softly, bringing her in an embrace, a tear of guilt and sadness escaping his eyes as he held his trembling sister. I'm sorry. Please, don't leave me. Ever. 
the trembling form of Satsuki muttered, her voice slightly shaking as she wrapped her arms around him even tighter. I won't. I'll be back as soon as possible, little sister, he stated as he pushed her away gently, bending down to reach her height, lightly jabbing her head with his index and middle finger. He was surprised when she shook her head, looking at him straight in the face, her face twisted in concern. His jab had been avoided. No. I want you back right now. You shouldn't have to be living the life of a criminal, of a rogue, because that damn village and the fucking Sandane was such pathetic and incompetent coward who cared only for power. They could have easily framed it on Orochimaru, and who would believe his word over the Hokage, and you the black-haired girl was cut off by her sadly smiling brother. The secret was out and he had conclusive evidence that Satsuki knew the truth. And if that had happened, would you be happy as you are now? Naruto would still be fighting on the opposite side of you. I would be forced to fight him and put him in jail, label him a criminal. I refuse to do that. He protected you with his life and gave you the happiness that you've gained these past years. The least I could do for my student was to protect him, and that would conflict if that had happened, wouldn't it? Maybe the situation and solution weren't the best, but look at the bright side, Suki. I don't care about the bright side. Not everyone had to die. I refuse to believe the Kachan was part of the coup. I also know that none of the other kids my age were part of it. Why did they have to be killed? She asked, narrowed eyes glaring into his red eyes. No, she wasn't, but she was part of our family. Kachan did care about the village, but she cared more about you and the clan. She would have revealed everything or tried to exact revenge from the village. We couldn't afford the information or the attack causing the fourth great ninja war. The younger members weren't actually killed by me. They were killed by Abito, despite me deliberately saying to not allow the deaths of those younger than nine. I was forced along with him due to the time limit. I also can't challenge him with his ability of being able to phase through attacks. Any attack I do would go through him, and he seems to be able to use his Sharingan more than I can without undergoing blindness. I don't understand how though. Itachi finished, looking slightly frustrated with his inability to understand how his kinsman's abilities worked. Before Satsuki could say anything else in response, Itachi tapped her forehead before dispersing the illusion against her, successfully contacting this time. However, his final word struck her as the illusion faded. But that doesn't mean I don't regret it. The Sharingan-based world soon faded, allowing reality to hold its reign in Satsuki's mind, the dark cave, a disparity amongst the world she had been whisked into. The only proof of the occurrence was the small teardrop that had receded back into her eyes. Her mind was soon focused on Kisum as he heaved his Samahada towards her, intent on taking her chakra, weakening her to allow Itachi to kill her. Her head immediately went down, in a push-up position before moving herself around, lashing out against the man with her foot. The tip of her steel tooth sandals made contact with his nose, and the girl heard the crack of a bone. She used the rest of the momentum to throw herself upwards to catch the bleeding man. Her sword was met with his own, the fish-like creature not giving in and absorbing the chakra in her sword. Tsutsuki frustratingly added more chakra into her sword as they separated, lighting up the black blade with an edge of flames and the other with lightning. Itachi came above her and placed his hand on her shoulder to throw her away towards a cane. Hearing her brother say the name of his strongest illusionary technique and trusting him to take care of Kissam, she allowed herself to be carried towards the blue-haired woman and orange-haired man. She readied her katana, preparing to kill Nagato, the man who appeared to be giving a cane the hardest time, but her body suddenly gained a mind of its own, instead going in the opposite direction. As she hit the ceiling, she crouched onto one knee, using her chakra to stay attached. The kunai she had just launched had increased exponentially as they targeted Conan. The cane also attacked Conan at the same time, using her chakra to counteract the gravity pushing against her. When Conan dodged a cane, she went straight towards the kunai, unaware of their existence, until she grew close enough to hear the sharp whistling of the air being split. Her body folded into white paper that began to spread away from her center. The kunai harmlessly threw her. The fuck? She can turn it into paper. Satsuki asked herself, having not paid much attention to the fight that occurred between a cane and Conan. The girl shook the incredibility in her mind off and began to prepare to move her ration after her blonde crush gave the signal. She rushed at Nagato, her sword blocked by a black rod that had chakra flooding through it. Using the leverage, she threw herself towards a cane, disappearing in a black flash with a redeed at the same time Naruto and Isobu, who had been shrunk, both disappeared in a red and gray flash. The flash of red was all that was visible to him before an attack landed where his body had previously occupied. The ball of fire had melted the ground below him, proving their heat that the blue-eyed man could feel even from such a distance. His responsive attack was to send a blast of wind towards them, using the dust on the ground to capture their field of vision. His hyperosmia and augmented auditory perception allowed him to perceive his adversary, and he attacked the man, using the wind to accumulate him, hoping to kill his opposition. The sharp sound of the wind cutting itself made itself apparent near the masked man, consequently allowing him to dodge the attack. 
Hucking Dio ready. The 16-year-old's frustrations ran through his thoughts, not really wanting to fight for his life anymore. He was getting tired of all the battles he had to do and would be doing for the foreseeable future. He would still destroy Konoha, but he could see why his Kaiufu desired peace so much. It was getting tiresome, fighting over and over, not for fun or as a hobby, but to live and continue living, to be forced to constantly protect his friends and family, to defend his happiness, his future of peace. After Kanoha is gone, I'm gonna sue for peace his thought process was cut off by the black blur that struck him in the ribs, lightly brushing them. I'll think about it later. His response to the attack was to send a blast of air, propelling him towards Isobu. He was intercepted by a green plant-like being who was half black and half white. The hell. He's of darker skin, much darker than those in the Land of Lightning, and the other half is paler than even Arachimaru, and is a plant. The only thing missing is being like Kisum with his gills. Naruto would have questioned the strange being further, but he had to dodge the oncoming attack on his person. The black-clad teenager scowled before going through a series of hand symbols. Thanks Nai-chan Naruto commented as the area around him became covered in mist while sparing the other two girls. My my, Naruto. You've grown so much since I've seen you as a child, Abito stated, his voice a mixture between blithe anger and soft and malicious glee. I'll enjoy killing you, just like I did with Minato-sensei and Kishin and Ichan. The words were meant to psychologically anger Naruto, whether it be through the reminder of what he had done to ruin the boy's life or through speaking the name of the dead. Naruto's eyes darkened into the cold eyes of electrical blue, not allowing the man to boil his blood. However, the effect on him was obvious with the thinning of his lips and his narrowed eyes. He moved towards the man, silently creating a shadow clone behind him. You hold no right to speak their names he whispered into the man's ears, his blade going straight through his throat. The real Naruto was thrown towards the Bijuu before Ibido had a chance to come out of his Kamui. As soon as Naruto touched the gray scales of the, he looked towards Satsuki and Akane, using a pulse of his chakra to alert them of the success of the mission. Soon, they disappeared in a flash, similar to the black and red flash created by Satsuki, as she and Akane escaped. Despite the shrunken size of Isobu, he was still a very large creature. When he was teleported above the sea, the water imploded while the surrounding water raised up violently before settling back into the sea. Naruto used his chakra to keep himself above the water before walking towards the shore where the redeed was waiting. When he reached the shore, he made sure to activate the seal around Yuzushio, creating an invisible barrier that would hide the excess chakra leaking out from the covered area, making them trackless with chakra, a requirement with the unconscious Asobu who was leaking out high levels of chakra, relatively anyway. What are we supposed to do now? Satsuki asked, unsure of what their next step was. Weren't we supposed to be beginning Senjutsu training right now? Yep. A cane, can you warn your siblings to be careful right now and to make their Jinchuriki stay hidden? I don't know how long it'll take for us to do this. Jiraiya said he took decades and he still hasn't mastered it. Don't worry about that, A cane stated, knowing that it would be much easier for the two in front of her to complete the Senjutsu training than it took for Jiraiya. Unlike you two, Jiraiya doesn't have a natural affinity for Senjutsu. He can still do it, but it would take him far longer than those who are directly related to father. That still doesn't answer how long it'll take us. I'm thinking about a month or two. The Achiha heiress asked, unsure herself. She didn't really have any figures to use to guess how long it would take them. It'll probably take Satsuki about a month. Naruto's larger reserves will take him a little less. Probably about two weeks. If he can master Sinjutsu though, he'll finally be able to use my chakra cloak properly without dying at the trade-off. He can also merge the two to make it stronger. That'll take us about an extra three weeks to master it, but we don't need to master it right now. He can use a bit of the extra time, if we use a month, to fully master it. Thinking so, Akane responded, still thinking about what she could do with Naruto to make him stronger. You two can also use Cage Bunshin to speed up the process. That way, you can also train in something else. Naruto, I have something for you, but Satsuki. She turned to face the girl she just addressed. Satsuki turned to her, questioning what she wanted her to do and what she was going to do with Naruto. She was a little envious that Akane would spend all her time with Naruto, but she knew that neither of them had feelings for each other. The phoenix are masters of using fire. You can learn from them to control the very element. Maybe you can also learn to use the separate parts of fire too, instead of combining them. Imagine if you could cause the very air around a person to become suffocating due to the heat. Or worse. I don't know about your lightning though. You can always ask if someone there knows how to control lightning, Akane finished, matching the smirk on the Achiha's face. She nodded and Naruto, realizing that they were about to be separated, realized something. Wait. His voice caused Satsuki to stop her next action and look towards him. A piece of paper landed on her hand before fusing into her skin. She watched the same thing happen to the other two and asked Naruto the purpose of the seals. It's a communication seal. 
If you channel chakra through it while speaking, then we can hear you. I really wish it could replicate telepathy, but I can't get the seal to connect with the brain for some reason, Naruto uttered in frustration. Uchius no Jutsu. It was frustrating that so many people in the world wanted lived for war, thrived on it. It had translated into her hatred that they always wanted to wage battle, to kill and steal, to live in excitement in the thrill of the fight, to feel adrenaline pumping through them as blades clashed and blood ran down, as everything was torn asunder. And the key that they searched for. Her siblings were treated as beasts, as weapons of war, used as a source of power to assist them in annexing and destroying, as a way to show off their power. The idea was still in practice today, demonstrated by the four beings in front of her. They were all contained in Jinchuriki, some of them with better relationship to their hosts, specifically Seiken who didn't speak often to her host, having a mutually beneficial relationship with her host, rather than the ones of acquaintances and friendships created by the other tailed beasts, with the exception of Matatabi, who seemed to be in a sexual relationship with a dirty blonde Naruto had met previously. It was still better, however, than the relationship shared by Shukaku and his host. Shukaku could be blamed for this due to his unrelenting assault on the Ritid's mind. It angered her that only five of them were currently present in the meeting place, currently being hosted in the unaware subconscious mind of Naruto. Three of her siblings were gone, absorbed by the husk of the Juubi, with one being weakened and currently resting. Why have you brought us here, sister? The question floated to her ears as she looked at the speaker. The Akatsuki are about to actively hunt all of us down. Right now, we have Asobu and myself in Yuzu which may over there being in Konoha. The rest of you three need to be careful. Make sure none of you are outside of your villages. Seiken, I want you to tell your host to go into hiding somewhere where you can't be tracked. Don't go into highly populated places. You said your host has someone following him around. Are they agreeable to terms? She asked. Yes. The girl, I believe her name is Hotter, will follow you to Kata wherever he goes. He is very protective of her, despite denials, and so, if he realizes that powerful enemies are coming for him, he'll either tell her to leave, which won't work, or he'll go into hiding. His pride low amount compared to others won't get in the way of his protection of her. I can, if I tell him, to get him to a hiding place. Seiken's voice was pleasing to listen to, being rather soft-spoken sweet to the ears and flowing throughout the royal blue void, speckled by darkly shaded golden stars. Would he agree to come to Yuzushio? The place has been surrounded by seals to prevent the leakage of our chakra to make us untraceable by chakra. She would need to borrow a shadow clone of her hosts to teleport to 3D Azushio. Perhaps. I can't conclude decisions from him. He's antisocial and just wants to float about no goals to keep, except for the girl so it is likely. I'll ask him when to do so. Good. Contact me when you get the answer. We can't afford to let the Juubi become revived. She didn't say anything more about the subject. They already knew of the disaster that could fall if the beast they had been created from were to reappear on the planet. Other matters to address. How strong are you? Am she thought as she listened to the three, Chmei staying quiet as she had already met Izjin Churiki. Only one of them was strong enough to defend themselves from the Akatsuki, while the other two were too weak. Seiken, Matatabi, you two can't let your shinobi become captured. Train them in your powers, make them stronger, as strong as possible while staying hidden. Jayuki spoke soon after she had finished her sentence. Matatabi, tell Yujito to see B and to tell him that she is going to train to master your powers. There is this island that will hide your chakra and allow you to train until she is stronger. B can also train her in other subjects. He will agree. The cane knee, Yudakata doesn't want to use my powers, believing that it will cause too much reliance on it. He only wants power through his own hand. Violet eyes narrowed at the white slug, who quickly continued. It is possible that he will train in it if I tell him of the dangers, Seiken finished, hoping to please her older sister. Telling Chimei to get fueled to higher levels as well as to bring her to Yuzushio, Akane left the subconscious realm hosted deep within Naruto, going back to the mindscape. Many people in her life were quiet she discarded the years she had known Naruto before she was able to truly get to know him. The volume control that they all had was something she was grateful for. It was irritating that so many people seemed to be incapable of talking without being heard from across the street as, though it was impossible for someone within arm's reach to be able to hear them when soft-spoken. More than that was the love people had for their own voices the gift of Kami, bestowed upon the unworthy world of mortals to be heard at all times. The difference between them and the people who were cursed with loud voices was clear as glass. Ayo was another person who was quiet he wasn't soft-spoken, no, but was rather someone who didn't speak with high volume, rather clear and yet, unable to be heard from more than several meters away. It was one of the rougher ones she had heard, but it wasn't unpleasant to godsend. What do you know about Sinjutsu? The question floated to her ears and her response was quick. She knew next to nothing about Sinjutsu besides that it allowed you to integrate natural chakra with the chakra within a person. There are many types of Sinjutsu, each unique to the creatures that use them. 
all of them cause features unique to the way you learned it. For example, if you were to use Phoenix Age mode, it will increase your physical prowess by fivefold, but the unique aspect is of the other abilities it will give you. Io told her of the abilities granted to her when she used the Phoenix Age mode, and as she listened, she realized that Akane's ideas had far more merit than she had credited, but those thoughts were incomplete capable of so much more than the heating of air. A couple of hours later, she started her training. Chapter 20. Premonition, a hidden world, an isolated island far to the west of the elemental nations, known to the rest of the world as the home of dragons. The island was considered impossible to locate by normal human means the distance from the dwelling of humans was too large to travel, and the water surrounding it contained many demonic spirits and beasts. The Kaiju Ocean was the most feared of all the oceans, even above the mysterious Hakubu Ocean that spanned west from Lightning Country, northwest from the rest of the elemental nations. Legendary beasts from the era before event the of the Rikidu Senen reside deep within the sea, such as the Akura Kamui and Yamada no Arachi, who had once been rumored to have battled with the Yandane when the man had gone towards Izushi Agakur in order to improve his sealing skills. No one knew that the man had gone there to kill the beast who had taken his girlfriend Kishina Yuzumaki, nor did they know that this was the battle where he had proposed to the legendary Kinoichi. Even further than the serpent laid a large hole with waterfalls cascading down into the dark unknown. Within the hidden world laid the legendary beasts hailed by the world as creatures of power and immense fortune. Naruto, you said that your goal was to destroy Konoha. Let me ask you. Why? Bitsura, the first dragon Naruto had summoned, asked him, the large dragon lying on the grass-covered ground, his serpent-like body twisting in a circle. I never understood my godfather, Jiraiya, and his deep desire for peace. Why would he even dream of something so impossible? I believed humans to be incapable of truly understanding one another, to live with others without attempting to gain anything for themselves, without being corrupted by their greed, their pride, their lust. I have suffered at the hands of society as have many others, such as my fellow Jinchuriki who were discriminated against due to a Bijuu being sealed within them. The blue-eyed teenager got caught up in his memories, his mind leaving the present and going back to the time when he was four. I remember the deep-seated hatred that everyone in the village seemed to have for me, always glaring, refusing me the respect the courtesy that every human being deserves, let alone a child. As I grew older and talked to Jiraiya, I realized why, he said as he remembered the words of the man he admired. Naruto, in this world, hatred runs rampant in the hearts of humans, whether they be shinobi or civilians, royalty for commoners, nobility or peasants, patrician or plebeian. It is corrupted and led to so many getting hurt, physically, mentally, spiritually, sexually, or emotionally. I don't want that to happen to anyone I care about anymore. I once tried to shield my students from the world, hiding them from everyone during the second war, but in the end, it caught up to us and they got swallowed up by the flames. I finally realized that maybe peace was just impossible, you know. But Jiraiya didn't want to give up, he didn't want to allow anyone he cared to get hurt. Not Arachimaru, not his sensei, Tsunade, my father, my mother, or me. Unfortunately, he never found a good enough answer. His first answer was to make humans understand each other so that they realize what they were doing, but at least two problems jumped out at him, he started. One of the first problems they had was how to make people understand each other. There were millions of people living within the continent, each suffering from their own problems, each with their own desires, each with their own flaws. The second reason the more important one, in Naruto's opinion was that there would always be people who don't desire peace those who thrived in the flames of war where battles reigned supreme and dead bodies littered the floor, painting it red. There would always be those who want more, who desire power, sexual satisfaction, and money. Naruto was understanding towards these desires as he knew the needs of humans. However, he also knew the concept of when he had too much when he gained more than what was truly necessary. Naruto would never stop trying to grow stronger he refused to allow anyone to surpass him and consequently hurt someone he loved, but he didn't need anything else, nor would he strive towards it due to manipulation by greed. But power corrupts leading to a desire for even more things, and that eventually gets to a point where one person has too much. Too much power, too much money, and it never satisfies them. They keep chasing after it until they die or realize that it doesn't matter. But at that point, it becomes pointless. The damage has already been done. Families are left impoverished, children left orphaned or abused, men and women sexually harassed, raped, assaulted. I couldn't stand that, but I also knew that Jurea's answer was wrong, and I told him that. He didn't get angry because he too didn't believe that to be the answer, at least, not completely. The blonde looked down his eyes darkening. So I came up with my own idea, my own answer. I was told a story about the children of the Rikidu Senen Asura and Indra one, who wanted to create peace through subjugation, through fear as the ruler of the entire continent, the other desired peace in the same way Jiraiya did. Neither worked. Both siblings fought to the death. Neither would work. 
peace through subjugation is just dictatorship and understanding those of different cultures, of those who hold different values each of whom have suffered differently and desire something else is far above their capabilities. So I decided that there must be a ruler, someone, or government that could punish those that needed to be punished for their crimes, an eye for an eye, but not in the way a dictator would. No, I want something else, something different. Itsura raised an eye in interest. Both. To create an empire where everyone was united into one culture, one way of a large variable lifestyle that gave leeway to many things, yet forbid the use of violence through appropriate punishment befitting of their crimes. You understand how difficult that is to achieve. You must first destroy all those in power on the continent. That will take years to accomplish. Every daimyo, every cage, every lord, and every royalty will be against you for trying to take away their lives of luxury, of their very culture that you are trying to create. I know, but just as there are those who are against me, there will be those who will support me. Those who are tired of fighting, of seeing their sons and daughters, or their mother and father, their siblings, their friends constantly dying due to the selfishness of those in power. I will start a revolution by using those within to overthrow those in power the bastards who are corrupted by their power. However, after that, I will use my own to take over that country. I will slowly unite these countries. I know that I will have enemies even inside of that. After all, killing breeds sorrow, which breeds hatred, which leads to more killing. It's a cycle that I'm going to break with Ashura's side of the argument with a little of Indra's. After all, who would attempt to overthrow someone who has so much love power and support someone who has dramatically decreased the amount of people who were killed, of children who had to go to war? The very few that will. They get punished by the entire government, by both the continent's people as well as the ruling body. And the first step you attempt to take in order to rid the world of this corruption is through Kanoha. Yes. That is my first reason. My second reason, the one that I've held on for much longer, is for pure revenge. The destruction of Kanoha is simply my revenge, yet it will also become the first step. You can understand my desire for revenge, yes. They have made me made so many innocent suffer due to their ignorance, their bigotry, and their arrogance. I refuse to let all of the abuse the agony suffered by my teacher, my love, my family, go unpaid. So you desire both revenge and peace. Those are your reasons, your goals. Naruto nodded in confirmation, silently hoping that the dragon wouldn't attempt to dissuade him from his goals. Very well. The serpentine-shaped dragon slowly rose from his perch on the ground, his long tail winding around the air. Naruto Uzumaki Namikas, son of Kashina Uzumaki and Minato Namikas. The dragon clan will assist you in your ambition to conquer this world and remain by your side until this dream is complete. Do you Naruto Uzumaki Namikas accept the oath of the dragon? Dark violet eyes scanned the area subconsciously as the owner quickly moved through the terrain, using the chakra from her sister as a beacon. Hello, she started a little loudly, allowing them to notice her without startle. She didn't need them to attack her at this time, even if it would be ineffective. Who are you two? The younger girl to the right of the brunette said. My name is Akane and I have business with you, Yudakata-san. This is Naruto, my Jinchuriki. You are the one Seiken wishes me to speak with. Very well. I shall hear what you have to say, Seiken's Jinchuriki stated, ignoring the girl who looked at him in confusion. She could see the protectiveness that Seiken spoke of, small movements showing that he was ready to intercept her, stepping up in front of the blue-eyed girl. His narrowed eyes directed at her told her that he understood her insinuation, but the girl beside him did not. Inchuriki. Like you Kata-sama. Hot air's voice flowed into a cane's ears, and the redeed moved her violet gaze from the brunette to the honey blonde girl standing next to him. Yes. You probably know me better as Kaiubi. I was sealed within Naruto. You know, like what a Jinchuriki usually means in these times. Her mocking voice was missed by the girl, who was too busy looking at the clone next to her, but Yudakata did not. But how did the girl was interrupted by Yudakata? And what do you wish to speak to me about? His stoic look was on the redeed, who turned her own eyes back to him. A formal invitation to the village of Yuzushi Agakur. As you know, Akatsuki is a dangerous organization, and while we have beaten half of their members, the strongest of them still remain. They have already captured four of us nine. Right now, we are tight in battle, but if it goes on, I have no doubt that you will be captured soon. Thus, I want to offer you advice to hide somewhere, create a low profile of sorts, or go to a village. Or you along with your friend could come to Yuzushi Agakur. It is the most secure area we know, Akane stated. I see. You understand if I would appreciate a couple minutes to consider and discuss with Hadaru. The stoic face hadn't changed Akane couldn't help but be grateful that he wasn't prideful enough to say that he could take care of himself. Not that I would allow him no, for too many of my siblings have already been captured. If he's smart, he'll realize that he doesn't have much of a choice without placing himself and the girl in extreme danger. The seal around Yuzu was still activated against unfamiliar chakra, making sure that spying wasn't effective against them, a required asset considering the speciality of Black Zetsu. 
Very well, her reply came quickly, allowing them space for their private discussion. Not that she couldn't hear it. Her ears were much better than normal humans were used to. She quickly ignored it after the first two sentences. Adaru, is there anything you don't like? He asked a woman who had once tried to get him to become her teacher to train her. No. I don't want either of us to die, and I also want to have fun. That had changed after their encounter with Shiranami the man had destroyed her beliefs and dreams, and it caused several adversities for both of them to overcome. In the end, there were consequences for their actions, and they both suffered. Hotter was no longer capable of using chakra past her reserves, which had been dwindled down to low levels, putting her on par with Jenin, a strange result of the formerly on her back being used then removed. When Yutakata had removed it by focusing his Bijuu's chakra to overwhelm them, the burst of chakra had left him unable to focus chakra into his left hand. They discussed it for several minutes, debating between the benefits of going to this new village, familiar barely to the brunette, compared to going out, staying hidden by themselves. When Yutakata considered the possibility of being tracked, he quickly realized a few things in quick succession transiting from one thought to the other. Seiken warned him about the Akatsuki not that long ago. Giving a tolerance of one month, that meant that Akatsuki had managed to capture the weapons of different villages within three months. Four likely powerful people, well monitored by the villages, had been kidnapped and killed without notice, if the response of the villages or the lack thereof was anything to go by. Clearly, Akatsuki had a tracker and spymaster, one of high skills if their feats were included. Aridid and her Jinchuriki had a way to deter this tracking as well if they hadn't been attacked in surprise. What choice do we really have to make? If we go off by ourselves, we may as well both die. Yutakata was confident in his ability. He was high jonin level, even without the use of his non-dominant hand, but he couldn't take down multiple cage level shinobi, even if he allowed Seiken to help him. If I want to protect her he thought, glancing at the girl as they walked back towards the redeed and blonde. To do so, I need to become much stronger. If they want to be allies with me, they might spar with me, that should help, especially if they have other members. Would you accompany us? I would like to ask some questions regarding Yuzu and the residents. The brunette asked a woman. I apologize, but I currently have other duties. Naruto, the original, is currently working on a new technique to allow him to engage Akatsuki on an easier level. I need to help him with his research. However, the clone here can escort you towards the village and answer your questions. However, he is about to run out of chakra, maybe in an hour. I hope this is acceptable. Yes, Yudakata responded quickly, hiding his surprise that the blonde was a clone. Dark yellow eyes followed the two figures from his perch in the large tree. Next to him was his partner, strangely quiet given his talkative nature. I'll get the girl, you can get the guy, he commanded as he sank back into the tree. His partner, however, jumped off the tree and charged towards his target. Surprise Jinchuriki chan I hope you understand that I need to capture you. Toby said blithely as he threw multiple shuriken and kunai towards the brunette. Yudakata dodged in surprise at the attack, grabbing hot air and jumping away from the man with the Akatsuki cloak. The Akatsuki wear recognizable clothing. A black cloak with red clouds. Hotter, run. Yudakata shouted as he threw multiple smoke bombs towards the ground. Damn it. The brunette's calm demeanor faded as he became angry. I can't beat them, not with how I am now. I need to escape. Think. From a flute flew out many bubbles with a black texture on the edges, transparency now impossible. The dark bubbles wrapped around both the creator and his friend, allowing them to float away from the scene. The masked man pouted unnoticeably. Damn it. They got away. Zetsu Senpai had better let me teleport to the place, he stated childishly. Hadaru grew increasingly scared and disgusted as a black substance crawled under her kimono and to her thighs, before wrapping itself around her navel, the section becoming jet black as Hadaru's mind blanked out, taken over by the parasitic nature of the creature. No. The girl mentally screamed out. Her head pounded painfully, mentally straining to expel the commanding force within her mind. You will submit. A deep voice echoed through her mind, compelling her towards the spoken action. The flash of blue passed her mind, the form of her friend standing behind her, his hand covered in red chakra, slowly corrupting the on her back, removing it slowly. An explosion of red and purple flew through her eyes, surrounding her and rushing towards the brunette. I heard him. It was my fault. If I wasn't such an idiot, such a pest, he wouldn't have lost his left arm the girl thought. Maybe if I just die, he would be happier. Sorrow flooded her mind and heart, amplified by the black creature on her navel. This was unseen by outside observers, the black ink forcing the transparency of the bubbles to become non-existent. Yudakata's plan of discreet escape had backfired on him, and he had yet to realize it. Yudakata sama I'm sorry. I couldn't resist this evil spirit, and right after we had beaten Shiranami too. A silent tear left her eyes before her body submitted to the control of the dark creature, her mind slowly going dark. Yippee. 
Zetsu Senpai signaled me, Toby cheered loudly before using his eyes to teleport towards his partner's chakra. When Toby arrived, he saw the previous bubble slowly descending onto the edge of the forest. A hand went up to block the kick to the owner's face, the force throwing Yudakata back. Ow. The statement was repeated thrice in rapid succession. What the heck man. That hurt my foot. The silly statement coming from the orange masked man only served the Jinchuriki's ire. Turning around, he jumped forth, only to be intercepted by a blast of water coming from his left. Hado. What are you doing? The question went unanswered, increasing his frustrations. No, Yudakata sama I'm sorry I was so weak. I betrayed you. Red chakra began to develop around Yudakata, the unmistakable Bijuu shroud forming a carmine tail on the back, extending from his tailbone. Just this time. If you don't use my chakra, you can't possibly escape them. Do you wish to risk yourself and the girl? The Bruna didn't understand what caused Hot Air's unexpected assault on him. If I get far away enough, then I can disrupt it. Bijuu chakra was a corrosive source of energy for those who weren't in Chiriki or those who had been exposed to it as children, though they weren't completely immune. If he didn't use it, he would lose. If he used the shroud, it would cause damage to Hot Air just by being near her. No choice. The sickly yellow eye tinting the natural blue eyes of the blonde was concerning, but he was sure that it was due day. Yudakata's head flew back, the punch aimed at his face hitting thin air, before it was grabbed, the corrosive chakra surrounding it burning away at the cloak covering it. Toby giggled loudly. I'm immune to Bijuu chakra, Jinchuriki chan. The masked man grabbed the opposing arm and lifted him off the ground before pulling his hands away and dropping to the ground, using his hands to add rotation before thrusting his feet up. Yudakata crossed his forearms to block the two legs, but the force pushed him upwards. Weaving a string of hand signs, a blast of water came out of his mouth. It was counteracted by a large fireball, the collision resulting in steam being released. Using his pipe, Yudakata blew bubbles towards the ground, the red-tinted spheres exploding upon physical contact with the ground. Surprise rang on the brunette's face, the result being a shock due to his lack of use in Seiken's chakra. The surprise cleared quickly as a blast of fire came towards him. Letting out his own stream of water, Yudakata fell back, gaining some distance in order to plan without distractions. A slight grunt from his side forced his gaze towards it. W. What as a shinobi, the brunette had seen many grievous injuries, ranging from people having fingers or digits missing to missing entire limbs or limbs. He had even seen a mutilated face resulting from a combination of a fire attack and an earth-covered fist. The current shock was caused by the person who had just become unattached to her limb, her leg to be more precise. Haru, what the hell is wrong with you? Tears were flowing from the blue eyes of his only friend, yet she didn't make any noise past the initial grunt that she had let out several seconds ago. Should you really let your guard down in a fight? Eyes on the birdie. Two voices simultaneously stated, the first one deep and hoarse, the owner invisible to his eyes, and the second coming from his left, the blithe tone unregistered, as the nuke nun tried to find the source of the third voice. An anguished scream burst from his lips, the owner holding his biceps, blood dripping from between his fingers before a second kunai, engulfed in blood-red fire that tore through his fingers and the same area as the previous wound. Rasps came from Yudakata as he retrieved his left hand from the bicep, the arm now hanging uselessly, the fire having cauterized the wound, injuring him even further. Both my arms are practically useless now. Yudakata thought. The two kunai had severed then cauterized a deep gash on his bicep, removing the chance for Seiken's chakra to heal the injury. His left arm could no longer have chakra flowing through it, removing the strength required to equally fight with the man in front of him. I've lost. There was no possible way to escape from the masked man, not if he was able to track them as well as he had. The least I could do is keep Hot Air alive he thought before throwing multiple smoke bombs, creating a large area clouded by dark grey smoke. Taking the bubble pipe into his left hand, Yudakata began to blow out large bubbles each one encased by black ink. The bubbles began to flow towards all three members present. The one reaching Toby captured him within, but he was able to break out of it quickly after finding himself floating. Hot Air's bubble floated towards the direction where Yuzushi Agakur was, the opposite direction of his own. Setsu allowed himself to stay in the bubble. The location they were going could be helpful. Even if it was useless, he could still go back to the base. Abito didn't require help at the moment either. If there was even the slightest chance of valuable information, he had to take it as an absolute certainty. Toby soon caught up to the bubble that was radiating far more than any of the other bubbles. The injury and lack of experience with the chakra of his Bijuu had cost Yudakata. Yudakata's eyes widened as an electric current ran into his spinal cord at the base of his neck. Focused from the back of his bubble. An agonized cry came from his throat as his spinal cord began to lose the connection to his nervous system. The brunette's eyes rolled back as his knees buckled before he collapsed, paralyzed from the neck down, right after meeting the red eyes of his captor. Toby giggles happily at completing his mission before he grabs the unconscious body and sends it to his own dimension. 
though be Kamuya Tazetsu to report his success, but held his tongue as he looked down at the whirlpool around the sea stopping. What? Yuzushi Agakur should be dead. The last Zetsu stopped himself before he could continue, the rest of the thoughts racing quickly through his mind and coming with only two possibilities. Toby. Kill this girl as soon as I detach from her, the black creature stated before sliding off of the girl's navel through the sleeves. Toby hadn't trained in Raiden, but his abilities with the kunai served him well as the blade pierced through the girl's head and brain within milliseconds. Zetsu scowled deeply as his mind raced. Someone has disrupted my plans. Yuzushi Agakur should not be alive, the only Yuzumaki alive are Tsunade Senju, Naruto Yuzumaki, Karen Yuzumaki, Fuku Yuzumaki, and Nagato Yuzumaki. Out of those five, only the Jinchuriki has the possibility of doing this. I would know if Tsunade or Nagato did anything. Fuka and Karen are meaningless in the grand scheme of things. They shouldn't be a part of this. Zetsu let out a chuckle as he continued his thoughts. So the Jinchuriki has begun his movement. Does he truly believe that he is capable of achieving anything worthwhile? I have rendered legends under my control. I have centuries over you brat. Do you want to play this game? Then your life is forfeit. Tsutsuki's jet black eyes opened up to a sea of dark colors, ranging from royal blue to a majestic shade of amethyst, with black stars lacing the sky. Her gaze locked in front of her, eyebrows raised at the woman standing in front of her. Who are you and why are you here? They clearly weren't in the real world. Probably a dream, maybe my subconscious. The girl mused before shaking it off as she observed the dark-haired woman in front of her. She was in her mid-twenties with long spiky hair cascading down her back, two shoulder-length bangs framing her face. Her dark eyes and light pink lips matched Satsuki's own, although a little bigger. She was at Satsuki's height, standing at a frame of 1.7 meters, her body covered by a beautiful black kimono with a golden trim, decorated with small black lotuses, wrapped by a crimson obi. I'm simply a ghost of the past. As for my purpose here, that will come in time. Introduce yourself, my little descendant, the woman stated. Her descendant? Who is this woman? Like I said, I'm but a ghost from the past. The woman's response caught her off guard as she realized that her thoughts had echoed into reality. She would have to do a better job at keeping those in her head. My name is Satsuki Achiha, the teenager stated, a little embarrassed. You need not be embarrassed. As for why I'm here, I'm here to help you, but I must first tell you a story. I'm sure you have the time, yes. The older woman stated. Satsuki shook her head in confirmation. She had yet to be told a single story that was boring or useless. This woman had an abundance of chakra, the most potent she had ever met. She knew only of three beings with such potency, herself included. However, neither Akain, Naruto, or herself could come close to matching the overwhelming sense of chakra. Fortunately, the woman wasn't exuding enough to actually cause harm, nor did she radiate any form of ill intent. In fact, she seemed a little happy. Then let me tell you the story of Indra and Ashura, she stated. Satsuki recognized both names from what Akain had told her before, but they hadn't been the focus in that story. I see that you recognize the two names. What do you know of them? I know that they are the children of the Rikidu Senen, and that they were the ancestors of the Achiha and Senju clan. I see. Very well then. The woman sat on her knees before beginning her story. Indra and Ashura Tsutsuki were the two children of Hagoromo, who you know as the Rikidu Senen. As children, Indra and Ashura read through all of the scrolls and journals that were written on the uses of chakra. Under their father, the siblings learned Ninshk. The woman sighed as though this was where the trouble began. From the start, Indra was the far more talented of the two, innovating Ninshu and transforming it to be applicable to everyday situations by using hand seals. Their father hoped that this would allow one of them to become his successor and end conflict in the world. More and more people grew amazed with the power she showed and began to follow Indra's example. They began using it to benefit themselves and their villages. However, they soon began to focus solely on the physical aspect, ignoring the spiritual side. Satsuki watched a woman's face who showed sorrow and anger at the villagers' actions. Soon, a creature approached Indra and through praise and compliments, as well as manipulation, caused isolation and harshness. Indra soon awakened the eyes that the Achiha are so proud of. The Sharingan. He introduced himself as Zetsu and stated that with it, Indra could become even stronger than the Rikidu Senen. Soon, Indra began to focus greatly on training in hopes of surpassing him, growing harsh and cold towards everyone. The teenager looked at the woman, whose tone had shifted to regret. To decide who would become his successor, he sent the two siblings to revive a foreign land. Indra was lucky in his location, the land was fertile due to the power of a god tree sapling. The people, however, were sick due to their reliance on the nutrients. Indra was impatient and forced the villagers to destroy the sapling and discover water. Indra returned home but was forced to wait for a couple of years for Ashura to also return. Now, the woman's voice was a little bitter and spiteful. The idiot returned with villagers from his mission and went to meet with his father, along with Indra, to select the successor. 
however, Indra's goals and views suffered from both Ashur and Hagoromo. During the wait, Black Zetsu began to manipulate Indra into anger and restlessness. When Ashur was chosen as the successor, because Indra failed to empathize with others, she grew enraged. Apparently, the village had destroyed itself from conflict over water. Indra left, bitter towards the family and growing in power, hoping to challenge Ashura to the ride as Hagoromo's successor. Again, her tone became regretful. Indra killed two people, her best friends, in order to awaken the Manjiku Sharingan, as Black Zetsu had said. On the night of Asura's celebration as the successor, Indra attacked the village, voicing disdain for her father and Ninshk, insisting that Ninjutsu was superior and the true means for peace. Ashura had been given his father's power and was able to repel the weak attack from Indra, who believed that all the power was unnecessary. Hagoromo had everyone share their chakra with Ashura, who combined it with his own to fend off the attacks. Indra, however, didn't want to kill Ashura because they were siblings and they both loved each other. Years later, Indra went into hiding and formed a sect that supported ninjutsu. As Hagoromo was rendered bedridden as he neared the end of his life, Indra approached Hagoromo, telling him that his cowardly approach to peace would only bring about greater wars. Ashura and Indra fought once again, but Ashura had trained for this attack, and they eventually tied because Indra refused to unleash everything to kill Ashura. Indra hated Hagoromo, but not Ashura. Ashura and Indra eventually died with neither accomplishing anything. Indra wanted peace through power. Ashura wanted peace through understanding. Neither could understand the other's ideals. They began a cycle of reincarnations, always meeting in battle. I believe that their last reincarnations were the two known as Madara Chiha and Hashirama Senju, although they were weaker than the two original. Tsutsuki's awe grew as she realized just how powerful the two siblings had been. Madara Chiha was one of the strongest shinobi to live, and he hadn't even reached Indra's level. The same went for Hashirama. So, do you still wish to know who I am? The woman's pink lips moved as she asked the question, forming a light smirk. Tsutsuki observes everything about the woman again. It seemed that black was her main theme, as nearly everything she wore was dark. I know who you are. Why are you here? Because you are my latest incarnation. Ashura's is Naruto. Both of you have finally done something no one else has done. You love each other. All of our previous incarnations gained their dislike for the other, but they never gained their love. After all, Indra deeply loved Ashura, even if they both got in each other's way. Because of this, I'm here to warn you. Black Zetsu is your main enemy. He has manipulated many people in his attempt to achieve his goal. He has been working for a millennia to revive the Juubi. He even manipulated me, but I've grown from it in my death. The Juubi in the past was far weaker than what it's really capable of. I learned that it was greatly weakened when its fruit, from its other form, was taken and eaten by Kagaya, our grandmother. What was Kagaya like? Satsuki questioned, wanting as much information as possible. If Yubi was as strong as she said, it would be nearly impossible to beat it with how strong she currently was. Kagaya was a great and loving woman. She loved her children and grandchildren. Unfortunately, she died soon after Indra and Ashura turned six due to a chakra disease that formed because of how potent the initial fruit's power was. Her sons only survived because it was part of them before they were even born. When it spread, it was far less potent, so it wasn't harmful. As for her power, she could even beat my father when he was in his prime. She had both the Byakugan and the third eye, what I call the Shurinigan. So, I'm your reincarnation. Does that mean that I'm just you? Satsuki questioned, a little annoyed at her constant repetition. The woman let out a small chuckle and leaned over. Of course not. You have only gained one thing from me, the same as Naruto. Both of you have gained our chakra's potency. You haven't even received my eyes. Unlike the rest of the Achihas, I will never go blind due to overuse. No, you haven't gained anything from being my incarnation. The reason I'm here is to finally reconcile with my brother and bring peace. To do that, you need to beat Black Zetsu before he revives Yubi. I will train you in case he does revive it. Will Ashura also be training Naruto? No. Even though I love him, I can admit that Ashura was weak, Naruto has already surpassed him. The only reason Naruto would lose is because he has our father's chakra. The only reason he was even able to reach near my level was due to nearly a thousand people giving him all of their chakra. Theirs was far more potent than the average person in this period, not as much as yours is though. Right now, he is stronger than you. We will make sure that, by the end of this month, the opposite is true. Thanks for listening. I do hope you enjoy it. Turn on that bell notification. Like subscribe and comment down below. And also check out the others videos. I have created and enjoyed it. See you guys next video.